He'll need to be. G on the line of sight and with the glass on the what? To push them to not. Oh. for proteins. Signatures identified. Neutralize the nests. Guard the exits. They're here. All across the world, Siege competition is in full swing. All nine regions have finally begun their seasons, but in North America, we're already near halfway done with our regular season. Live from NALHQ in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, welcome to Play Day 5 of the 2024 North American League season. I'm Caliber Jacob Anderson. He is former world champion Gabriel Laxing Miralez, and finally, a man they allowed back over the American border, the North American savant himself, Jesse J. Chick. Good to have you back, buddy. Thank you, Jacob. And allowed is maybe a bit of a word I want to avoid, but I made it. That's all that matters. <laughs> I don't got to get too into detail on how that happened, but I'm here now. About uh, why Visa Hell was such a problem. Exactly. You know what? We're ready for the North American League. That's all that matters. It's good to have him back, right, Lax? I mean, you know, you I, I was getting used to not being with him. So that does you know, not sound very like, enthusiastic. All right, well, no. he's that gone. Sound he's not here. At all. No, I'm glad you're back, buddy. Glad, glad you're here. <laughs> Only took, you know, two weeks to finally get everything know, situated. He was doing it on purpose. We have the whole family from Copenhagen with us here in Philadelphia. Let's have a good old fun day. Starting with standings, we enter day five with two teams still undefeated, two teams still winless, and everybody else, for their own part, is just kind of somewhere in the middle right now. 
I think so. We're kind of what we expected to see more or less. Luminosity, I think, surprisingly high being in the top four after the first two weeks, but still plenty of games to play out. And I think even those teams at the bottom, there's lots of time to improve and still get up to the top six, which is really what matters. I mean, even for me, Oxygen still performing extremely strong after losing Fox. And that was a question that like I even had going into this entire stage. And I mean, they're clearly putting it down and they're doing what they need to do to still maintain the top position in NA. There are some teams that have had to play multiple games per day as well, which does throw a bit of a wrench into some teams' plans too, which is still going to happen for today and tomorrow. And then when we get to next week, we get to Super Week. It's only four games a day, baby. We're going to be rolling high. Well, with the Super Week, that means these teams really got to get their points in now and mm -hmm. try to secure at least good placing. So if they can get a little bit of wiggle room going into those, into that hell week, they can at least maybe come out on something. But like, if you aren't winning these going into this week and then going into that next, you're going to find yourself in a not so uh, great position overall. Yeah. It's been a lot of fun for these past couple weeks so far, and for the players themselves, they've already made some observations about who has been the most impactful player they've faced in lobbies so far. We caught up with them just yesterday to see what they thought. Well, that was a very astute observation from our players about specifically who they thought was doing fantastic. There are a couple guys we off off the rip. Who can we highlight that, that's been doing really well? Uh, there's a lot of players that you could say. I mean, Diaz is a player that has stuck out for me a lot mm -hmm. coming out of that OXG roster. So, I mean, that's a player that definitely comes to mind to me given the role and support role that he plays and he's still performing at an extremely high level. So that's a player for me. Yeah, Ashen as well. But I mean, there's so many players that you could name. Do we have the video back? I think we have it now. Let's play that and see what they thought. One player who's playing really well right now, uh, at least statistically, I think, I think Adam. Adam looks like he's been playing really well. And Adam and Ashen, I think those two have been playing really well. Got a lot of impact for the team. Kinda, I kind of hate to say this because he, he talks a lot, but Ashton on SSG, he's playing, he's playing well. For, he played well against us, especially. Um, I think he gives his team a lot, a lot of confidence because he's yapping a lot, he's talking a lot. People, some people like are all talk no action. I say he's a bit of both, so yeah, I give him that. I know Ashton's playing pretty well right now, and he talks a big game, and I know that intimidates players. So I know that that impacts other players' games, and you just got to not let it impact it. And he's very good at it, so it does impact players' games, and it's shown it does. Playing well. Kansas is definitely one of those players who's on my team is having a lot of impact on his team, you know. I think Kansas is a great player, you know, he's helping his team a lot. What do you have, like 25 kills on bank against Peace Coast? Like, I mean, come on. It's actually two players, but it's my old teammates, Diaz, and Diaz Lucas, and uh, Gomez from OXG right now. They're doing really good for their team. I think they've elevated the way, you know, OXG sees the game and stuff. Uh, so, definitely them too. Uh, for what I've seen, uh, Kino's playing pretty well. It's impressive too that he's playing well because he does play like the more hard support type of role and um, him like having an off, like a little bit of off time as well recently. I think it's impressive that he was able to bounce back and um, you know have have a have a good start. So I'll take Kino, yeah. Definitely feels like there's a couple players that come first to mind for many of players in the NAL so far. Ashen came up a couple of times. Kansan would obviously make sense for having that 24 Definitely. kill performance that he had on bank mm -hmm. from last week. So we'll see if those players who we're talking about now, earlier in the season, are guys we're still going to be talking about as playoffs and the last chance qualifiers come up in just a couple weeks. For us today, for Play Day 5, let's talk schedule. We open with a game between a team that's won everything and a team that's lost everything. DZ and LG will be playing two games today against separate opponents and then against each other in game number five. Gentlemen, what do we think of the schedule for the day? I mean, the game that I'm looking forward to the most is actually the M80DZ game yeah. specifically. Yeah, I mean, Dark Zero M80, those are top organizations in North America. We saw both of them at the Six Invitational. So obviously, you're going to be looking at that one as one of the hype matches. It's a tough day for Dark Zero, not only playing against M80, but then having another game towards the end of the day. DZ have already had a bit of a tough time through the North American League. So, I mean, it's not getting easier for the guys in purple. It's not bad, though, having the doubles. I'm going to be honest, because if you get a good win and that starts out strong, it can be a double-edged sword. Let me say that. You can start out strong and then go into your next game. You can fall off or continue that streak. 
or you can have a really bad performance and that carries into your next game. So it can totally be a double-edged sword, but if you do get those two wins, I mean, it does secure you in a nice position of getting some really solid points on the board. One team you might notice that's not on this card right here, Wildcard have a buy for games today, which means they don't play, but they will be playing two best of ones tomorrow. So for them, I think it's a really good thing to get at least one more day to recoup, figure out how they want to go into that double header, because that tomorrow is the last time we are going to have a double header. But at least for today, let us start with the winless versus the undefeated. We're talking polar opposites in this matchup, like Dune 2 versus Madam Web. Complete levels of polar opposites here. One team has won every game so far to start the stage. The other has just taken L after L after L. But if the way that we've been talking about Los over the past couple weeks is any indication, apparently they're not really the worst team here, despite what their record says. No, obviously an 0-3 doesn't look great, statistically speaking. But this team is brand new to the league. They're brand new to the NA region as a whole. There are still a lot of learning curves that this team is going to be, you know, figuring out throughout this stage, but it is coming to a point where they need to start getting wins underneath their belt. Certainly. I mean, I think Los, the fundamentals seem to be there. I like the early rounds from them. It feels like they're doing a great job finding some of those opening picks, especially on attack. I just feel like sometimes these late rounds get going, they get a little bit messy, they fall apart a little too often. So I'm hoping we can see a better showing from Los. Against SSG, it'll be tough. This is a great opponent they're going up against, but I do think that Los are better than people give them credit for. Los have had a really tough schedule over these past couple weeks, too. They had, uh, what, the OXG game was the one they started with. Yep. They had Sonics just last week on bank, and now they come into a game against Space Station. So let's dive on them first. For a team that is winless, there apparently are a lot of really bright spots for we can talk about on this team. We just need to see it finally translate to something in the W column today, Lux. Yeah, I mean, for me, Sexy Cake is one of those players that we talked about in the beginning of the stage. Is, you know, he's this IGL for this team. He has all of this experience, and this is a player specific that I want to see. But then to even touch up on other players, Legacy, for example, he's their least amount of experience, and he's also performing extremely well. Yeah, I mean, I talked about their early games a little bit already, but they have a 74% attacking entry percentage. That's the best in yeah. the entire North American League. I think when they're in control, when they have all five players alive, they can commit to that plan. They really can. But the problem is, one thing goes wrong and everything goes out the window for Lowe's. So I'm really hoping that we can see some of that bounce back a little bit. I'm glad that you mentioned both Seg uh, Legacy and Sexy Kicks. I think those have been their standout yep. players, but we need to see more from them still to convert those rounds. Yeah, but speaking of Sexy Kick, unfortunately, this is not the first time he's been in a position very similar to this one. Since he left Team Liquid after the Mexico Major in 2021, it's been mostly a downhill slide just for his career. We can look at where he's played since. Three straight stages on Double Zero Nation back in 2022 couldn't get above eighth place. Didn't play Tier 1 Siege in Stage 1 of last year, came in with E1 Sports in 6th place in Stage 2, and right again, off the bat with Los and 03 record to start. Yeah, I mean, you can't look at this and just blame Sexy Cake and be like, this is the reason why for a ninth place, 8th place. That is a team thing. That just isn't a Sexy Cake thing. And then now him coming into this role as this IGL for Los, coming into this North American League. I mean, we are seeing improvement from Sexy Cake, and that's the most important thing from me because with more time, with more reps under the belt, with more experience from Sexy Cake being given to this team, I do think that we are going to see that success in what Jesse was talking about, or that we even talked about in the back. Mm -hmm. Los is kind of a sleeper team. I think once they find their rhythm in the NFL, we will see that, but it depends how fast we're going to see that. Yeah, we saw some clips there from the Dark Zero game as well. He was the top frag on Los in that DZ yep. game. He played really, really well. He's had some ups and downs certainly throughout the league so far. Uh, the game against Oxygen, I believe he went 1-9. and nine. So he's had some great games, some poorer games for sure as well. But all in all, I mean, I think he's a good player. We saw that graphic of him playing on E1 Sports. That's a team that I thought was really starting to develop in Brazil to a potential major contender. Uh, the roster kind of blew up at yep. the end of the year, and we've got uh, a brand new E1 player playing in Brazil now. But I do think that Sexy Cake's a good player. I think he's got more potential. I think he's still got a long career ahead of him. We just got to see it develop. If there was anything that you had to pinpoint about what they've done through these previous couple of games, is there anything for Los that stands out as if they were to fix this thing, maybe they could have won either a couple games or maybe it improves in the future? I mean, for me, Jacob, it's got to be the plants. I feel like way too often we're seeing Los not maybe trusting their cover. I've got three clips to show you. Three separate clips where Los start a plant and they could have committed to it, but they chose not to. First 
First, it's rides, and he gets on the plant. And if you remember, this is where Canadian got the 1v2 clutch. This C4 is not close enough to hurt rise, but it forces him to get off. And then his cover on the hatch gets killed by Canadian. And then we see him go for the 1v1. It's the first moment where I saw, okay, they're getting off the defuse kit. They don't have to, and they're losing the round because of it. That's kind of a tough one. Then we get another round on the exact same bomb site. This one from Bursa is a little bit less egregious in my mind. He's probably going to die to the C4, but he's still making the choice to get off of it. He's not trusting his cover. He takes the gunfight instead and still dies. And in this clip, you probably all remember it. Yikes. This one from Bursa probably feels the worst. It's a 2v2. He has cover, and his cover gets the kill, but he still gets off. That's on triple zero. He loses that round because of it. Uh, I think it just comes down to a trust thing, right? We're seeing this over and over and over again where these players are getting off the defuse kit when they don't necessarily have to, and it's costing them rounds. This is where I'm saying where if you can clean up these late rounds, they could be winning a lot more than they currently are. And I think it just comes down to the chemistry and the lack of time that this team has together because that plays heavily and for the people at home when you're on a brand new team is once you have a solid foundation, you understand what everyone does on the team, you do have a general consensus of what that end round looks like. So, but their opponents have been together for a much longer amount of time and that already seems like it's translating. Space Station are the polar opposite of Los in so many different ways. One of them being how long this team has been together for. Ashen's now been on it since stage two all the way of last year, adding Iconic into the mix just seems like it's been the perfect crossover for what this team has needed to do to succeed. Yeah, Space Station are in a great place right now. I mean, they got top eight at the Six Invitational. They come to the North American League. They're 3-0 so far. They've added Iconic onto the roster, so they have made a bit of a change. And I will say, Iconic, you can see the stats there, currently lowest rated on the team, but it still feels like he's fitting in, right? The team is playing really well. I'm not going to look at a player who maybe doesn't have the best stats when a team is succeeding and be like, yeah. this is a problem. I think it's fine, right? I mean, Ashen's obviously been the star of the show. We've seen the rest of SSG really come into things. I think the way the meta has changed too is really starting to favor SSG. We're seeing some of these shields get more and more popular. SSG currently undefeated with those ops. So yeah, I think they're in a really good place. And for a stage that's all best of ones to start out with, look at how much of an improvement Space Station have made from stage two of last year when they just started with Ashen to right now. Yeah, and Ashen, I mean, this team, I think one of the biggest problems with this team is one, they obviously got Ashen. That was a brand new player. They were trying to find that identity of mixing SSG's old roster and then with a brand new Astralis roster and then going into Callout's new form and how they play. And then we saw the change going into the regular league. We saw that change happen in Atlanta. Yep. And then in me personally, I saw the most improvement going into the Six Invitational, and now you're seeing them here. They're starting out 3-0, and specifically talking about a player, Ashen. I've talked about him a million times. We kind of can't, can't not talk yeah, about I him. Yeah, I can't seem to not talk about him. Ashen is such a phenomenal player, just as a rookie, just as a player, everything as a whole from him. The versatility from Ashen is truthfully what I love the most outside of his consistency, because having that versatility on your team allows you to be able to move around the map, play different sites, play different roles, and that opens up and broadens your horizon as a team, and Literally, Ashen can do everything on this team, and I love that from him. And also be a demon where he can get in people's heads. Which <laughs> He's the best player right? in the league. He is literally the best player in the league. I mean, you said this on, on Twitter, I believe, last yeah. week, and I, I got to agree with the way he's playing so far. His stats are very, very good. He's got a 1.9 KDR. When you narrow your focus onto attack, that goes up to a 2.2. And if you narrow it all the way down to Ashen on Ash, a 3.3 KDR. This guy has been ridiculous through the North American League so far, and I love the way he's able to play on that. And end. I was arguing with kids online because people were like, oh, <laughs> he's not the best player in the league at Shiko. What's this? It's like, no, I'm talking about for this season specifically, Ashen is statistically the best player. So I don't care how you want to put it. I don't care who your favorite player is. Ashen is making a name for himself, making the plays, doing everything he needs to do to be the best player currently right now in the state. So what I'm hearing is if Lowe's target ban Ash, then suddenly all, all everything for Listen, Space Listen, we've Station seen enough teams apart. target ban certain players and it ends up not working. <laughs> yeah. Fair play. So we had the choice between Oregon and Clubhouse for map one. Instead, it is Club. We've seen both teams already give this one a shot. Gentlemen, what, or what are we thinking of Clubhouse for this match? Uh, this, I mean... Club, this is a very risky pick for Los to allow this to go through. In my personal opinion, Clubhouse is a very strong map for SSG, and we just saw Los and how they most recently played it, and it wasn't anything impressive. And like you were saying, you know, maybe in some of those situations, they stick those bomb plants, it'll look good for them. But now you're going to go against another team that likes the map even more than DZ. So it's a situation of like, are you just going to fix your mistakes or are you going to go into a counter play? Yeah, I mean, I think it's one of those maps. I mean, you said ban the Ash. Not really a map that you can afford to ban an Ash on, unfortunately. So yep. that might be out of the question for them. I do think for Lowe's coming into this one, it's going to be tougher than DZ, right? Absolutely. Arguably, they should have beaten Dark Zero on Clubhouse. 
the Space Station's a much different beast. They're going to be more difficult than even Dark Zero were. So I, I don't think it's the worst choice for Los. They're going somewhere where they're comfortable. They're going somewhere where they know they can play good Siege. I think that game against Dark Zero showed some really solid moments. But will that lock in the idea that Space Station are just the kings of club again? Does the map sway your prediction away from the favorite, gentlemen. What do we think, Lax? Oh, mine's 100% still staying with SSC. Listen. You gotta climb this, out of 50% somehow, okay. dude. <laughs> All right. Last week was rough. And let me just say this. I wasn't here to be able to switch it up because the maps, the maps totally dictate that. So. Sure. We ain't looking at the 50. Jesse? Yeah, Space Station all the way. I think with Lose, I, I like on. Lowe's. I could, but I won't. I'm going to go with Space Station Gaming. I think they're the best team in North America right now. I think they take down Lowe's. All right, for the analysts, again, the prize is this bad boy right here, the North American League Predictions Championship. It's time to jump into day one of game five, and day five starts right now. Well, thank you so very much. We have quite the difference between these two teams, Nick. You've got Space Station, who are doing quite a good job of topping oh, yeah. the league, just sitting a little bit below OXG. And then you've got Los, who have been bringing up the rear. A favorable map for SSG. Is this going to be a quick matchup, or do you predict that there might be a surprise or two on the books for SSG, courtesy of Los? I mean, it's tough, right? I think if you're Los right now, you're looking to keep it close at the very minimum. And yeah, they've, they've, they're zero three right now. They've all, you know, suffered losses in every single matchup, but it's been close. No, four seven, five seven, overtime. So it's not the end of the world. I think it's a very fair statement to say SSG are probably gonna win, but are Los gonna get? You know, run over? Or are they gonna be competitive? Are they gonna be, you know, a fun matchup? Are they gonna show signs of improvement? Because like JC was talking about, they had some signs of weaknesses with some of the basic fundamentals. Not covering each other, not being there together as a team. So they can show this today on Top House, which is a phenomenal map to do this exact change up. That will be a good look for them. And then we can, you know, see if they improve and then do better throughout this entire stage. Well, Los did have quite the close match against Dark Zero just last week. But beyond that, it has not been a favorable schedule them for them so far. You know, a loss no. to OXG, who are the team in first place. So, I mean, your teams are gonna lose to OXG if they really are the best team. They lost to DZ, but they pushed them to overtime. And shortly before that, you know, this and uh, shortly after that, rather, sorry, they lost to Sonics, but again, it was relatively close, right? It was, yeah. it was five rounds up against SQ7. Now, your, your two major losses at this point have come up against a team that is in first place and a team that's in third place. Now you have to play the second place team. This is a <laughs> rough start for Team Los, right? They yeah. did have that match against Mirage on that second play day, but obviously with Mirage exiting the league, you don't really get a chance to pick up what could have potentially been easy points. It's a tough first schedule for Lowe's. SSG, though, on, on the other side, they haven't exactly had the easiest schedule themselves either. Obviously, they beat LG 7-3 on that very first play day, but Luminosity are sitting in fourth place at the moment, and they have been beating a lot of expectations. Additionally, this SSG squad beat DZ. Both of, the, both of these teams in the games right now have gone to overtime against DZ. SSG came out on the favorable side, and then SSG beat the Sonics 7-5. So SSG have not had an easy road either, but because of the scoreline being what it is, you have to give a bit of a nod to Space Station. Yeah. And they, of course, are 3-0 as it shows on the top, though there obviously have been some overtime games included in there. Operator bands are locked in. We vamped and talked about the standings. Feel free to sink your teeth into what is the first Grim ban, actually, mm. here in North America. I mean, it, it really is no surprise. The Grim is an operator, is getting played more and more, and we'll slowly start seeing that ban rate as well increase, I believe, because it's just one of those new power operators where those speeds will be used for that bombs that execute. It'll either lock defenders in place, or it'll give you, you know, it, exact whereabouts of where exactly the defender will be, like a live ping updating. So it's very, very strong on the clubhouse attack because of how execute oriented it is. It's almost like a capital fire that doesn't kill you, but you get five of them instead of two. And it just, again, it, it forces and strengthens those gunfights when you get to that bomb site. So far, it's just team. They're trying to get there, right? They're going for this like semi pseudo roam clear where they just take, they're gonna drop the hatch. They're gonna go into the side, they're gonna die. What? Most are seemingly invincible in this 
opening pick and then a second to follow shortly thereafter iconic and forest are both down for the count iconic still not rocking that iconic handle running with zidane.ssg come on now this is where you by the way as the chatters can help us out because we cannot always tell people who he is but if somebody asks in chat, please feel free to assist us. Say it's iconic playing on Zidane. SSG does get on the board first. It's the best player in the NAL, according to Laxing of Ashen, who sprints through Dirt Tunnel, gets a pick, and immediately heads out. That's roughly the halfway point of this round, and SSG find themselves in a bad spot. They do. I mean, SSG with like a dirt kitchen limited attack here, but they drop the hatch early, trying to pick note lows off guard, maybe underestimating how good of a hold they had on the site. But we see Rise locking things off with those cube barriers from the Asami. Bursa holding that kitchen hatch drop, and it shot down SSG's initial push. Now they gotta rotate around, and we, they, they're fishing, as we say. They're looking for a kill, they're throwing out the bait, they're gonna see what's gonna bite. But Lowe's are sitting in their corners. They're not swinging, they're not giving anything to SSG, and they really have to work for it. If Ashen is that star player, this would be the round to show up. Oh no, Ashen! That could have been quite embarrassing. Catches Sexy Cake looking. A90 dies Ashen from a similar position, and Los sweep through SSG on that very first round. Impressive stuff, as not every player gets involved in the action. Furious with three kills to start off. Good stuff for Los. Oh yeah, that is definitely a good start. And I mean, if people are kind of doubting them, you know, they're looking shaky, they've lost their first couple of games. It just goes to show that they do actually have those rounds where they look rock solid. And also comes down to SSG, they went for, I would say, the easy default take. Whenever you see a roaming presence on that basement clubhouse uh, bomb site, you have two choices. Either you go top floor as an attacking team and you clear it floor by floor, and you take the fight after fight, and you get to the side eventually with maybe 30 seconds left. It's like a 3v3. It's been a messy round. That's the usual way to do it. And if you want to get very simple and kind of basic with it, you just do it as you see it. You go third tunnel. You can often do it a month or blitz like that shield operator. You go kitchen hatch, open the hatch, drop the hatch. The issue is, if you don't get into the side from Dirt Tunnel or that Kitchen Hatch Drop, which SSG didn't do in that previous round, you kind of lose your entire win condition. Because you have one way in, and if that gets denied, you now need to actually roam clear, but you don't have your full five men, and you don't have a lot of drones, and you don't have a lot of time. So, you go for broke, didn't work out for SSG, and of course, those who go through this bombsite rotation, you might be thinking, what's next? CCTV, a bar? Nope. As we can see, it is that gym bedroom bombsite, which is often played as the secondary one after basement. So Lowe's really following the, the Clubhouse 101 basics right now on defense. It's really tough to find yourself in a favorable position when Ram's boogie drones tear up all of that kitchen floor. Oh, yeah. You know, it, if you're not bringing another operator to get into that spot, then it's tough going. I mean, Ashen was on Buck, admittedly, but I have to imagine that for SSG, the Buck's focus was elsewhere. So, yeah, maybe in a pinch you can get over in that position, but if you've lost Iconic, you've lost Forest, you've lost a lot of your soft destruction, you've lost two very important parts of covering that kitchen part of the map, then you have to go elsewhere. Ashen responds by heading through Dirt Tunnel. It ultimately doesn't work out. He tries again over towards Church, but... SSG was just, you know, they were spent. They were a little bit too, uh, a little bit too thin on their attack. Now, they've opened up Jacuzzi Wall in the first minute. The pocket mirror window will go down from Rise. We've seen this before. SSG will be wary of somebody wow. playing, and immediately that mirror window is taken out. That's beautiful. I mean, Ash was probably there, G90, just to like get the mirror window. They realize there is none, but then it gets placed down right when that wall gets open. We see the rush up here from SSG of his hatch drop, two inside a connector, and of course, Jacuzzi Breach. And they're going to go for it. What was that Selma on Breach outside? A bit confusing. Ashen is off to the races. The shotgun in hand. He and Forrest will strike first, doubling up on kills. Down goes Fultz to Furious, who's been having an unbelievable start to this matchup. All five kills, no deaths, Woo! until he meets Ashen. With J90 also in on the action, Sexy Cake's the last one to die in Space Station in a hurry win the second round. I mean, that's just beautiful. It's We've seen many different kind of iterations on this kind of gym bombs at Rush. If you watch Europe, you've seen Wolves do it so many times. You exothermic charge the exterior, Jacuzzi wall, run in with that, 
jump into bathroom, go into gym, drop the office hatch. SSG with a slightly different take here. The big play for them was Ashen in through main staircase window on the Amaru shotgun SMG 11. Just walks in, kind of that mid-section of the bomb site, cutting everything in half and just finding those kills. Then you go office hatch, connect the breach, and of course you have a player working at jacuzzi wall. It's just an attack from every single angle, essentially. And the reason why it works so well is the sheer chaos that it creates in the communication of the opposing team of Lowe's. They're gonna go, there's a guy over here. I'm almost going to the window. Oh, there's a guy flanking as well. It's just, you, you don't have enough time as a defending team to actually pinpoint what exactly is happening. So you have to play off instincts, what you think is happening in the server and really feel that out. When you're the more experienced team, which in this case, SSG, they are, that's exactly where you have a significant advantage. And it shows a very clean, clear cut execute where every player knew what they had to do. And now we see right off the rip on a different bomb site, CCTV, Space Station, they're gonna blow apart their lineup and still have some of those, you know, key operators. This time the Ying, that's gonna create chaos. Candela is flying everywhere, but they also bring the Maverick. They know that they gotta get this wall opened up. If enemy is playing Bandit Akaid, that's very difficult. So why deal with a Thatcher or Ash below, try and open up the wall and just deal with it and, it, and spend so much time? Just play the, the Maverick. Open up the wall here. It'll take maybe 20 seconds since when he started. It'll be opened up fully. You buck the soft portion and then you're good to go. Ooh. Or you can see forward. <laughs> it shouldn't be that hard, but sometimes it is. A, that's a tough spot to be Bad in. There goes, the car, there goes the can opener as well. Ooh. Secondary hard breach is removed. We talk often about how hard breach works in this game. Maverick is not considered to be a bona fide hard breacher the same way that Thermite, Ace, and Hibana are because of the application of his blowtorch, right? In a lot of ways, when you're opening things up, it requires the assistance of somebody else to do the rest of the job. And when you're attacking onto this cache CCTV bomb site, a blowtorch will carve open the reinforcements, but it will not do anything for the rest of the soft wall. Oh man, uh, this, is, this is like the first round that we saw in the basement attack, where as you see they have step one, but they don't accomplish it. And now they got to kind of figure out, okay, what's plan B going to be instead? And that's why we see them rotate, right? They, again, they go office hatch, they go in the master bedroom CCTV window, they go jacuzzi. They know that the primary breach of CCTV, not gonna happen. But Lowe's, they're up, they're posted, they're ready. They got Legion set up out them. Bryce should get a free pick here. Oh, and he loses it to Ashen, who springs into action right Better. by the showers. And Lowe's, they got an early pick with Fultz. It equalizes. One minute to go as SSG can now begin to pinch this bomb site. The next target could be Sexy Cake, but he's got both Bursa and Legacy not far removed, sitting at the top of red. Bursa focused on the breach of what little breach there is for the record. It was eventually opened up with a can opener, but again, the big problem is no main hard breach for SSG. You need Iconic and Forest to get that job done. SSG have very little safe ways into the bomb site, so maybe make them uncomfortable from below. Ashen dies to Sexy Cake as that was an engagement over towards Cash. Iconic was below, opening things up with a skeleton key. Well, no choice but to get active himself. And the Gone Six, shooting over towards red stairs that will get Legacy's attention. Los with a big advantage. Forrest following in on the Candelas. Down goes Sexy Cake. Furious will follow. Forrest looking for another mag dumping, oh. but one will elude him on red stairs. Time running out. J90 will either need to get the diffuser down or stick to plant. He's at the point of no return. Legacy ascending the red stairs, running in. J90 gets it down, but he's got some coverage. He's got some safety. Bursa finished off his Legacy now, looks for more. Going around the bomb chassis. J90 flanking towards red, but Legacy knows this. J90 just needs to play the timer. He doesn't need to get the kill. All onto the shoulders of Los. Counter defuse. Legacy is letting that timer continue to run away. 20 seconds left. It's very limited intel. If none at all, over oh. towards red, he sees him, but J90 wins the duel. Two in a row as SSG will grab the lead in this match. 
I mean, there are so many things that happened around that was actually good from both teams. If Ashton hadn't got picked off on the window 20 seconds before that bomb set execute, I think you should see just steal that round and it's a pretty like clear one. But because they would lose Ashton, they have to go over plan C at this point, which is enable the Ying, Candela, Intri, follow up, etc. And I thought, okay, Lowe's, they get that 2v2, they have the bulletproof camera, they have Intel on the bomb site. Surely they don't lose it. But they do. Janano sticks the plant. They don't have that time to get back to this, you know, kill him as he's trying to get that diffuser down. So it gets the 1v1 post plant and Janano just plays the smart game. He simply just goes for a simple, I'm going to play far away. You got to work the clock. You got to counter diffuse. It takes seven seconds. And he does a really good job at just playing both the time and the position game to ensure he wins that 1v1. Oh. Back downstairs you go, full sight rotation now, no bar and stage being shown. Bomb sight rotation has not necessarily been as routine as we have wanted, and the greatest example of that is on the map Skyscraper. That bedroom, bathroom bomb site on the main floor of Skyscraper sees very limited play, to the point of where you can go multiple play days, multiple matches on Skyscraper without ever seeing it. But it's been showing up a lot more, and I wonder if teams are just trying to figure out if some of these weaker bomb sites are maybe a bit stronger now because gunplay is slower due to this, the zoom-in changes on the scopes, and that the defenders maybe are not as traditionally strong as they could be. I'm not entirely certain. Our stage holds that distinction on this map that bedroom bathroom bomb site on Skyscraper does, though we did start to see our stage show up more frequently. For a newer team like Los that is still struggling with basic fundamentals as we have seen and are finding their footing, maybe bar stage could be out of the question. SSG is three more rounds on attack. They're a more practice team. Maybe we see it from them. Until then, assume that we will see this basement bomb site and then the two upstairs. Hell does have opportunity to freeze over, but it's not really that cold just yet. Oh boy. Yeah, this might be one of those classic rounds on the basement bombsite where things will come down to the wire because this time it will be a 5v5 and this is what we know this bombsite for. It's you want to get an early advantage as the attacking team, try and get that one man lead, but they don't find it this time. And Lowe's, they also did the handshake agreement, they surrender it. They're happy to let things fly the way that they are. So we got to see how it plays out. As you see, they got to set things up perfectly and try and get this third round to their count. Not sure if people have seen, but it was advertised on social media that listen-ins are coming. And well, we can finally say that we've got our very first listen-in as we can follow along Space Station and hear how they're calming towards the execute. Okay, I'll just triple five for trip double then, okay? okay. I'm ready whenever here, okay? I'm ready, guys. Jay has Give me one Jack, just start, just start, you can boot of pull him right now. Just bait, yeah, just bait, yeah. just bait. One side. Oh, wide church, wide church, wide church, wide church on ping. He's crouched on this ping if you want to pre-fire. Still crouching that ping. That's nice, that's nice, nice. Okay, I'm gonna flash. I'm gonna flash. Another one up, another one cheese. Cross, 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 cross. I'm gonna flash it against this guy. You guys ready right now? Yeah, yeah I yinged. Yeah, I yinged yeah, 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 the shit time. We can't open church. 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 We can't open I just killed blue, blue on his feet, bro. Blue on his feet. Can I dead? Can I dead? Can I dead? One v three. One blue. One on your yo. Push, yo, he's pushing up your close mother door. Hard right. Hard right. Swing. On the bomb in box two. Nice try. Good try. try. Just keep it calm. Just keep it calm. We're good. Okay. We're good, yeah. I mean, there you see right there, a beautiful listening, and it really shows the details of what is happening in the server for SSG. Essentially, they had a lot of information. I think they had a sound strategical approach to that round. It came down to simple gunfights, right? For example, that first opening duel, there was a player crouched on the keeper barrier inside of church, and they have, oh, crouched on ping, crouched on yellow ping four, just pre-fire. They go motor door, they pre-fire opening kill, they get that 5v4, they get the opening, but then it kind of falls apart. They couldn't essentially get into the site itself. Church wall wasn't opened up. They couldn't just walk in motor door. They didn't have blue control. So again, it comes down to small things like gunfights, those 50-50s. But the communication, it was there for Space Station. We could see the bigger picture, and I loved hearing that round from them. 
I like how frantic the comms sound just because of the urgency of pulling off an execute, but they were shockingly clean comms. You know, we've done yeah. listen-ins before on a variety of teams at a variety of different levels, but ultimately it seemed like SSG had a good understanding of where those players were. And, you know, we <laughs> I've used this phrase a number of times, Nick, just because you know where your opponents are does not mean you're going to win whatever gun duel is coming your way. <laughs> no. SSG is having some serious struggles with that bomb site. Lows have now gone up 2-0 on that bottom floor site. It will not appear in rotation again. The next time that Space Station will go down to church will be when they go on to defense. So a tie game and a great first listen in just to give you a good idea of how teams go about it. Unfortunately, because Los does communicate in Portuguese, it's unlikely that while they are playing, we will be able to listen to their comms because mostly English-speaking audience won't be able to glean much from it. That said, back upstairs, they will go on the side of Los to this jacuzzi wall, which right now by Sexy Not Kate again. is being watched so intently in a nitro cell threaded through the small opening created by Fultz. We'll put Fultz into 1v5, 1 in 5, and knock off the only traditional hard breacher outside of the ace on the board. SSG in trouble early. I guess it's worth noting that this didn't really happen all that often when you see for Maverick, but with the new trajectory lineup that is in, uh, you know, introduced into the game, you can see exactly where that C4 is going to land, probably making it a little bit easier to ensure that Maverick will take damage or in fact sometimes get injured or die. SSG in the tail end of uh, that last round was saying, guys, slow it down, relax, you know, nice try. They pick up the Monty. They are indeed slowing down the game, but look at this. Bursa with the perfect read has the clash, and this is the most awkward standoff in Rainbow Six Siege. They are staring at each other, but Monty will slowly suffer damage from the saps from the clash, and there is no counter here on SEC lineup. They are hiding the clash inside a bathroom. Sure, uh, Iconic on the Sophia can try and stun it, but he's not there. Can't bandit trick just yet. As there goes one of the shock wires, legacy a kill. Iconic following up oh, with no. Forrest, but <laughs> both of these players are having so much difficulty. This is an no. excellent beachhead by Los. They have completely read into SSG's attack from over towards Cash and CCTV. They have barricaded themselves in Cash at this point. Forrest attempting with the pistol something. Sexy Cake dies to Iconic, who has put a point of HP in front of him in Bursa, but the shield is giving the Clash some good staying power. A 2v2 has unfolded. SSG have managed to find themselves a successful way out of cash. Do they have enough time to pull off the rest of the execute? How has this happened? I mean, I was going to say Bursa got out there, but he was stuck on the table. Now it's down to that 2v2, but again, by onto 1v1. This should have been an unwinnable round for Space Station, but Iconic can pull off heroics. With the best player so far for Los, a Furious keeps it in the Brazilian, now North American team's hands. And what an astonishing round through and through, all the way from the start, from the Nitro Cell that began this, with taking out Fultz, to the way that the Clash and the Monty tussled. I have no doubt that there should be frustration here on the side of SSG with how these last two rounds have gone. Oh, no, I mean, there's got to be frustration, especially because, you know, they, they kind of, the way that we kind of talk about Clash and like operators that you hide in the bomb site, it's a bit of a cheese pick, right? It, it's one of those pocket strats that you pull out one time, you surprise your opponent, and you're supposed to win that round. Lowe's do win it, but it's not clean and it's not necessarily pretty. It comes down to one versus one, but they were successful. SSG should not have gotten as close to winning as they did because they did suffer that massive issue of there's a clash inside of cash and they cannot deal with that operator and it was that 2v4 favoring the defense. So if you're SSG, there's two ways to approach this. You go, guys, we got C4 again on the Maverick. That's your biggest problem. Overcome it. Don't worry about it. Move on. Or you go, ah, oh, man, we kind of suck. This is so frustrating. And, and it's easy when you die to the same C4 twice while by making the wall to blame the Maverick. Being like, what are you doing? Like, how do you not learn from your from your mistakes, so to speak? But no one's helping Fultz on the Maverick either. He's just alone on the breach, sitting there. If you have a second player behind him, you can shoot the C4 midair, or attempt it at least, or drone the drone hole, open up the gym window, apply a bit of pressure. There are other ways to support your Maverick. 
Instead, they go back to Thatcher. But then there's the bandit trick. So you counter the Maverick twice. You force them onto this like ace Thatcher situation. Then you play bandit to counter the ace instead. This is actually excellent approach here from those. They're giving enemy a problem. Enemy deals with that problem. Then they get countered. So now, SSG are forced to play a game they don't really want to be playing, and Lowe's are also ready for that. SSG are again locked out of those external bombs at walls, and have to go to plan B immediately. I hesitate to say that this is the best that we have seen from Lowe's. It might be. Because, I mean, they didn't look terrible in their matchup against Dark Zero. That said, DZ have looked like a shell of themselves, at least if you compare it to SI and previous stage results, but, I mean, DZ are, you know, still dealing with roster change. Two roster changes, in fact, bringing in both Nafe and Bolo. And DZ have had difficulties domestically <laughs> before with consistency. Oh. Okay. Oh my, okay. Sexy That's KP free. Two. I, I don't really know. What just happened with SSG, but they answer back right away with J90 barging in, taking no prisoners. Rise and Sexy Cake off of the board. Just a little bit over a minute still for SSG to get into the bomb site. As for Los, they just need to sit and wait at this point. SSG ensuring that the rest of the top floor is completely clear before translating that over towards Cash. Construction will be the first place that we see any point of action and legacy is far enough back with an ACOG to potentially gun down somebody from Space Station who barges through that door without checking their corners. Pretty nice mini execute there from Space Station going in from Jacuzzi, Gym Window, and of course Connect the Window and finding that two piece. But it cost them two players and most importantly, they lost the Ying. Forest was their win condition last time to get into the building, but they got this kind of bait and switch, right? They're gonna make pressure connector. So Iconic's gonna work this uh, garage angle. If he gets the kill, it's huge versus G. And Los is just finding their footing so effectively. Iconic in a predicament he was in before. And Los will shut the door on Space Station equalizing through that first half. Hmm. I mean, uh, we see the smiles there from Lois. They know what position that they're in. And, and Clubhouse is, an, is a, it's a tricky map to talk about, you know, in terms of attacker side and defender side, because I'm a big believer that it really comes down to how good you are specifically at attacking. If you are a phenomenal Clubhouse attacking team, you can easily go like, we, we go up 4-2, we go up 5-1 on the attack, easy. But with that being said, if you're not that kind of attacking team, you're happy going 3-3. Three maybe even go in two and four, because then you go on to defense. I think SSG are a good attacking team typically. I think arguably it's where they shine, at least in the terms of the, the kind of new way of playing Siege, where you do these like mini executes, you're aggressive, you play together. And the two round victories that we did see from Space Station were those kinds of rounds. Now, when you go on defense, it doesn't change that much of Space Station. They're also a good defending team. It's why they're like top of the league, basically, right? They're fighting for first place today, basically, it's between them and OXG. Um, there's just a single point behind. So I don't think SSG being down two rounds on the side swap is a big issue for them. I really do not think that they're going to feel too bad about this. But I do, however, think that this first round is very important for momentum and for mentality. During the the segment before this matchup, you know, the desks or the couch, rather, they spoke about Ashen and how he gets loud and gets to his opponents. But he's gotten one tapped anti-spawn peaked, if you will, through that construction wall. And he's out for the count. So, again, Space Station mentality, their momentum, it is kind of falling apart. The good thing is, if you want to look at it from an optimistic standpoint, is that Ashen plays Valkyrie, he, they do have those cameras to work with, and because they have a dead defender, they now have a permanent person watching cams for Intel. <laughs> I always wonder how various casting duos try to weave in the fact that there is a benefit to somebody dying early and... I mean, you can always just joke and say, well, they're on cam duty at this point. There are a lot of cams to watch. And Ashen will ensure that no particular part of this map where a camera is present will go unseen. If you really are the best player in the North America League, is there's been some talk about Ashen being that. Maybe dying early is not a great thing. Additionally, Ashen has not struggled so far because he does have the most kills on his team. But a 7-6 scoreline for the supposed best player is a bad day. 
<laughs> you need a little bit more. You need a little bit more from that. SSG, of course, will need to feel comfortable here on defense on Clubhouse. Various with 12 kills. Yep. An unbelievable scoreline and <laughs> three kills behind the rest of his team combined. <laughs> that great first round was at a 4K as well in the very first defense that we saw upstairs from Los on that bedroom side of the map. But of course, SSG found no success on this church bomb site downstairs when they were on attack. Losing Ashen right off the rip does not bode well for SSG as Los look to go 3-0 and on this bomb site. one of those being on the opposite side of the coin. The win condition here for Los comes down to executing together. Don't have the Ying, of course, have on Grimma Band. They're not playing the Osa Monty, so they really don't have much objective play besides flashbangs and, of course, grenades. So probably going to be a flash, flash, grenade toss, etc. 3 to 1 hit the bomb side. 4 C4 by Buffen Office. Now they know the side is relatively weak because one player is dead, one is above, only that means three on side. They're going to go for it. Fultz has that long angle down to take him out, but. Los are just falling by the wayside. It's not just Fulton on the action. It's basically every single player from SSG. J90 with two of the most crucial kills. The final two kills. As SSG finally gets some success on that bottom floor bomb site. Just as a side note, I'm not expecting you to know who this is. But doesn't Rise kind of look like Rick Moranis? I don't know who that is. You don't know who Rick Moranis is. Not then. by that's, name. That's fine, but... From this particular vantage point, he does look oh, yeah. a lot like Rick Moranis. Spaceballs would probably be his most popular movie. Honey, I Shrunk the Kids is another one as well. This kind of looks oh. like him. It's the glasses, I think, actually. That do certainly help, that's for sure. Uh, Rick huh. Moranis, by the way, is a Canadian actor. Oh. He's been around for ages, but yeah, obviously Spaceballs and Honey, I Shrunk the Kids would probably be two of the movies that most people would recognize him from, but... I also don't expect anybody who's under the age of 35 to have followed either of those films. <laughs> just a, this is a small comment. Defense, though, 3-0 and on that bottom floor bombsite. So it, it's not just low succeeding there, Nick. It's both teams. Obviously a very favorable, favorable part to play if you're going to play on defense. And I mean, SSG pulled that off in a 4v5. That they did. I will say that for Lowe's, I think they just didn't really have the best operator lineup last time around. You know, as, as, as I said before they execute, they didn't really have any of those like power operators to help them get down to the, like, the bombs that hatch to try and establish a plant. But also SSG had phenomenal timing. Falls in office, C4 the, the floor, and could see down the kitchen hatch to deny the plant position essentially. So great timing from SSG, lack of powerful operators from Lowe's, that's changed. They were hovering both the Ying and the Monty for this particular round, but went off the Ying onto more Harpish utility, the Maverick and the Ace, and then they play the Monty as that kind of win condition now. Typically when you see teams play Monty on the attacking side of his CCTV defense, you see them go catwalk. You go in garage, Monty walks up the staircase, you deal with the catwalk after players, that's iconic for example, and you move on from there. But given the fact that this is a lesion, it looks like SSG are very much prepared for the possibility of a Monty. Normally you'll play either a Frost or a Lesion, those Frost Traps or Goom Mines on the Catwalk Rafters just stops the Monty from advancing into your face, which is what the Monty wants to accomplish. And the attackers below the Monty, that's not like pushed up the staircase, can't see the Goom Mines, you can't see the Frost Trap, so Monty has to unextend an ADS to get rid of those gadgets, that's not gonna happen. So Lowe's, when they see that it's iconic on Lesion, they might need to rethink the plan approach here and go somewhere else, or we'll have to wait and watch. <laughs> you see the impact grenade <laughs> impact out and... Does a fair bit of damage to Farius, who then has to use an adrenal surge to get himself back up to full HP. I mean, you see the Goomines top of the staircase. They're not on the staircase, but they're just at the TP top. That's what the Nisnade is trying to reach, but it didn't get them. So here, if 60k walks forward, see, that's an issue. They cannot clear those Goomines. 60k cannot walk up. Somebody has to clear it, or it's going to take a lot of damage. Iconic's going to keep to beat him up. Oh. And pop up. Down goes Farius, but with the shield in hand, Sexy Cake will smite Iconic out of that position. There is no rotate present in the two walls leading from rafters into the B-bomb site, so instead it will be a vault over unless somebody on Los can blow open passage for Sexy Cake. Nitro Cell is primed and ready. 
I believe it's got Sexy Cake's name on it. I saw it right there, right as he pulled it out of his back pocket. <laughs> Legacy taking some damage. It's hard to tell from the silhouettes, but it would appear that the Monty has made it in, and SSG are going to realize that they can get cut off from that doorway. Again, though, the Nitro Cell from Forest can create an opening in the soft wall. Legacy still watching what limited window he has to the bomb site, dealing some serious damage to Forest. Both teams will come to blows. It's up to Ashen now to hold this together. But Legacy with Diffuser in hand gets the kill instead of getting the Diffuser down. And Los's lead goes back up. Both teams trading these two rounds back to back. SSG in a bit of a tough spot. That they are, they're very much in a tough spot, and it comes down to very simple use of operators in that round. Iconic, I think he played that round well, he got the one for one trade, died to Monty, but I do think SSG could have done more to help Iconic on that camp or position, because the moment he dies, that round kind of falls apart. The Monty is just too powerful to overwhelm the bomb side, block out one door, get those yellow pings going, and it just gives the rest, the other players from those, the confidence to walk in pre-firing yellow pings and through the walls and get those opening kills. Ashen did a great job at trying to salvage what was an unwinnable position but no one again helping each other from mrs g it's surprising to say this but Lowe's has played like the better team so far and it's still early on the side swap we've only played two rounds with ssg on defense but Lowe's have looked really great sure they lost that very first attack but they got the opening pick they got the full map clear they got all the hatches open they got what they wanted on basement but they lost the execute so ssg they had some good individual moments in that round, but then we see this previous round of CCTV defense. SSG are not the better team. They're not playing close together. They're not supporting each other. It's Lowe's coming out ahead. Again, SSG will go to the bombsite rotation, go to gym bedroom instead. They keep bringing the mirror. That's the upper that they want to play around. And good news for them, there's no Ash on the attack and lineup to counter the mirror setup. But they do have flashbangs. And of course, they got half reaching on both Bursa on the Thermite Shotgun, by the way. That is a Thermite Shotgun in action. This got to be a rush round. There is no way you play Thermite Shotgun and you don't go for a straight side rush, close quarter combat, because that is absurd otherwise. You can't fight any angles with a damn shotgun on this map. It's a bit of a wet noodle, too, of a shotgun, right? You it have is. to spam it to do some serious damage here. It's not like the GIGN shotgun or the SAS shotgun where a single pump will kill you, especially at close range. You've got to hit somebody two, three, maybe even four times, depending on the spread of those pellets. Unless, of course, there's been a change to the FBI shotgun that we've missed out on, or I maybe have just been oblivious to. This you could said be that it. it would be a rush, by the way, but we're over a minute into live action. But well, this could be the one. You pop this wall, you run through, you ying the office hatch. There they go. Three players. Gotta be it. Bursa will jump in. Oh! And there you go. Two shots. Forrest is down. J90 answers back. Rush unfolding, but oh. maybe faltering just a bit. Legacy oh. is inside a weight room doing some heavy lifting with two picks. SSG. No stranger, though, to weight lifting of their own. Legacy still in this spot. How cruel what? it is to use the weights and the equipment against SSG. You know they love pumping iron. You know they love working out. And the only thing that works out is the rush for Los as they come away successful in that round. And that'll be match point against the second rated team in NA. <laughs> that is ridiculous. Right. Yeah, listen, we're going 1.7 right here. After that, run back to cash and then go back to gym. Just stack the box from the gym side. They're probably going to cash over, but I'm mainly going to talk about attacking their overtime. So, we get back to overtime right here on the attack side. For the cash, let's get a Montang, Thermite, Ace, Thatch. Go to Flex. Ace, pressure to Uzi side with the Ace, and then Thermite, Thatch, get Con single. After that, we're going to rotate the Therm, Ace, Thatch, all back to server side. Get that open with the remaining, and then after that, we're going to clear uh, Raptors with the Montang, like a garage side take. If it's basement, bring a Thatcher. Look to end kitchen side, though. Like, get a church wall for some topic. And then after that, in Kitchen Hatch. And then for Jim, do New topic on the server side and then flip into the ISO. For the defense right here, fellas, like Dave just said, make sure we're peeking on the utility dump. We're going to go anchor right here. We're going to go back into the fucking other two sites after that. And then, like I said, just stack box a little bit heavier for Jim. We rotate back to that. Heard. 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 Damn. That is as classic of a strategical, tactical timer that you can do where... It's about what the enemy is going to do on every single bomb set that they're going to play on defense, what the expected outcome is going to be, and then, of course, also the counter for what the defender should do as well. Where, like, once they start util dumping, you need to start swinging 
because when they're flashing, when they're nading, that's right before they're gonna go, you're gonna catch them off guard. And also, they talked in the prep work there about the Monty, specifically for CCTV, and it just again goes to show that they very much expected it last time, even though they were unsuccessful in dealing with it, and it's why Iconic was indeed on the leash and on catwalk rafters. So, SG know what's ahead of them, they know what the enemy is going to do unless they really change things up here for lows. But now they have to execute and see if they can get it done. Surprising result. Certainly not what I think most of us would have no. expected coming in here. But you no, know, I I will now officially say this. Oh, it's the best that Los has played so far. <laughs> of course, I have a, a six-three score line favoring Los validate my claims yeah, and make me look like the smartest man on this broadcast there are a lot of smart people working on this show but believe you me only one of them can look at Los winning 6-3 and say you know I think that Los are playing pretty well <laughs> and uh, well one man's smarter now because Jesse's finally arrived as well the full squad is here now he was missing for the first few play days well Darius had a great start to this game, but it's been Legacy showing his worth over the last three rounds. It looked like it was going to be a defender-sided clubhouse. That has not materialized just yet. SSG won two rounds on attack, one round so far on defense. And it was this bomb site that proved to be successful for them. Now, if you remember when Space Station attacked on this bomb site, they lost the ram really early on. It's not the case for Los. Rise might not be contributing a lot in terms of kills. That utility is going to be crucial. Cause some discomfort for Space Station playing down below. Already you can see SSG are not actively guarding around that B bomb chassis. And many reasons for that, but a big one has to be because of the almost unlimited soft destruction that that ram is going to have for the kitchen, tearing open the floor, tearing open soft destruction, giving you a long line of sight to where these players are going to sit. And instead, SSG have responded by falling back towards blue and defending church more aggressively. Also, keep mm. an eye on dirt tunnel. One minute Come remaining on. for Lowe's to make this work. This could be a church attack. I mean, they have three spare Selmas in pocket, but they're gonna go towards blue instead. I'm not sure what the plan is here for Los. I think they're still trying to figure it out themselves. They got a minute to work with, though. It doesn't, you know, we're, they're not actually having to rush anything, but it, th thatchering the primary wall, getting those Selmas going. You see it here from Burry, so yeah, they're gonna open up every hatch, every wall towards the bottom side, and just again, apply as much pressure onto SEC's defense, making them have to guess, again, play off instincts, where is the attack actually coming from? But once more, like last time, Lowe's don't have a power operator. No Ying, no Monty, it comes down to those gunfights and playing close together. They're using these EU1Ds quite effectively. Fultz mobilized. This whole SSG squad completely paralyzed. As they're getting picked apart, both teams, though, will lose their fair share. Farius on 14 kills. J90 sensational so far, as it's all up to Farius. Looking for more kills. Credited with getting the down, will need to secure, but running in, Ashen will keep SSG alive for the time being, but it's a tall ask. 2-0. SSG will go on that bottom floor bomb site. No attacking team will successfully win Damn. on this church site. As SSG will have it locked unless, and it won't show up again unless we go to overtime. This is good for Space Station in the sense that they win the round, but it kind of gets worse because if that is the only place you can find success on defense, I got bad news for you. That bomb side is not gonna come back into rotation until overtime. So now you have to win CCTV and then either Jim or Bar to follow it up. Based off the tactical timer that we heard from SSG earlier, they're gonna go CC into Jim. That's what they spoke about, what the attack was gonna be. For this round, it was specifically about the Monty, which again, to no surprise, Iconic is playing on Legion to kind of try and counter that. If you're Lowe's, what you're talking about right now as a team is, hey guys, do we run the Monty back again? Because when you showed it one time, you expect your opponent to do some counterplay here, playing specific operators like the Lishin, the Goyo, the Echo, you know, things that can deal with the Monty. So it's like a 50-50 if they want to commit to it. They think for a bit, they're going to Ash, they're going to Thermite, and actually Sexy Cake, the very last seconds there, going over to Glass. Not an upper that gets seen all that much play in professional leagues right now, 
but every once in a while it does see a little bit of play. Now, what Lance provides you is a very big surprise factor. Unlike the Munzee that walks in, makes a lot of noise, Glass operates in the shadows, or in the smoke, if you will, where you'll toss out a smoke grenade, defenders are gonna go, oh, they're gonna try and obscure the vision so we can't see the crossfire, but then you get shot, beamed, one-tapped, straight to the smoke to the dome, and you realize, oh, by the way, guys, they have a glass. So, keep our eyes peeled here, where 6 k goes, that is likely where the execute will be focused on from Los. And the goal here for 6 k don't fire a single bullet with any of your weapons until you want to execute. You don't want to give away that you have the glass until then. Glass's pick rate, by the way, has been tremendously low, low. over the last couple seasons. Play Try years. <laughs> I mean, yes, years. It, couple years. <laughs> the only real time outside of the very beginning that Glass could arguably have been meta was when we were in the Ying Glass meta if you want to call it that i hate to use that word twice but smoke off from the ying glass would sit there and just destroy people it was actually very easy to spectate maybe not the most fun to play in nitro cell goes out i don't know if it's farius who's been dropped by it I, yes the breach that was opened up on jacuzzi will cause some harm to los but sexy cake is able to get the top performing player in the lobby back from the dead half of the round now gone low circled over towards jacuzzi and now looking for more towards the actual bomb site yeah i think that the plan here was to try and bait the rotate so that they go cctv they rotate to master bedroom make a bunch of noise and sprint straight back smoke goes out execute starts but they're a bit slower because those keep it barriers so this rush isn't going to be a rush but they're still going to commit to it there it goes bursa sprinting on in definitely avoiding the goo mine but not the bullets that are shot out from iconic no real pressure from Los on Garage, at least not yet. It's a bit too slow. Down goes Forest. Iconic still needs to be flushed out of this position before Los can get the map control they want. They walk up, slaughter Iconic. Legacy dies to Fultz. The rubber will meet the road now for Los as they have 30 seconds left. Get that diffuser in, which will need to be retrieved, oh. and get that diffuser down. But Farius, with such limited HP, will die to a goo mine. Iconic is not even alive, yet his utility providing good work. Rise getting the diffuser down. It'll be a vault out as Foltz will rotate from outside. Sexy K, good enough for one. Rise gets off the plant. The diffuser goes down, but SSG mob the remaining Los players, and we will go to all 12 rounds of regulation to settle this one. That's a tough one if you look at the attack and lineup. Two things didn't go the way that they wanted. Bursa sprints in the breach to try and take down Iconic on the catwalk rafters, but with those new ADS changes where you zoom in your weapon slower to get that full accurate shot, he dies sprinting, not ready enough for that gunfight. He falls early. Then Sexy Cake on the glass outside the breach didn't get to walk in and do anything with it because Jnano on the smoke on defense through a toxic babes on the breach to deny any sort of you know aggressive approach from the glass. So the entire push gets stopped basically, and it's just a great read. Again, they were so ready for the potential rush. Everybody from SSG they covered their own angles, and with that they get a another round those are gonna call a timeout it makes sense it's their last round here coming up before they have to go into overtime they want to win in regulation they've been in ot before they lost it last time they do not want to go there again no listening unfortunately for team los because we do not speak portuguese got insight into ssg with uh, what was it the third or fourth round that we got the nice listen in even though the round didn't end up being successful, I believe it was round number four all the way yep, in the first four. half. We also got to hear SSG's listen in. I'm eating my words at the moment, so if there's any brief pauses, you might think, oh, it sounds a little bit awkward. Why is Intero not speaking? It's because I said this, wasn't a, <laughs> this was not a defender-sided clubhouse, and then SSG starts winning their defenses, and suddenly we have a defender-sided matchup unfolding yeah. in front of our eyes. Now, this will be the real test for Space Station, right? It's the very final round of regulation. Does SSG win yet another defense and send us to overtime? Overtime, obviously, at this point is a big boon for SSG. They were hoping to pick up maximum points because of how tight the top of the standings in the NAL are. That's not really possible. Space Station will surrender at least one point to their opponent. SSG might only end up walking away with 1.2 if Los can find their footing and recover in overtime. You gotta get there first. 
There's a chance that Lowe's can pick up all three points. They're going to hinge on a relatively irritating lineup. Yep. Ying and Blitz will be on the board. Sexy Cake loves those shield operators. He always has been one of the parts of Sexy Cake's identity. No Monty this time, though. Instead, it'll be the Blitz. As Los circle the wagons around SSG and hope to come out with a 7-5 victory. Final defense of regulation, win or lose for either of these teams, will be over on that bedroom side of the map. When Spatian had the call out, they spoke about the, con uh, the construction wall, that single panel. And I was thinking maybe they'll ban it this time around, but we see the silhouettes. There is no bandit in play on that particular location. They will surrender that wall and just really heavily focus on Jacuzzi. Again, we know it's probably going to be one of those like lethal semi rush strategies. The Ying the Blitz, like you mentioned, Parker, and SSG, they want to close off one possible avenue of the attack. If they can deny this wall of Jacuzzi successfully, that is one less path in for the attackers. That means they're forced to go construction, office hatch, and the bombs at windows. That's it. So Jacuzzi not being opened up will basically mean that Lowe's cannot get the attack that they seek in this round. And because they see the active bandit battery, now they got a problem solved. The downside, the buck is on the other side of the building, they harass that gun six of destruction, and there are those castle barricades between the gym door and the jacuzzi breach. So with the current lineup of Lowe's, they cannot really deal with the bandit. They might have to problem solve and just go for a different kind of execute. <laughs> Falls with a very nasty angle, by the way, from basement up the main stairs into the gym window, by the way, holding a nice little angle here in case anybody wants to get tricky with the Side jump in, and again, SSG, they know what's about to happen. They've perfectly countered this. It's now down to Lowe's to counter the counter, if you will. Counter the counter, and then you have to counter their counter, and oh my god, it's counters all the way down. So many counters, man. Look at how cozy Iconic is in this corner right he's now. He's chilling. In office. Look at He's just chilling. He's vibing. This is quite the setup, by the way. Ash in the first pick on Nefarious. Hard pressed to imagine an operator on the sign of Los that you want to lose early. The Thatcher and the player. Ursa fires back. Forrest goes down. Candela's caught by the Wamai Magnets. Legacy wants the drop. Is iconic, prepared, and ready for it. He's tucked into that corner. SSG coming to blows and winning in these engagements so far. The blitz that we had suspected might be one of the Ooh. early points of contact is now in hot pursuit of J90. No. It's, it's Fultz to no. die, rather. As J90 dies now as well, Sexy Cake finding two. It's all up to Iconic. He's spotted. Sexy Cake circling on in. Iconic wins the duel. And he oh. can't win it, though, against Bursa at the final seconds. Los sticks the landing and wins their first match in the North America League. And they do it without needing overtime. <laughs> that is such a nail biter. It comes down to like the planning on zero seconds. Blitz has to cover the planter. It's just, it's not ideal and it's not pretty, but it's a Blitz solo entry to gym window to get a double kill that eventually wins the round for Lowe's. It, it, I did not see this happening. And I will say, yeah, it was a 7-5 victory, but Lowe's did look like the better team and they had some dominant showcases and some dominant rounds. There's a much better team that showed up today than previous weeks. Yeah, no, absolutely. Los were dialed in, they were locked in, they were wired in, whatever you want to call it. And it was a really grueling clubhouse. Neither of these teams really took it that easy. It was tough. Each round was a war of attrition between the squads, and Los just came out ahead. Honestly, I do think it took a little bit too much time for SSG to start playing their own style of siege. And who knows, if the SSG that showed up over the last couple rounds had showed up on attack, Maybe it's not a Lowe's victory. Maybe we go to overtime, but it's sometimes too little too late. And it was too little too late for SSG to find their footing. Lowe's wins their very first match here in the NAL and they get all three points for it. Excellent stuff from them. Yeah, I mean, I think it comes down to those basement attacks right from Space Station where if you cannot win the basement attack, even though you win them when you go to that side swap, if you go down 2-4 or whatever, it's just not great. So I think if you're Space Station, you go back, you debrief, talk about those attacking rounds, and then you just go next. It's not a big deal. A lot to break down for the desk, and I'm eager to hear what they have to say. So let's not wait any longer. That's our first matchup in the books. We'll be back in a couple minutes.
The analysts could see it, Twitter could see it, Reddit could see it, Los finally saw the light, and they have officially come to play. They get their first dub of the North American League stage after moving from one continent to the next, and what better team to get it against than a currently or formerly undefeated Space Station roster, 7-5 on Clubhouse. That is a pretty darn good way to get your first dub, even if it did take a little bit to finally come around. I was wrong again. <laughs> Can you stop being wrong? You're paid, you're paid to talk and paid to be correct, bro. What and are we, were, we doing? We were all wrong. We were all wrong. What are we doing? We were. No, but this is what I wanted to see from Los. This is the improvement I was talking about. Like, especially going into this week, we needed to see a ramp up in performance. And everyone across that team performed extremely well today. Yeah, I'm actually really happy to be wrong, right? To are finally you? see Los taking advantage. I mean, it's I'm easier. Not. It's easier with you being wrong as well. But <laughs> to see Los living up to their potential, to see them coming through and getting this huge win. I mean, we talked over and over about how they played better than a team that looked 0-3, mm -hmm. right? Their early runs had looked good. Now they come into Clubhouse, and you know, sometimes attacks on Clubhouse can get kind of messy. Sometimes it's very difficult to get walls open or what have you. Yeah. Los decided, screw, it. we're just gonna run in. We're gonna make these explosive, fast pushes come through, and they looked really good with them. Yeah, sometimes it was scrappy, but that's what you gotta do on club sometimes, and they did just that. Yeah, and you know, we were highlighting Ashton about being these rookie players, but then we were seeing Legacy and Farius just completely dominate today. I mean, again, the entire roster from Los, if they can keep this up, we will see them in a high position. But again, they have to keep this consistent. You can't just have this game and then immediately fall off and not have the same performance. Like I need to constantly see this improvement from this team. We've been looking at Legacy as the one rookie that had the most highlight potential yeah. who was doing really good through those first two weeks. But it's really good to highlight the other rookie for once because Farias had himself a day. I was convinced he was going to hit 20 kills by the end of this game. And he <laughs> came close, but it was still great. He was holding down blue like it was literally his job. Like he was working a nine to five there. Every time SSG tried to come take it, they were after Absolutely, getting sent back home, going to the manager, figuring out it was Farius in the end, and then immediately going to the next round. Like, he was not letting go of Blue. Yeah, and being able to hold down such a power position like that, I mean, it's so critical on a map like Clubhouse to be able to make sure you get that done. I think on both sides, we saw Lowe's playing better yeah. games of Siege, being able to hold down important areas of the map on defense, and then using that explosiveness to get in on I the mean, attack. Six multi kills? Dude, he's crazy. I, and I'm glad we're finally starting to see Farius pop off like that. Farius, Farius, Furious, we can't. I don't know. The, the he's all three combined. At this point, yeah, he he's mad and he's getting kills in the lobby. It's Farius because we did learn his name also is Farius. So just for anyone who is confused. But the one thing that wasn't confusing was that the legend Sexy Cake was going to find his time to show up at some point. And he did. That Blitz 1v2 or the Blitz oh. 2k at the very end I mean, was great too. Yeah, the Blitz 1v2 you'll notice. But what I think might not have gotten so caught was how good he kept these wall closed. Twice <laughs> he see forward faults on the Maverick. That's an insane thing to be able to pull off. And then he gets a bandit trick on round number Six. Finally, after five rounds of getting screwed over by this bandit, he's able to come through and, and get the bandit trick. We actually missed it there, but it's a cash wall. And he throws a C4 for fun. He tricked both of the two Selmas at the start of that round, which meant that the CC wall was never opened. So his bandit play, I think, was the biggest factor to win this out. You may not see it on the kill feed. You may not always notice it. But keep in mind, with those walls keeping closed, the way he was able to play that utility, I thought Sexy Cake was fantastic today. I mean, even the trajectory preview right there, just to highlight those C4s, I mean, he was nailing those spot on. I even saw a Selma charge go through a blown up floor. I've never seen that in my entire career. <laughs> yeah, like that's, that's, how, that's how confident he can be with That's the problem those. with Maverick these days. You want to be able to throw something through yeah. whatever he, he he burns a hole through now. So it makes playing Mav Absolutely. just that yeah. much harder. And there's also one round where we saw uh, what it was two shields clashing together at one point. Remind me well that Spider-Man gif that they're just looking at each other, but, <laughs> but nothing is happening. 15 and 8 for Farias. Best game he's had so far. Sexy Kid continues to climb up the ladder. But let's just give some benefit to Space Station. They hey. kept some things close in this game, too. I, they, they did, and they definitely put up a huge fight. I mean, they were down. It did end up coming to a 7-5, and that last round came really close. That easily could have been an overtime. Sure. But again, I still want to highlight Ashen. In the beginning rounds of these, Ashen was making crazy plays. Like, I am still sticking true that Ashen is the best player in the league right now. The plays that he was doing in the beginning, the versatility that he brings to the team, I'm telling you, he was Ashen, great for, like, the Ashen first is that half. guy. Like, what the first half had, was he had awesome. 14 kills. Uh, true, but it didn't didn't translate. No, it did. It, does, it doesn't always translate into a win. But like I said, like, just because I was talking about him, I was highlighting him, he was still keeping his same performance regardless yeah. of a loss. Also, how do we feel about those listenings, by the way? We had oh. a call out timeout. We also had a. a <laughs> Hey, that was the rest uh, of Twitch chat when they heard that listen, and they were they were they were clocked in. They were making sure they were getting every last little bit of that call, that call I was saying, or what that execute was. I wasn't even. I mean, that's me. 
I was doing that at SI. I was trying to get the round count. Yeah, but that's you. Teams. That's you where, though? Didn't matter where. It didn't matter where. It was no. the fact I was, I, you know, I was in the bathroom. I heard the, I heard the listening going in. I was like, <laughs> I, I need to listen to this. Wherever Gabe is, he makes sure that he gets that Absolutely. Listening. Well, the guy I want to listen to the most right now actually isn't Lex. We'll get to that later. Fault. I want to hear from Bursa real quick because Lowe's finally get their first dub in the NAL. I want to hear what everything is like in that camp. Bursa, if you can hear me, brother, congratulations on your first win in North America, my dude. It took a while, but you finally got there. What's it like getting a dub over Space Station of all teams? Hello, guys. How are you doing? Good, man. Uh, like, it's, I'm very happy that we could uh, win our first first win, first three points win, because we did a 6-6 six, six against Dark Zero, a 7-5 seven, uh, seven, against uh, Sonics, and we play a little uh, little bad against Oxygen. So I'm very happy we could do our game today, like we play as a team to, all together. Absolutely. And I have another question. Obviously, you're seeing both uh, Legacy and Farius perform extremely well. I mean, what does that do for you guys being the experienced guys to just see those guys just be able to perform the way that they are? Like, how does that help contribute to just even your overall play? Yeah, like, uh, they are our rookies, you know? Yep. Uh, it's very good to us. Like, they're performing very well. Uh, we know they are, like, uh, two pieces, like, uh, mm -hmm. two rookies. Uh, they are very good, and they they have a really good aim, and they are very smart, too. So, that's it. Like, uh, we we have the experience. They have the, uh, how can I say, like, the, the aim, and that's they're it. They're the goats. That's <laughs> your goats. That's goats. That's goats. That's the goats. I say. All right, man. Uh, you guys have now played back to back on Clubhouse as well. What do you think the biggest thing that changed was going from last week against Dark Zero coming into this match? I felt like you had some really explosive pushes. You were doing a great job on defense. For you, what was the biggest change, though? Yeah. Um, uh, for this uh, Clubhouse, we expected that uh, SSG would counter. Uh, some plays we did against Dark Zero, so we changed everything, almost everything. So we start to do uh, fast plays instead of uh, running all the map and mm -hmm. stuff like that. Like we we knew that we would catch them on on these uh, fast plays, you know. Yeah. I just have one really fast question. How is it playing in the NAL specifically? Um, like uh, it's good. Uh, also in Are Brazil, it's also good, but. Um, I don't can say easy, but it's different. It's really different than the Brazil, like uh, Brazil League. For sure. It's very different. Like uh, it's a total uh, opposite play style, yeah. and we we struggle in the beginning to to adapt. Like the Brazilian Brazilian teams mm -hmm. play a little different than NIL, so we we had a struggle in the beginning to 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 see how we can play against this this style. You know. For sure. Before we let you go, one last question. Because it took a little time for you to get your first win, it took until play day five and you had some other games to get some stuff sorted out. Was there ever a thought in the back of your mind that this might take a little bit before you finally got your first win and to not let yourselves get discouraged if it got to that point? Like, what's the mindset in, in, in the Lowe's camp if it took a couple losses in a row to finally win a game today? Yeah, like, uh, we are like a new team. Like, uh, I just played with Sex Cake before, so we knew that it would be hard uh, in the beginning. We have uh, not so much time to prepare ourselves for the NLL, NLL. So we knew we would probably struggle a little bit with this different play style, uh, but we didn't like uh, had uh, let these affect us, like the, the losses, because we, we saw that was like minimal mistakes made us to to lose like the three matches, you know? So we just like uh, fix it, the, the mistakes, and that's it. We, we believe in ourselves and that's it well good stuff brother congratulations again on the victory and we'll see you next time all right thank you have a good time for Lowe's to get a dub over SSG in their first win is a statement again it took them a while to do it but over Space Station of all teams an undefeated team that's a big thing yeah, and I mean, he said it himself. They had little mistakes in their previous games. They played really close. I don't think it's a crazy idea that they would come through, beat Space Station. I think it is shocking that it is Space Station. I call them the best team in the league coming into this game. I don't know if I can say that anymore. Yikes. I don't know who the best team in the league is. Um, but ultimately, I mean, this was a great showing coming through from Lowe's. They had the sign that said, believe in Brazil. Uh, it's hard not to with how well Brazil's been doing. And uh, if Lowe's can keep up that trend, man, it's going to be tough for the other teams in the league.
I mean, they're a sleeper pick. And I, like I said, I love to see this progress from them, but we, we got to see that continue. We can't just see this drop off here and that's it. We got to continuously see this team improve overall. Well, one of the heavy hitters has already sustained a loss on the day, but for our next matchup, it's two heavy hitters. And one of them, unfortunately, will have to take the fall. It's Dark Zero and M80 after the break when we come back. Bar none, Canadian's career stands out as one of the most storied in NA Siege history. In Brazil, Cameraman's easily one of the most recognizable players to ever grace the server. Today, they butt heads for the sixth time ever in their storied tenures, and now we get to bear witness. I'm Jacob, he's Laxy, he is Jesse, and this is M80 and Dark Zero. For those two players in particular, they've been duking it out against each other in servers since 2017, and now we finally get to see it domestically in the NAL. Yeah, and I mean, it's a great comparison because you've got Cameraman, one of the oldest players, I believe the oldest player of the big three regions right now, now inside of Rainbow Six Siege. And then you have Canadian, one of the best rookies that I've ever seen play. So, I mean, <laughs> He's the best 19 year old I've ever seen. Who really have been, uh, you know, around the seed for a while, obviously Canadian too. And uh, it's gonna be good to see them going head to head. No, it's, it's two giant stories, two really big names in the Siege history, two very big pillars. I mean, these are two teams that have tons of history. DZ having a little more, they've obviously been around for a long time. M80 
180 making face here throughout these year, throughout these past couple of years. I mean, this is going to be a game where we're going to see these two new rosters really duke it out and see what that ends up being because we all know the last M80 roster just wasn't it. I was going to say, the storyline is might be, for some people, Canadian versus cameraman, but in another sense, it's one team that didn't make any changes after their SI result versus another that completely blew up the whole team and decided to start from scratch. And for Dark Zero, they're the team that didn't make any adjustments, and yet they're the ones near the bottom of the scoreboards currently coming in in the seventh place in the NAL coming into this play day. So there are very clearly some things you need to work on still. Yeah, I mean, Dark Zero are massively underperforming. Uh, you talked about how these are two heavy hitters coming into the league, and I think it should be, but the way DZ have been playing, they frankly aren't right now. And I really don't like the way that Dark Zero have uh, kind of fallen off. You can see NJR stats 76 overall EPS. I, I don't think it's all on That's him. I'm not going to pay him. But it's like, still, it's still. It's ridiculous for NJR. Yeah. This guy's been Mr. Consistent for the last like four years. And now I believe he's sitting at minus 11 overall on his KD. His worst KD ever through a stage in the North American League was minus two. And now he comes out and he's really, uh, really underperforming. So I think Fox put a spell on him because every time Fox was like talking about like <laughs> really top players for each team, like they just very, they just didn't perform that well. So, yeah. so if, if Fox, if Fox hadn't said anything, then we wouldn't have been in this hole. Got it. We'll just blame Fox because we know he's co-streaming right now. This is Dark Zero's record from when they played earlier to their opening record right now. Their opening stage in 2023 stage two, considerably better. Their only loss, funnily enough, was to M80. Now they've struggled to get back up to that previous standard. Again, players are different. Stay same team philosophy, though. DZ loves to, I swear, like, this is just a trend for DZ. They love giving their fans heart attacks. All those <laughs> games are like seven eights, eight yeah. sevens. Like, it's, it's a consistent trend. But I think the biggest focus here is a lot of these teams, when I watch them play DZ, and you can say this about most situations, teams know what they're doing against said team. But, like, this stage specifically, like, I'm really watching teams focus heavy in on how they want to play against DZ and really meet them with aggression and slow down their play style overall. Yeah, I mean, Dark Zero are the slowest team in the league right now. Their average opening gunfight. The slowest. Gun the slowest. <laughs> Yikes. Their average opening gunfight is happening at a minute 20, which is not like outside the realm of possibility, but it's still ten, ninth out of ninth for the teams that we're seeing. So for Dark Zero, I, I want to see them try to speed things up. I know that's not their play style. They've always been known as a slow team, but I think it's biting them. And as you said, I think teams are really reading into that. But how much of this is a best of one problem? Best of threes when they played in the Invitational was obviously the standard and you didn't have to worry about playing at best of ones. But for round robin territory, how much does your play style change when you know you don't have another map in your back pocket if you lose the first one? I mean, it does. to me, it doesn't really matter personally because you have to win the match no matter what. Whether you play in another match afterwards, I mean, today they have two matches. So, I mean, yeah. if they you know, don't have that same performance, then there's no real excuse to be made. But you still have to be performing on that foot no matter what. And it is DZ. I think the biggest thing that holds them back is their slow pace. That if they do just shift that slightly and put it in a different direction or maybe play a little more loose, you would see a little more success and not these 7-8s, eight, 8-7 eight, games, just whatever that is. Because, again, DZ has always been down to the T in what they do. True. And they're not perfect right now. They're hoping to get back up to yeah. a, a better, higher I think standard. they're still a strong team. Don't, like, don't let no, me no, no, write of course, this yeah. that they're a weak team by any means. They they're did finally get team. a win in their third yes. game. So there is an upward trajectory for Dark Zero. For M80, they're also not perfect, but they're at least doing some things a bit better. They won their first two, lost a really close game on uh, uh, on Skyscraper to LG just last Friday, which was a great defensive half. And then suddenly they meet the whirlwind that is hat and then just can't close the game. Yeah, and I don't want to write off LG. I think M80 went into that game not giving the respect that LG deserves sure. because before they were, you know, a lower tier team and maybe these players aren't, you know, big names like them right. such as themselves. So I don't think they gave the full respect and they immediately caught a quick 7-5, well, a 5-7, and a quick ace from Hat Specific that really exposed M80's new style. But this is still a team. This is still a brand new team. They're finding their footing. And I think once they can come into, you know, the right places, both specifically Noodle and Citizen needing to perform at a higher level, once they can find that footing, I can definitely see this team on the uphill trend easily. The way that he talked about that LG game made it seem like maybe their approach versus LG wasn't the same as it was for other teams earlier in the stage. Is there a way that they can fix something? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we talked about pacing for Dark Zero. I think pacing's a big thing for M80 as well. You look at their last two games from last week, and I believe we've got some clips for you. The, the way that they were able to attack was very, very different. So this is their game that they played second. This was their match against Luminosity, and I just want you to focus on the speed. This is 5x at the moment. Keep an eye on the clock at the very top. And also, don't forget, they have a pick at this point. They killed one player trying to go for a spawn peak. So they're in a 5v4 trying to clear across the top floor. And we're watching Sports POV because he's really the guy to get in first often. We're past a minute. You're still working on one castle barricade. You get it open, what do you find after that? There's going to be a shield that they want to clear. They take another 30 seconds to clear the shield. It is taking 
ages to get going on that round. They will lose it eventually. Compare that to how they played against the Sonics. They moved lightning quick. Again, less than 2.30 on the clock. They're less than 30 seconds in. They've already found an opening pick. They're in the building. They're clearing top floor. That's the difference I've noticed. And I was curious, you know, why is this happening? Why are we seeing some rounds where they go really fast, some games where they go really slow? And I went through and I looked through the footage and I found something I think you may find interesting. I said, what's going on with Spoit? Why is he going so much faster? And boom, right there. Did you catch that? <laughs> no way. And legally, I cannot explain how I got this, but I, get, I sent it to my person at the lab. I sent it in and they were able to confirm two things for me. Number one, this is indeed Spoit's cup that we're holding right here. Yes, be careful with that. Number two, that cup, based on the trace amounts of liquid we found, had at least 140, uh, 1,400 milligrams of caffeine. That's enough to kill a rodent in most situations. So I don't care what Spoit's drinking, I don't care what is making him play so good, but they need to keep that speed up and, you know, however it happens, they gotta get it. Wait, hold on to clarify. Was that cup from the game against Sonics or the game against LG? This is the Sonics hey, cup. Is okay, so Spoit needs his caffeine to do well. That's I a see. Spoit I cup. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, Jesus. get my a DMs Spoit cup. <laughs> well, yeah, uh, that, that's our uh, scientifically deduced reason for why Spoit can go fast against some teams. And slow is this why you weren't other. here? You, you been, were getting I've that been, evidence? I've been doing field work. You <laughs> to, to be fair, their land center is in Canada. That's probably why he was there. That makes it's all making sense now. <laughs> the reason they didn't want me past the border. <laughs> <laughs> he had uh, uh, important knowledge that had to be retained in Canada still. So, oh, map, we go back. <laughs> all right. We go back to Skyscraper, which again, which was the map that LG just beat M80 on. And M80 were the ones that had final say. It was either Clubhouse or Skyscraper opinions. What do we think? I, I would like to say that, again, M80 slept on LG, and which is why they really hit a wall right there. Is mm -hmm. They didn't give the respect that was should, should have been given to LG, and now you're going against DZ. You know a team that has setups, has that success, has the players to behind that. So I think we will see a maybe more faster pace because they will have an understanding of how DZ plays. But then it comes down to, are you going to let one of those DZ play players get an ace on you and not work together and cohesively, you know, take a 1v5 properly? Right. I mean, listen, I, I think M80 and Dark Zero both have problems, especially when you look at that skyscraper game from M80. But I think M80's problems are easier to fix. You speed that up, I think that game goes a lot better for you. For Dark Zero, you've still got players that aren't performing. You're still going slow as a snail on every single map that you've played. I think M80 take this. The question is, does Spoit have an energy drink for this game? Do you have insider information, and does that sway your prediction? I have someone on the compound. I and can't go too much into details, but they, they're looking into it. We'll find out. What's your pick? I'm 80. Okay, Lex? I'm at 47%. I'm oh going boy. down. Uh oh He you might not win the championship. I, I'm changing mine. I'm going M80. You're going M80 after all. I'm going M80. Because at this point, if you slip down any further, you won't catch up to Fox. I'm going M80. You're going M80. I don't care. I'm going M80. Do it. All right. I'm doing it. Jump on the train. Doing it. You're going for the popular team and hoping that Spoit has the exact right liquid that he needs in his cup. It's time for game two. It's Parker McKay and Nicholas Moritz and to take us all the way to Skyscraper. Thank you very much. And, and I just, I don't want to, I don't want to leak how this came to be here. M80 are boot camping in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. I happen Ooh. to currently be at this present moment living in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. I was born here. And let's say maybe... Jesse and I used our Canadian powers to get somebody to infiltrate the M80 compound with all of its security, its barbed wires, its surveillance, everything. Grab that red solo cup and send it all the way to Edmonton. And then from Edmonton all the way down to Philadelphia. That cup has been on quite the journey, but numbers don't lie. And if that really is that much caffeine, oh. I can see why M80 would have the upper hand, just as you, the people, seem to think that M80 has the upper hand in the predictions, but only by a small bit, 55 to 45%. Nicholas! Yes? What, what are we expecting? I mean, I saw Laxing changing his call there at the very end, so you know what, I, I root for M80. And I think Laxing's feeling the pressure of falling behind on the statistics here. When we come down to the nitty-gritty numbers, I also think that M80 are favored. And I think JC hit the nail on his head. I think M80, they have easier problems to solve than that of Dark Zero. M80 is a speed problem. DC seems to be a bit of a consistency issue across the board. They need a good day. M80 just gotta speed things up just a tiny bit. Arbiter Benz though, 
They speak for a couple of different things. Monty, of course, is a very comfortable pick for most teams at this level of play. That's going to be removed. It's a very stable operator here on Skyscraper. Then you got Dokubi, of course, the, for the roam clear. Very commonly played, very commonly banned. And then the power operators up of the Fenrir and the Asami. This is pretty much as standard of a Skyscraper matchup that you can see. This is just respect from both sides, understanding the strong operators, and saying we don't want to see any of it. So now... With this being the scene that is being set, we gotta see what kind of preparation these players and these teams will bring to play around this. We saw Lowe's play Thermot Shotgun Rush. We saw them play Blitz and Monty. We saw them play Glass. Lowe's showed us a lot of fun rounds of Rainbow Six Siege. And I would like to see more fun rounds here between M80 and Dark Seer because Skyscraper, if played very slow, is not a very fun map to watch. So speed, aggression, confidence, and teamwork all the way. And of course, don't forget the most important part, the power of friendship. Okay. And overrated. M80 used to be known as the friendship roster. <laughs> How did that go? It did not go well. So, <laughs> now you come to Skyscraper and now you are the international roster assembled from a variety of different continents, currently playing on a continent that actually none of the players have come from. That's crazy. And here we are, DZ, favoring the same two operators, banned every single time. Dokubi and Izami are no longer in action if DZ is in the map. Those are their operator bans for the first three maps. And would you be surprised to see it also for the fourth? M80 banning the Monty, as they have done previously in Fenrir as well. This is very standard stuff. Saw a brief bit of, I think it was drone work downstairs in that bedroom bathroom portion of the map the game oh, yeah. that we just witnessed was played on clubhouse and we talked about bomb site rotation skyscraper was the map that we used as an example of that because the bottom floor bomb site of bedroom and bathroom has been showing up more frequently than we are used to will it appear here will that part of the map be a focal point for either dark zero on their defenses or their attacks when they go there or m80 for their first six attacks we will watch Quite keenly, actually, to see if it occurs. That part of the map is below the bomb site that we're going to start off on, which is the office bomb site on the top floor. M80 will begin by clearing over T and Karaoke, where DZ has established a fair bit of a defense. They've got some reinforcements, they've got some mute jammers, and they've got a setup that will require M80 to respond. I think this is very much like a counterpay to Darkseer watching M80 playing Skyscraper previously because that 5x sped up clip that JC broke down, this is the same thing. 1 minute 30 seconds, they just get into the building, Noodle finds a pick onto Nave, that's a great start for the attack, but it's very slow. Spot walks in, summon the wall, guess what? Mute jammer. So half the round burnt, they just walked in the door, Somehow the second summit goes off, they EMP it, there we go. So now we have a player more from DC stuck in a corner. They made it could build a two-man lead here. Spoit walks in and beheads Pan Bazoo. They look like they want some more, but Canadian has managed to evade them inside of tea room, flashed out. He's gonna just be eating flashes like it's his day job. Another one will come in from cameraman now as NJR has died, DZ. Just hoping that Canadian can keep numbers close. Not to be the case. It's all up to Bolo in a 1v3. He's got that ACOG. He's got a mirror window. This is your real last line of defense to stop them from coming towards the other side of the map, but the backside of Bolo gets droned out over by Bomb Chassis. Great mechanical skill from Bolo. But additional skill is there to be had from oh. Amy. Bolo, I don't know if that was a fat finger or what the what the exact plan was there, but he somehow manages to take an awful lot of damage. Hold on. Holding court in this position, pulling out the sidearm after dropping Noodle. Spam ping's coming in. Could very easily turn this, oh. but Kino pinches in with cameraman distracting Bolo the other way around. M80 started off strong, and they end strong despite the best efforts from Bolo. I like that from M80. Not sure it was like a conscious decision or just like what happened because they were droning, but I truly believe one of the strongest things you can do in like a three versus one is let that sing single player just kind of sit there and sweat. Because Bolo got that first pick, he's feeling it, it's now 1v3, he's swinging, he's going for pre-fires, he's got that adrenaline fired up. And maybe they pull the plot for 20 seconds. They hold angles, they start droning, they get the intel, they walk up, they, they smoke grenade, then they push together. And you saw Bola in the beginning of that 1v3 versus the ending, a little bit slower. That adrenaline slowly leaving that body, 
So I like that it's kind of like sweating him out or bleeding him out, making him kind of relax again, and then going for the play together. DC had intel to work with, but it's a 1v3. They're coming from all directions. That's just not a super winnable position. That early round though, it made it took a very long time to get into the building. And when you're playing Skyscraper, it's hard to get in the building. It's hard to clear the middle of the building. And it's also hard to clear the bomb side. It's why the best Skyscraper teams in the world either will go for a side rush because then time is not an issue, or you need to have a constant amount of progression through the map. That means not getting stuck at one point for half the round. Because if a defending team doesn't just surrender kills some way, like for example, peak in last round from DC, trying to cover each other, you don't have enough time to walk all the way through the bomb side. Time just runs out. So M80, while they win that first round, they do need to speed things up a little bit more, shows a bit more confidence, but look at this lineup. Sense, Deimos, Glass, Osa, this speaks confidence. This speaks fun siege. And I'm just waiting right now, watching the player positions, they're clearly trying to set up exactly what the execute is going to be. And right now, it's all from outside the building. Opening windows, applying some pressure, droning out, getting that intel to figure out where that execute will happen later on. I wouldn't be very happy playing against this M80 lineup, that's for sure. No, no. Unless you're Nafe, another warden. And as you can see, brought the tools to counter it, but... Again, how you go about dealing with these operators, especially the Deimos, who we have seen some really good looks on. Just as we see a good look Whoa. of a grenade bounced around and NJR swings on the cameraman who decides that backstairs was the part of the map that he wanted to hold. Um. Noodle amidst the smoke, getting diffuser down, but there's Nate, Nitrocell in hand, shooting through the wall as Kino to eliminate Bolo. He had the marks. He saw the yellow suit of armor. And now, swing on to Nave, but a miss. Easy standing pat for the moment. Half of the round has gone by. Citizen trying his best to track down these members of DZ. He found Panbazoo and now through the floor wow. will take out Nave. Relatively easy finish for him. Fuser obviously surrendered earlier when Noodle died to that Nitro self. With the remaining two players of M80, your task is to either kill the last three from DZ or retrieve the Diffuser, which seems unlikely at this point. Easy have established crosses so that if you try to push towards that diffuser, you'll be finished off. NJR, being washed. Ice point. Down he goes. <laughs> Citizen scrambling from below. He's got the read, but very limited time, Nick. This should be a relatively easy Dark Zero round. It should. I mean, Demos is into that one update at a time, but when you see the opponent, that opponent also sees you, but a bit delayed. So if you scan somebody and hunt them here from Citizen, DC will communicate where exactly Citizen's going to be playing at and try and shut it down. They got a triple crossfire right now, waiting for Citizen to make the first move and completely locking him out. And DZ's a disciplined team. Both of them are, but they know exactly where this last player from M80 is going to come. They're not even <laughs> bothering to engage. Look at this. Citizen walking and making uh, a ton of noise now over by Golden T. Might get the swing around, but NJR flicks at the last second and DZ prevails. Hammerman was the one who was supposed to make some noise and keep things going for this M80 team. After he walked in towards the bomb site, couldn't get it done. He gets picked off really early on. That's utility lost. That's the inability for the defenders to see removed. You now have a much clearer line of sight to where that diffuser is going to go down. And then, of course, you've got the warden to see through all of it, irrespective of what comes your way. And DZ, read into that, shut them down. The diffuse plan is a huge gamble, does not work off, does not work out. And just like that, M80 find themselves in a bad spot and are not able to recover as DZ plays the waiting game and shuts them down in the final remaining new engagements. You can see in that last round that M80, they are still like a, a new squad. There's like some very small kind of details that were missed. Cameraman on the sense went for the execute to like throw out that roly poly before his teammate came up the back staircase to hold the door. So, cameraman dies with the gadget in the hand. That's how they lose that opening duel. Then they go for the plan. C4 from Geisha gets shut down. Like, it was a very simple kind of execute that one single C4 could completely destroy. And that's what happened. But I like it. It was a good attempt. And if DC were roaming with a bigger presence around, like, off the bomb side, it also might have worked. But third round now, Nave looking for a cheeky spawn peak. 
Mind you again, there is a tra the trajectory lineup that you see in casual and rank is also in pro play. So Nave can see exactly like if that C4 is going to make it or not. He jumps out, tosses it. It doesn't land on any of the players, so no real value being gained. But it does make the opponents of, of Medi kind of stay on their toes. Okay, DC are going for spawn peaks. They're playing this kind of front forward aggression early on. We need to be careful. Take those extra 5-10 seconds to pre-aim the windows, pre-aim the doors, not just like sprint up towards the building. Because the worst way to start a round on attack is a player gets bomb peaked. And if you look at the attacker lineup right now, no matter who you kill, if you're Dark Zero, you're happy. Either you kill the IQ, so let's, you know, counter intel, you kill Soft Destruction Sophia, or you kill any of the power operators or heart breachers. So any single kill from DC side will heavily sway the favor, or for, well, rather, will heavily favor them this round. This offside flank and slash lurk roll has been favored by Canadian for quite some time, and I honestly cannot say that I'm the biggest fan of it, but if DZ thinks it's working or if Troy thinks it's working in particular, Troy is a multi-time world champion. I think he knows yeah. a little bit better than me. I sit here in the cheap seats. Well, actually, that's not true. I, I don't know if sponsor obligations allow me to say the chair I'm sitting in, but this was certainly not a cheap seat. Same with yours. <laughs> it, was a, it was a turn of phrase. Canadian decides to tussle with Kino onto that geisha window. There's nothing cheap about that. What thing you could say is maybe Kino getting a relative freebie, losing half of his HP, and Geisha has now been consumed by M80 as DZ fall off. They don't need to waste a lot of time because whether it's just due to M80 droning on other parts of the map or Canadian being a thorn in their side, there's only a minute remaining for the attackers to get in. Oh yeah. And not just that, but it may have two drones left. And, you know, there are two flanks typically open on the attack. There are two staircases, for example. Either you'll have the flanks open, which means DC can go for a flank for free, or they cannot drone the entries. And that's why we see Citizen check every single corner on that window, because you don't know what's actually clear. They're going to go in completely blind into a bomb side attack, and they have Grim, thankfully. That can give them intel. But there it is, the swing from Bolo. I'm down to a 4v4. An MP7, it stings. Oh boy, does it ever. And Bolo will now be in the midst of the smoke. Watch towards the opening as the fire will rain in front of his very eyes. This is a very heavy split push in the moment from M80. For a second there, like cameraman was going to get the read on Bolo. Kino suffering some damage as he walks on through Ouch. Bolo, still in this position. It's a powerful one. You'd think that Bolo is the only player left with what's going on with DZ as M80 decides to feed themselves one by one by one, but the cavalry shows up at the right time. DZ out muscle the M80 push. That round is just solely decided by Bolo playing the corner. He gets a kill by the swing, gets a kill in the vertical. It's just really good siege from him, and it's also a discipline from Darkseer. They recognize they don't really got to move a whole lot here. They got bombsite, they got strong positions, and they do have the crossfires if they need it. The moment Bolo died, we saw NGR swing out, get the trade, and then there's just a complete lockdown from Dark Zero. And time really is a problem from M80. They don't have enough time to probably figure out what the approach is going to be. We saw a cameraman outside the building trying to maverick the wall with like 20 seconds left. And he's outside the building. Like, he has to rotate to get in just to assist his teammates. And the wall didn't even get opened in, in the end. So they don't get that breach pressure either. So Emedi comes down again just to speed. The Doki ban makes it more difficult. The Monty ban also makes this more difficult. But this is also Skyscraper. Going 2-4 on the attack in half is not the end of the world. I would argue if you're a matey, you're probably being kind of hopeful for a 3-3 half at best. And if you go 2-4, it's like, okay, we didn't get the 3-3, but I mean, we got the second best option. Right? We got 2-4 half. So they got their first round in the back. That's very important to note here. But they're still fishing for at least one more. Last round, they tried those power operators. They played... The, the Grim and they played the Capital, but again, as I said earlier, they didn't have enough time or information to work those sketches properly to get a full bomb set execute. So, what can you do better? Well, I think the Ying here will help them because Ying, while it's great for the bomb set attack, you can also clear out the roamers. There's a roamer in the corner, flashbang them, push and get the kill. Easy peasy. They're playing Twitch. They're getting more information in the front. They can also deny some of those gadget trees, uh, gadgets. And then you have Nomad that can lock down the flanks, which enables you to send more drones into the front to help the roam clear. So I like the adaptation here from M80, but it comes down again to execution. Hey, 
Execution, like how Canadian was executed. <laughs> Ooh, Geisha. Not that kind. Not if you're a DC fan. Maybe not that kind. You know, I'd really love to ask Citizen why he runs Ammunition's Charm on every single gun. Maybe he's a fan. Have you thought about that? I'm a fan of Ann, but I don't run her charm on every gun. Pam oh, is out! What the? Second last bullet. Mag dumps into Citizen. That's first pick is DZ. Hold down below. The other side of the map, though. The question that was asked before round one even started was whether DZ would defend that bedroom bathroom bomb site. Not so far. Three rounds and DZ has gone through the same standard rotation that we see time and time again. Maybe not time and time again, not if that part of the map is being used more often. Now Noodle looking for a kill on back stairs, oh. but he's ran into it by NJR. Both of them knew that a fight was coming. NJR on five and one so far through three active rounds, four active rounds, even though it hasn't finished yet. Seems like everybody wants to get in on the fun here. One call, one kill from Pambazoo, one from Bolo, one from NJR. Cameraman find himself in Geisha, but empty handed as he can't get through that castle barricade. The only way out is to melee it. There's Bolo picked off by Spoif. His M80 are making quick work now that they've gotten into the building upstairs, but we'll find a bit of a troubling situation. Down goes Cameraman, oh. Spoit will follow. NJR and Pambazoo, the last two kills, and DZ answer back. So, looking at these rounds and the little, little information I know about M80, so Cameraman is supposed to be the one calling as far as I understand, and that was a big talking point for the team and the players, like, he's still getting used to, like, speaking English and, like, learning to call because it's very different. And it's been a big learning process, and I want to see, like, what they have to say about that, because we do have a tactical timeout from M80, so... Can we pick their brains on what they think is going wrong? Got a little lesson in here. Guy Geisha, guys already know. But if they reinforce both, because they did the other lineup, if they reinforce both, you could do the same attack. Fuck it, if they reinforce both, move base. Can you check that? Okay. If they, okay. they do the same thing. And if you see uh, anyone below, check, track the, the warden, okay? Mm -hmm. Track the warden. And on exhibition, guys, it's fine. I think we do the same thing. I think uh, Willy can play with Deimos. So if, like, worst scenario, can kill the guy Geisha from below. And, bro, let's do towards Dragon, bro. Terrace is move. Dragon. Let's do Dragon. Yeah. Terrace, move. Yeah. Terrace, move. Yeah. Okay? Hmm. Yes, I was curious what they thought the problems were there, and, and I, I was going to make my own note and say, Cameraman is often playing these operators in a very kind of back-end position. Maverick outside the building, Ying that last round outside the building, and then, like, on the rush round with the, with the sense and stuff, he died early. It's like, when your leader is not getting the full overview in the round, I'm playing very far back, it can be very difficult to actually progress. Because if the entries want to go in one direction and Cameron's doing his own thing on the other side of the building, you cannot really make the strategical call for the team as to what to do next. So the time out there being spent strategically, what the win conditions were going to be, it was like find the warden, hunt the warden, for example, and be careful of the staircases. So try and look out for that in this upcoming round. You, Parter, spoke about how master bedroom bombsite, right? And it's not a bombsite that we see all that much in North America or in Europe. But in Brazil, which you and I also happen to cast together, we do see this bombs play, being played a lot more than other regions. DC right now, not quote-unquote innovating because it's been done before, but they're actually happily playing the side here on round number five. It's a good round to do it after a tactical timer from Amity because they might not be expecting this bomb site. So kind of changing things up here, throwing that prep work possibly into the gutter. One thing that I don't want the listen-ins to take away from is the, I guess knowledge that the other team speaks as well. Dark Zero yes. gets to use that same time to talk to their coach Mint and go through how they want to best approach, not just this round, but potentially subsequent rounds. So if DZ has those 45 seconds to also strategize, why not throw a wrench in the plan of whatever you think M80 might be going over? Now, I mean, I will say a lot of what M80 can talk about, and as we heard, doesn't need to be site specific here. DZ could have very obviously spent that entire time talking about <laughs> nothing more. <laughs> Bolo's cursor there. Nothing more than this bomb set in particular. And hey, what a start it is for Dark Zero. A minute off the clock. You know, a noodle off the board. Oh boy. 
chaos in the server, yeah? <laughs> I mean, what do you make of this? The maid, they take a time out, they talk about what to fix, they hunt down the warden, sure, but what does it cost you? Probably a little bit too much in this round. Very quick now for Spoit to get in through the rotate. Cameraman dies, Dark Zero had lost NJR, and they trade back. Spoit has found himself inside the bomb site. The ash with diffuser, that's an abnormality. Citizen watching quite intently. Where is DZ going to come from? Is Canadian on the gadget to see that this home oh, hold on. is now being diffused by none other than M80, who get a pick and then head out of the building. There might only be two of them, but Spoit and Citizen can do some serious damage to the best of the teams. Boyd's in a strong spot too. Those kill holes that Dark Zero are looking down through do not provide a proper vantage point onto Ow. Spoit. So instead they have to take the engagement directly and they'll do just that DZ. The last remaining players all coalescing around that part of the map, gunning him down their citizen to the rescue, but the flank from Nath will shut it down. The two Brits engaging in a 1v1, but it's Dark Zero's Brit to come out ahead. You know, watching those player cams, it almost looked like M80 were happier about losing that round than DC were about winning it. It really is like, uh, we're here to play, boys, when it's Dark Zero and the job is not done yet. They might be winning the rounds, they might be up with a significant score lead 4-1, to one, but it really, for them, is, you know, they know how close this can get, right? DC is an orc historically, they love to go over time. They love to make it close and exciting, and they know that you can never really count this out because, again, this is Skyscraper defense. While DC are playing a really good round of Rainbow Six Siege, he's also maybe being really sloppy on the attack, and I think someone like Troy, he recognizes this. He would be the type of guy to say, guys, we didn't win this round, they simply lost it. Because MAD are not putting up a significant fight in these rounds, it's usually pretty one-sided favor in Dark Zero. The only time DC they fall that single around is when they give up a bunch of opening kills early on. They've not made that mistake since. It's very clear to me that Dark Seer go, okay, and maybe they're slow, they're struggling, they're not getting inside the building, so those don't give them anything for free. We only see Dark Seer make those kind of peaks and aggressive moves when they have to. And it's really well recognized by the team. You know, DC did have a couple of like early struggles this stage. They were hot during SI, surprising, I think, everybody with their performance, looking like a really strong team. They go to stage one, you know, a few weeks later, and they look like a kind of different team. They don't play as well, they don't play as confident, and it just outright didn't look like they were as good or well prepared, perhaps. That's maybe the land magic, who knows? But so far, it has been a really good look from them. And maybe on their final round in the first half, Looking for that again, 2-4 side. That is what they're aiming for, most likely. But there's a possibility of that slight upset where DC takes a fifth. This has been a very, very good start for Dark Zero, who haven't really been the team that I think we expected after the six invitational, right? You brought yeah. in Nafe, you brought in Bolo. You have a great finish there at the event itself. You know, make main stage. Yeah. Finish in that fifth to sixth place in the top six, you could say, but not much better than sixth. And well, it's been a an odd run for them. One overtime win, one overtime loss, one regulation oh. lost, and a minus five round differential. Easy have struggled to close things out without going to overtime. I mean, closing out the match in a positive direction has been the bigger struggle for Dark Zero, but a 4-1 scoreline on defense on Skyscraper is pretty good. We'll see if they can hang on to it when they switch sides. Yep, we see again timer halfway point. Troy was stuck in Terrace for a bit, but just falls back off that angle, I imagine. This is technically the quickest round for Mady to roam clear. It's still not quick, but it's the quickest. Halfway through the round, but Pembasu has not been killed just yet. Bolo goes down first, but the roaming presence is still there. Pembe gets the right timing, could get a massive flank onto a Kino holding on to that diffuser, floating alone over by Ooh. Drum. He's got backup, but not within striking distance. DZ licking their chops at one player from M80, oh. deciding to go on their own. Spoit's been downed, Kino to the rescue. Dark Zero, though, have yet to secure a kill as Spoit is brought back from near death. That Maestro Cam getting good value, looking long range. As DZ can continue to rotate, continue to work around. 40 seconds left. They've got some spam pings, but they cannot relinquish control of the bomb site or else bad will become worse. Surprised Pemmy didn't go for the flank, he's instead back to the bomb side. they're planting. Continuity 4 below, that's the win condition, goes out, but they relocate. Now immediately they're looking very strong in this position because now they can plant, there's no C4 below. 
absolutely zero chance that Pambazoo gets on in. Spoit, his third kill so far this round. As the chunky monkey of NJR's Maestro gets up top, no ace to be had for Spoit. He's too busy getting the diffuser down as Noodle gets one. Spoit a 4K, an M80. Send the first half, send the first half into the books. A 4-2 half, though, for DZ. But as you said, 4-2 is what you're going to be playing for. And a lot of times with the way that we see these maps played, winning two rounds on attack is all you really need. That's managing expectations. And if that's the case, expectations managed well on the side of M80. Well, you're right. Um, from this side, though, looking at that previous round, sorry, I was so thrown off by the Citizen and Noodle player camps. They're so funny to me. They're so... <laughs> I can't focus. Um, I had a point I was gonna make, and B Citizen just completely destroyed it. Thinking, oh yeah, last round. I'm curious what actually happened with the with the opening kills. Spoil just got a three k as you mentioned, and I'm curious if Dark Zero were the ones to swing and make a mistake, or if it was M80 making a proactive play with Spoil being a kind of you know key player to do it. Because when we saw that third kill go out, we spit to the Spoil. He was inside mini bar, basically on the bomb side. That either means that Emity made a huge play successfully, or Dark Zero, they kind of had a big screw up. And when you have Pembasu in that flankable position early on, and then lose players on site, that's likely what prompted Pembasu to give up the flank and instead go play safely on the site with his teammates, but then it falls apart. Whereas if you have that strong bomb site, Pamba can go for a risky flank. Maybe it works out, maybe it doesn't, who knows? But it's those small things that are quite important to look out, to look out for. Side swap though. DC, they bring a very similar lineup to that of M80, the Nomad, the verticality of Buck, and of course the Grim is that power tool with double heart breach in case either NGR or Pampus who falls. This means both players can play a bit more aggressive and play a little bit more loose with their life on these operators, as there's always a backup second heart breacher, and they can apply pressure on both sides. Panda, for example, getting the main side, NGR hovering on the Geisha side as well, trying to breach on both ends at the same time. Boyd hears the skeleton key. There's a drone not far removed that will continue to antagonize him, harass him from that spot. Boyd's got two goo mines in back pocket. He can litter the way back to the bomb site with some pain and misfortune for the attackers. Three drones all used at him, and yet Spoid is handling all of them. Cannot fly mm. blind in this position. That might be a bit of sloppiness from Bolo. Oh. As Spoid is just shredding DZ. Canadian to the rescue. But the damage has already been done at this point. Ambazoo and Bolo down for the count. A terrible start from Dark Zero on their first attack. It is. And you see right here, they rotate from M80. This thing, we got two picks. We got one to get all the way back to bomb side. Play that at four versus three. The thing about Skyscraper that's very unique to other maps is, is, is it's hard to roam clear and it's hard to take the bomb side. There's no easy stage off the round favoring the attack. It just sucks all the way through. And it's why when you see defenders get this kind of big lead, they will just fall back. They, because the side is so strong, you don't have to run the roam, the flank, the sea force below. You can literally just sit up in four separate corners with a decent amount of crossfire and just wait for DC to walk in through one of two doorways or one of two staircases. It's a negative outcome heavily on Dark Zero side here. And they got a problem to solve. They have no beats on Grim. All they have are five flashbangs and this final air jet from Nave. And again, two doors into side. You know, it's just waiting so patiently. Nitrous already as well. His Noodle lurks down below. If Canadian wants to get that diffuser off, Noodle will be waiting patiently for that. If you can gain any information, DZ now moving their forces ever closer to the bomb site, but NJR has another idea. Somebody needs to pressure cameraman and Kino. Easy, putting NJR in that position. Down they all go. Boy, that was okay. Well, that one was over in a hurry. M80. So cool, so poised. This boy's picture's been frozen now for about three rounds. Looks very <laughs> disinterested in the matchup that's going on. <laughs> He's not making it back, man. There, there he is. <laughs> we won, guys. Oh. Can we just man. can we can we just go back? I know. One more time. Just one more time, please. <laughs> Good job, everybody. He's lost in thought. 
He's like, what, what happened that round? I, I I think I got like, what, two kills? Just like swing the breach and then like, we just kind of won, right guys? That's what happened? I think, I don't know. He's caffeinated, he's feeling good. Seeking those engagements, seeking the swings. And honestly, uh, yeah. I think uh, if you're M80, you're very happy with how that round played out. And if you're Dark Zero, you're starting to feel the annoyance of attack skyscraper. So adaptation game. We gotta look at the operator lineup here for DC. What are they thinking? IQ, Glass, Brava, Thermite. Not all that much changes in terms of like how this one will play out. It's the same kind of operators, you know? Anti-destruction, soft destruction, and then one single power builder. Last time it was Scrim, this time it's Capital. In the previous round though, the way M80 played the four versus two was very smart. They had two players below, one Solus who can figure out where the planet's going down, and the other one with a C4 in pocket. And it forced DC to attack on two different floors, horizontally and vertically, with only three players. So they're gonna be super spread apart. M80 did not look like the strongest team on the attacking side, but that, you know, defense at first round already now have shown us that there's a bit more depth to this roster than what their attack showed us. We've been seeing a fair bit of Brava so far in this matchup, and again, Brava oftentimes a reactive operator. You have a lot of gadgets there from the defenders? Well, bring a Brava. I'll trickster op will be able to steal things away from you. Down oh. goes Sploit, Panbazoo, successful on the entry. Entry kills so far! Obviously a big part of this matchup is now Cameraman. Side of reception does some serious work to try to get rid of Panbazoo off that position. No damage though done. Ambazoo suffering oh. earlier on. Cameraman taking some damage too. Both very similar in HP. It's a good start. And again, getting the kills also buys you time. Now DC can go a bit slower and just solidify their position and not lose that early advantage. So, the position right now. Drone, Brava, right now, Nave getting active. Try and hack those default cameras. Look for utility and communicate where those players are. DC can take the next 20, 30 seconds or so before wanting to hit the bombs at itself. Just as we did in our very first matchup, we've got a live listen-in ready for you, and we'll get to hear how Dark Zero plans their execute for the final minute of this round. Good one now, Rob. Not seeing, know this bar, not seeing anything, no. no. Okay, I can delivery delivery is good, Rob. He's in spawn with me. Okay, let me open up Black Window here. Now so I can with, just stack up with you. Okay, I'm ready. I only, I only have I ice just walk. Are we ready? I'm, I'm ready to go. There's, there's a wub on us. There's a wub on us. Fuck yeah, I have my black health. Team barbecue, team barbecue. Cross, keg cross. Team barbecue as well. Who is it? Who, down, who's I'm down. Lucy, Lucy I am down. Can we, can we reset cross, and pick? I'm walking on black here. For yeah, I'll, be, I'll be box with yeah, box. We, we, we we I don't know if I can res. I'm 1 HP. I can open this wall, maybe. I need help so I can res. I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. This guy's in barbecue. He's on the bomb barbecue, I think. He flashed. On the bomb. Yep, on the bomb. On the bomb, dead. Nice. Can you flash and maybe cross on me? Cross keg. Cross keg. Yeah. Take, 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 take. Oh, one, cat, one cat, one cat, one cat. It's soulless. Above, above, above. Yeah, I'm gonna try to go above real quick. We can down these yeah, heels. Yeah. Both above, both above. You gotta turn off yeah. my chest. I can go for purple. In your long, in your long. I'm playing purple side. Okay. In my hall. You gotta play life. Two. Blind. It's fine. You're gonna have time. You're gonna have time. You can call if you guys black. That's it. 1v1. Yep. It's no one. It's a Valkyrie. Top black. I'll see if he goes to black. He's going down. Yeah. Going down. You can win for a bubble as well, you need to. Bottom black. Go in fish side. Going back to barbecue door. In barbecue. No eyes now. I'm sure. Sure. What a shot from Noodle. And they had full intel on the side of Dark Zero. But as I said in map number one, and I'm going to say it every single time, just because you know where somebody is does not mean you're going to win that engagement. Excellent play by M80, with Noodle especially, not having any information as to the down on NJR. So, you throw the impact grenade, how do you recover? You know, you play it safe, right? And at that time, yeah. you very briefly, the Solus went on to scanner, saw that the diffuser was being planted, but didn't do anything about it because your greater fear is where that last and unaccounted for player in DZ that was last seen at backstairs was playing. Noodle played that about as perfect as you could. And for people who don't play at this level, you don't know how quickly it is for you to get swung and die. If you play this game, 
just for fun or you play at lower ranks you don't really know what hits you half the time you die at the higher ranks and that was a great example of it noodle was barely on the screen for a nanosecond and that was enough to get the final kill and propel m80 to a tie both of these teams now sitting four rounds apiece one of the interesting things to listen to Dark Zero's communication has always been how disciplined they are when you look at how they play their player positions and how they play the game strategically, but also how disciplined they are in their communication. There's very little talking. While the caps off fire bolts were going out in the smoke grenades, no one was saying a word. Everyone understood the mission, and you can tell just from like our point of view, not being in the server with them, I feel like we had a very good idea of what DC was trying to do and where the enemy was based off of their callouts as well. I was actually surprised at how much Bolo was talking to, calling both the Execute there, saying that he was ready, asking for help with the pickup, and just kind of directing them around a little bit, whereas Troy wasn't as much and Nave wasn't as much. But that's probably given the player positions. It just shows the depth that Dark Zero has with this roster. They have multiple people that can call now with a more experienced veteran roster with both Nave and Bolo joining the squad. DC, they're quick in the building. Bolo on the Ash Acock, by the way. Damn, does it feel good. And they're looking for players. They're looking to get the early pick, just like in the previous round, because that is probably going to be the key to success here. Rolled early lead, hold on to it, attack the side in that man advantage. Bolo with the bad timing doesn't get the pick there, but he has the insight at least that one player rotated from that mayor window towards Drum instead. Now that Ash's pick rate is starting to climb yet again, whether it be just changes to the ACOGs and the scopes, as you mentioned, or because of how good Ash's utility can be, it's a good reminder that Ash's breaching rounds are capable of shattering mirror windows. And because of this, now Citizen will be playing blind behind that spot. Pambazoo, the first one to die. The first interaction involves Spoit. Spoit just needs to hold this position on Warden. That's it. Citizen far enough back, falling off of that mirror window as we talked about, swinging onto the ash, but Bolo survives for the time being. Citizen re-engaging, leading Bolo right into the line of fire. Scrambling back. Where's the bomb site through Dragon? Easy paying dearly to gain control of this part of the map. Maybe they have one strat right now. Oh, damn, is it good. Get opening kill, fall back to bomb side, play favorable numbers, win the round. That's how all three defensive rounds so far have basically played out, and it looks to be the same way it goes here as well. They're back on side, they got the pick, Canadian and Nave both very low in HP. DC, they do have to fire and smoke from the capital, but again, they don't have the numbers to work with this. MA didn't have information, they had no drones. DC have seven drones left, but they're lagging guns. They're lagging actual people to send into battle right now on the bomb side. Nafe almost dies now as well. In fact, he is down, but there's a trade. It's 2v4, still favoring M80. Tuberau will be able to freeze you out of the objective, quite literally, as that's exactly what Noodle's objective is. NJR with one, but a twist and turn, and not just utility. It's the firepower from Tuberau that does so much damage. M80 takes the lead. They pick up their fifth round. You know, let this be a lesson. If you ever feel like you are losing it because you're down in round count, never count yourself out on Skyscraper. Defense is very strong. Can you hear me? Yeah. All right, Yo. look, let's, let, let's be careful with the frustration, all right? Uh, we know fucking Skyscraper defense is hard, right? We can fucking win. Well, there's a lot of rounds that we can fucking win here. Um, if they go back to T, by the way, that was the exact low defense they used on us from Charlotte. They had nothing to protect, uh, yeah. to protect the mirrors if you did want to flip. If we still want to go house side over, I know we're lacking on info. I think we just need to sync up better on the drones. Like, we, we do have the drones on them. We just need to make sure, like, maybe we need a countdown. Three, two, one. Like, let's let's make sure that guy's stone is not going to just be stone. He's moving around cups. He's a trophy. Uh, cameraman's running around underneath the fucking mute. Um, yeah, let's just just be aware of that one. They're gonna fight us. They're not gonna back up because that setup sucks to back up on. Remember, we we played that. Yeah. Um. The engine is just that setup sucks. <laughs> just like that very simple. Um, from the side of men there, the coach of Dark Zero, it did seem a little bit less clear to me on what the exact problems were. It was a, a part of like let's like calm down the frustration, let's sync up, and let's use those drones better, and then maybe this, maybe that. It wasn't the whole lot of like, this is the problem. And I think it, it, it's a fair thing because what is the problem for DC, right? There's a lot of things that are kind of slipping away, opening devs, you know, they don't get the right map control. Maybe they don't have intel to work with, etc. It just does kind of seem like they're losing these rounds, but there is no super clear definitive reason for that, at least not from my perspective. 
And also, if you are a coach, this is the hard part. You have to give information to your teammates that they can work with, but you cannot play the game for them. You cannot tell them how to play the game. You're not gonna go in there and say, Bolo do this, or Nave do that. Can you know, Canadian lead this way? It's like, they know what to do. They know what has to be done. But I think the big point there is just to take a, a, a timer. 45 seconds, relax, reset, go back into it. Yes, it's hard, but you gotta problem solve it. And right off the rip, we see DC with a kind of different approach in terms of operator lineup, right? They're bringing Deimos, they're bringing Osa. So now they can kind of isolate people a bit more. Let's say they find Noodle downstairs of Solus, Deimos track, get Bolo in there, pew pew, go for the gunfights, maybe try and find that pick. At least now they have the tools if they want to. It's interesting that he referenced that it was exactly what Lowe's did to them. And I mean, yeah, it, you, it requires the whole team to know specifically what that was, because if you heard, there was very little specifics beyond that. Oh. Now, one of the first things that Mint said was, let's watch our frustration. How frustrated are you if your knave getting ran out on by Noodle just seconds in? Now there could be yet another from Noodle. Oh, my no. God, is he still alive? He'll have to swing and blind, he gets the kill on the Pambazoo. Still being watched and still firing away. He's at over half HP. DZ barely putting a no. dent onto him. It's spoiled to get that pick with Noodle playing down below. DZ falling apart in front of our very eyes. I think DC made the effort to full send there because when they lost Nave and lost the demos, the whole t like the entire strategy that they were building fell apart. And with that, they also get the round M80 with the first kill and the last. And it was Noodle to start it, and everyone came to try and help him, but he did not need any help. He got three kills in the round, and the people around him ended up folding instead. Now there's gotta be more frustration on the side of Dark Zero. That's your timeout. And now you have no parachute, you changed up your strategy, you got shut down again by Solis, and now what do you do? <laughs> you use your timeout, it doesn't work. Things actually look worse for you there. Yeah, it did. I, I mean, mean obviously round. frustration Five does seconds. set in at some point, and players just look off, but outside of NJR, DZ have just look like they are being outmanned and outgunned. Bolo had a couple good looks, but I mean, five and ten is the scoreline for Bolo. Most deaths on this team, but I mean, Bolo doesn't usually play sheltered minutes. He doesn't play a sheltered role. If there's anybody on this team that is bound to die in a round, it is probably going to be Bolo. It might be Pambazoo. Again, it really depends on how DZ goes about attacking this bomb site. And now. Downstairs, M80 will defend Kitchen and Barbecue, but a heavy extension up top as we come to expect. EZ, we're up 4-2. It's been four unanswered rounds from M80 to catapult them into a very, very good spot. And this game is incredibly winnable for M80. Yeah. I mean, it really is. It's been uh, it's been five rounds straight. It was the last attack around in the first four defense, so... If you're DC, it's like a solid, what, 25, 30 minutes ago since you won a round. Essentially, it's been a, it's been a hot second. It's not been now, quick, Nick. It's not been quick. That's, I think that's no. what you're trying to say here. <laughs> no, it, it, it's been, you know, it, most of these rounds, besides the last one, they go down to like the sub 10, sub 20 seconds. It really has been some long stretched out rounds where DC early are playing from behind and just slowly bleeding out, essentially. That has been their biggest issue. That first opening duel, they rarely win it, and they basically never get it for free. It always costs them a lot of time, a bunch of drones, or they get traded, essentially. So, M80, they played very aggressive last round. Look what they're doing now. They're playing Tuberau, Kaid, Mira, or Maya Warden. And oh. again, DC with similar struggles. They lo lose the opening duel. Wall doesn't get opened up correctly, and you don't have another half region to back this up. This is really terrible if you're DC. I can only imagine the frustration of our good friend Fresh as he watches this game. Would have just hit midnight. I, I mean, Europe's daylight savings time is a little different. Midnight, yeah. But it's very close to midnight there for him as that is a, a tremendous blunder. Cameraman dies down below. Two barrow. Two barrow. Newest operator. Well, second newest operator, I guess now technically Deimos is. Yes, he is. Things, things flying by. 
No ability to freeze that gadgetry, slow down the attackers. And I mean, DZ have been a slow team, but Ambazoo has something to say about that. Canadian taking damage. He sprints on in. The B-bomb site seems to be all his. But oh. Ambazoo dies from an angle he wasn't expecting. Citizen falters as well, but DZ managed to pull off a successful defuse plant. Point. Keeping a numbers advantage for his team. Now it's a 2v3 with Bolo and Nafe, the two newest additions, as the last two to save this matchup. M80 want all three of these points. Spoit getting shut down by Nafe inside a bathroom. Eno on the diffuser, they're counter disabling it. He needs to stop him, picked apart. It's all up to Nafe now with time still favoring M80. Noodle will hop on it. Nafe has to get in. Noodle at the halfway point, off he goes! Oh, no. no way, Noodle clutches out, and yes. it's time to get it done! A heroic individual effort, and Noodle will be the star of the show! M80 stun DZ! He had about a second left. He hits the wall bang, 180 flick to like win it. Gets back in the future like eight point something seconds. Heartbreaking loss of a round there for DC because Nate has such a strong position at post plan. But that round's not the problem if you're Dark Zero. It's all the rounds before that one. Immediate attack, they fell a little bit flat, but on defense, they showed us so many different styles of siege, and it's also why they won this matchup. DZ did not enter the day in the basement of the North America League, but the results of the very first match have now put them there. And boy, oh boy, they don't get a single point against M80. They were up 4-2. But when you ride the better side of Skyscraper, it's a lot harder to regain your footing when you tumble in that second half. M80 got the favorable side of Skyscraper, and they showed exactly why it is such a strong map for the defenders. M80 doesn't drop a single round when they move to defense. And that is obviously not an ideal spot for any of their opponents to be in, let alone Dark Zero, who still search for their first win in regulation. EZ suffer their second loss in regulation. One loss as well in overtime and a victory in OT means they're in the bottom three of the North America League. And that is quite the result. It is. It's very unexpected to be honest and also M80 won six rounds straight, by the way. And you know, when DC calls a timeout, the first thing the coach of Mint says, let's watch our frustration, right? There's a very clear sign that DC, they are struggling. They know they're not doing great. They gotta fix it for the, you know, play days to come. And obviously, there's work to be done. It doesn't get any easier. We still got plenty of matches to go, though. We'll be right back.
I'm not gonna lie, this might be the first time we've ever had to rely on caffeine science to determine who was gonna win this game. M80 go to Skyscraper for the second straight game. They take Dark Zero to it this time instead of Club, and they get the victory that they couldn't get against Luminosity. Jesse, are you are you drinking out of the Spoit Cup now? I am, Jacob, and I don't think I've got the same special sauce that Spoit had, but uh, I've got the next best thing, Bolo Fan Tears. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ. We didn't even highlight the fact that it was a Bolo versus Spoit game. We went the cameraman versus Canadian route, and I think we probably should have gone the Spoit route because uh, that game was crazy. It was a nuts one. I mean, uh, honestly, the, the attacks were still somewhat slow in my mind. I don't know if they had no, the same they, boost. Not in your mind. Some they, things they were, were slow. Yeah. They, they were, were a little slow. bit slow. But the defenses were good enough. They clutched up on a couple big rounds, and M80, they were the better team today. It reminded me similar to SI how teams were starting out. Defenses were absolutely amazing. Attacks were horrible, but the teams that could just find two or one win on attack would immediately convert that over into defense and then win out entirely, and M80 won six rounds in a row. Yeah. None of those attack rounds for Dark Zero went their way at all. They tried, nothing ended up working. There were a couple post plan opportunities, but even then it was still no dice. But it goes into the aggression that I was talking about that M80 was meeting DZ with on those attacks when that side swap. M80 was not letting up. They were fighting yep. DZ at every point possible. And this is a team that one knows how DZ plays, but this is also what I talked about in the early games. A lot of these teams are understanding how they need to counter play against DZ and are meeting them at the forefront. 100%. And when we got to that second half, when M80 moved to defense, I believe they got every single opening pick bar one. And usually when they're getting to these opening picks, like right here from Spoit, they're not just getting one. You jumped off they're seat. They're staying alive. They're finding multi-kills over and over again. Then they're getting out and going back to the bomb site. It was incredibly impressive how Spoit was doing that consistently. Noodle was doing it really well as well. Noodle probably the MVP of this game. I really do think that M80 turning it up on that second half uh, was massive. And fighting them in that early round, as you said, Gabe, was the most important part. But trying to fight against that, if you're Dark Zero, how do you predict when Citizen is just going to run around the map with a vector trying to find kills, when he hides behind a window, when he ducks back around a, like a, a door frame in some way? That's just not something that DZ, knowing how they play, can effectively counter very well. The biggest thing is just you sometimes just got to break away or allow someone to maybe do something a little different, come at a different entry point, or just work the map a little differently than what you might have down in the strat book, which is not to say that DZ doesn't do it, but they clearly aren't doing it as effectively that other teams are doing that. But there is a guy who we need to highlight because we talked about him earlier in the day, not having a great stage thus far, but Noodle was a post-plant god in this matchup on two specific occasions, but it just looked like from a statistical perspective from what he was doing in the server and his vibes on his camera, everything for Noodle was going great. Yeah, and I mean, Gabe, you even mentioned it before the segment, or before the match yeah, started, exactly. Noodle hasn't really been having the biggest impact. His KD has been relatively poor coming through from M80, so for him to come through and have two back-to-back -back post plant 1vx clutches is ridiculous for him in the early game he was playing really well when he needed to as well round number 10 stepping up there as we can see playing fantastic inside a kitchen working with his teammates working with some boy down to that bottom floor and it's the aggression that i'm talking about there i mean look at all three of them collapsing in on mm -hmm. dz here mm -hmm. and stopping out the front and now it's a 4v1 i mean yeah Ooh. noodle just getting another clutch to yeah. win the game this time i mean again these two, him, Noodle, and Citizen, if they can just find the tempo and continue on this trend, again, this is the M80 that I can see going to international that they're going to have far more success than the original roster had. You might got to ban that Solus against M80, man. The way that both he and the rest of the players were able to use that operator, just ridiculous. M80 at this point doing a good job to jump up the standings. It's not just Dark Zero, it's three points against Dark Zero. So at this stage, DZ, because of the Los victory, have now fallen below Los in the standings. And that is a really bad position for them to be. They have another game they have to play later today, and they're going to have to react to this loss and then immediately shift gears later. And then where well, I was going, it can be a double-edged sword. You can start out the first game not very strong, but that does now make you have to focus and prioritize all the mistakes that you made, or you carry that into the next game and then you fall flat on your face once again so eh, it's not great but it's great <laughs> for m80 certainly and I, I think you know at the start of the stage we we're kind of talking about for dark zero it's okay they've lost a couple of these opening games because at the end of the day all you got to do is make top six then you go to playoffs and all that matters is how you play in playoffs but as you said with Los jumping ahead of them we're starting to get to the point where like you're running out of these BO1s. You need to start finding wins if you're Dark Zero or else they're not going to make it to playoffs. Well, Los, Ma sorry, Los, wow. M80 got a big three points on the day. Los did too, but specifically for M80, let's get Spoit on the line and talk about this matchup. Dude, I just want to clarify real quick. You had Skyscraper against LG and it didn't go your way. 
And then you went to Skyscraper in this very particular case against DZ, and it worked way better. Talk to me about why repeating the same map over again was the play here. Um, I mean, I, to be honest, uh, last time I played Sky, there was a lot of uh, nerves uh, going on and stuff like that. Uh, our attacks were pretty bad as well. And uh, I mean, we just knew that our Sky was better. Um, and, you know, we fixed the mistakes today and it looked better. Uh, I wouldn't say this is like the final piece that we have, but it looked better today at least, so I'm happy. Yeah, Spoy, I wanted to touch on something uh, that we talked about the, the pregame. Um, it feels like the pacing for M80 has largely been good, but the last game on Skyscraper and sometimes some rounds in this game on Skyscraper as well, felt like the pacing was a little bit slow. Is that something that you guys are focused on? Is that something you guys are worried about? Or were there other issues that you kind of wanted to focus on compared to the last Skyscraper to this one? I mean, there's a lot of like factors going into it. So first of all, it is a game day. We're a new team. There's a lot of nerves. You know, you don't want to do the the wrong mistake here and there. So obviously, things are gonna be taken a little bit longer than they used to, uh, used, they should. Um, but you know, with time, I feel like we're gonna do good stuff for this team, and I'm just happy right now. So yeah. And Mike, oh. real, real quick, if I can do one more. The way you play on defense, instead of office, when you're extending over from tea room karaoke, that seems like a great spot for you. Consistently, you're popping off there. <laughs> what is it about that room that feels so good for you? I mean, it's just like the way I, I find the ones and I kind of like, I isolate the one once uh, right there. You know, I've always been an office team, and you know, I, used, I like to play there <laughs> since day one uh -huh, when uh, uh -huh. this guy uh, was reworked. I love that that spot behind the table. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember actually playing against my teammate Citizen, got an ace there in playoffs last year. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, that, that's my place right there. <laughs> I don't know, you had Jesse jumping for joy when you were swinging that balcony, killing those wow, two wow. guys. He jumped off the couch, it was L fun. Literally, yeah. he's like, he's getting the third. <laughs> then he didn't get the third, so he let it down a little bit. <laughs> but I guess my big question to you, so obviously the LG game didn't go the game that you guys wanted to. You guys, at least in my opinion, especially on the defenses, you guys looked far more confident in how you wanted to address DZ. Um, I mean, we, just, we basically knew the stuff that they would do. I mean, we had the, we've been bot reviewing and, you know, watching how they, you know, play the game and stuff. So it was just about making sure we have our own stuff uh, sorted to make sure we are playing the, the right contacts, we're running the, the right strats, even though I think I, I think me and Kino at one bomb said we were running the wrong strat completely. So I don't know how we won that <laughs> round, but, you know, we made it happen. Uh, just have to whip out the little FPL style there. For sure. But yeah. Just focus on yourself and then... I got I got one question, yeah. just because obviously you've been now the longest on the roster with Kino. How is it having Cameraman as the IGL with someone it's of just, that experience? Yeah, I mean, having Cameraman on the roster is, is great. He brings a lot of, you know, value and a lot of experience into the team. He knows what to do in certain situations. I mean, the guy has been... He's old. You can just time. say he's old. Yeah. <laughs> yeah he's, <laughs> I told you don't have to say it, but come on. Uh, no, but with age, experience comes, guys. So, you For know. Sure. I'll get there one day, hopefully. Totally uh, true. Hey, I'll tell but, you right uh, now, your aim yeah. slows down, but your brain, it grows. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Last question for you, dude. Uh, Jesse did a very scientific statistical analysis earlier of what you were drinking going into that game against the Sonics. Can you confirm whether this cup is the same cup that you were drinking out of uh, from just last the last week? Jesse, can you show the camera again? We had a, we had a clip of you drinking from oh. a bit of a red cup. <laughs> just wondering yeah, maybe yeah. what was in that. You don't have to be too uh. specific. Yeah, it was actually water with ice because uh, oh, I was I out of the I respect. I'm so tired of these players drinking energy drinks. Like, Spoy <laughs> knows what he's doing. Well, I guess that's H2O. Sure the electrolytes, you know? Absolutely. Okay, okay. Fair play. That's all he really needs, yeah. dude. Again, ice basically as cold as the ice in your veins. Spoy, again, congratulations on the dub. We'll see you tomorrow. Take care, bro. Thank you. So, what was it? One more thing. What? Oh, oh. Uh, oh. <laughs> oh, wait. Wait, wait, wait we didn't see it. We didn't see it. Oh. Get the sport charm, guys. Hey, hey, all right. We yeah. love that. We love <laughs> that. Yes, thank you. Congrats. I really like the idea of, yeah, one more thing, and he's gone. They, 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 they honestly should have just left it there. <laughs> should have just left it there. <laughs> that would have uh, been good. All right, that's a really, I mean, for M80, a slow, a slow DZ team, go back to Skyscraper two times in a row, prove that you can play Skyscraper over again. That's a pretty redemptive day overall for that team. Meanwhile, for DZ, you're in a really bad hole right now. Yeah, I mean, redemption's all around. I mean, M80 proving they can play Skyscraper, Gabe and myself finally starting to catch up in predictions a little bit. Yeah, what's the prediction percentage now? I don't, like, I don't really like, want to see it. I mean, yeah, I know it's It will be come. better. It will be better. I think you got back to 50%. I think you did. In any case, we're still looking for the redemption from Dark Zero, yeah. right? I mean, this has been a really rough start. I don't have the stats in front of me, but it feels like the worst start Dark Zero have had in many, many years. 
Uh, I don't know what the problems are if they're just fumbling in these late rounds. Sometimes they're not getting those opening picks, which we touched on. Um, but they've got to get it sorted because this is not a pace that they can continue to maintain and expect to do well in the North American League. Well, the big problem is they open up the day with a really devastating loss. They're going to have to close the day and hope that it doesn't end the exact same way. They will play Luminosity in game number five, but Luminosity have their own first game to play in game number three. So we'll come to that after the break.
Over the last few years, Oxygen Esports has usually managed to get off to hot starts during NAL stages. They've won all three of their first games to start this one. But today, they might meet their first real test, as Luminosity have suddenly sprung up into top four status and now will surely make a fierce bid to stay there. Welcome back to day five of the NAL. I'm Jacob, he's Laxing, he is Jesse, and this is an undefeated OXG team. Not the first time we've seen them do something at the very start of a stage, but they've never been able to successfully carry it through and LG are looking to be the real first speed bump in their road to playoffs. Well, I guess the important thing here for Oxygen compared to their most previous season, this is a drastic improvement for the team. So it's good to see this success coming out early. The season's not done yet. There's still a lot of games still to be played, but to still be coming out 3-0 and in the dominating fashion that they are, I mean, that's something to be proud about. Yeah, I mean, how often is it that a team goes 3-0 and and then loses to a team that's very it's never uh, happened. below them in the standings? It's never happened before. It hasn't happened in at least two hours. <laughs> so I'm sure that Oxygen are going to feel very confident coming in against Luminosity today. So far, the top-ranked overall team in the league against the team currently sitting in number fifth. But the other two stats to pay attention to, it's the second highest defensive win rate team against the best defensive win rate team. So whenever we're on those sides, those are going to be some tough nuts to crack. Well, it's who's going to find out and who's going to be the stronger attacker on this side. If we saw the last game, the attacking sides were not favored in any capacity. It came down to a defensive game entirely. And now you got the two best defending teams to be able to see who is still going to be the <laughs> best defending team. Yep. Yeah, and both these teams hitting over 70% on that defense right now. So they're really, really hitting those high numbers. You expect that will go down with more games played for both of them. But still, to be at, I think it's 75 and 71% respectively for Auction LG. They're feeling very, very good. LG on a pretty good streak right now they've won their last two their last one was that win over m80 on skyscraper just last week it was a huge comeback they were down 5-2 then hat explodes with something like 10 kills over three rounds to help drag luminosity back from the grave and get them a dub so a really really good way to start their stage yeah i mean lg this is the best way possible to start your stage compared to the last previous stage i mean this team i think what really puts that into perspective is there's four players on this team that have tons of experience whether that's in the t2 t2 three scene and then you bring hat on a player that had very high success when he first came on then had a then he fell a little short was out of the spotlight but then now coming back into this new roster of lg he's back in that spotlight and performing extremely well and even in that game that we saw the other day against m80 i mean the ace from him was insane I believe this may not be is this the ace clip i'm looking for where he's at this no, was not this specifically. He's got a double kill, but I think these are broadly the highlights. But this is still just showing all the players specifically yeah. just performing extremely well. I mean, Hat once again. Mm -hmm. I mean, now he's at 12. He was just at 10. He's at 12. He keeps going up. He's at 13. <laughs> I mean, Hat is the player, and the ace that he had was a beautifully displayed ace. I mean, granted, M80 played that pretty horribly. But it's still, it's, it shows the type of player that he can focus in on those 1v1s and single out targets and come out on top of those 1v1s. We talked to Eddie earlier about what sort of moves they made in the offseason and how they were looking to turn a team that's all really connected with one another out of lobby and in lobby into something beneficial. And look how, look how much better or on track they are with where they were last stage. Yeah, I mean, I think coming into this one, uh, it really shows that LG have been working a lot together as a team, especially like coming up with a lot of these plans. On defense especially, it feels like they always have this like really great idea of how they want to hold, how they want to make that uh, you know, anti-execute happen. Uh, we saw that on Clubhouse, we saw that on Skyscraper. I think on Attack, things have gotten a little bit scrappier. Sometimes things don't exactly go their way, and then they got to throw the plan out. And I think that late round kind of adaptation hasn't always been there for Luminosity. But I mean, there's a reason why they're the second best defensive team in the league right now. And uh, I think it really does come down to the preparation. Definitely. And what I also love about these guys being the rookies, the underdogs to the league. The young is, team. Yeah, they aren't scared to get aggressive on those defensive sites where some teams that might come into the league, you know, they'll play a little scared against some of these teams, but LG will get straight in your face. They don't care. They're showing you why they're in the pro league. They're showing you why they're here. They're showing you why they're an underdog and not to be slept on for that matter. And nobody did that better last week in that M80 game than Hat did. It started with his Mira ace and then just descended from there, but this specific moment was where M80 seemed like they broke. This guy's a monster. You uh, really can't underestimate him. <laughs> I mean, this is what I was talking about. Like, the individual skill from him here to be able to single out every single 1v1 here. And it, sure, it does come down to M80 playing this bad and not working together. But the fact that Hat can figure out from what direction each of these M80 players were coming from and be able to single that out and put that in a winning situation for him. I mean, it shows the skill and professionalism that Hat has as a player.
Dude, this last 1v1 uh, to complete the ace, I was like, oh, it's Spoit. Spoit doesn't lose this. And then I saw the flick that Hat <laughs> made. I was like, oh, my bad. Anybody loses that. Hat's ridiculous. So, but if it wasn't for that defensive performance, they probably wouldn't be as high defensively had it not been for how that half just slid their way. M80 didn't win a single attack round once that ace happened. So for LG, it's really good, but they need to prove today that it's not a matter of streakiness and they can keep that thing going into today. And you don't want to just rely on one person and Hat might have been that one person, yeah. but still, I mean, at the end of the day, it was a performance to, that's very worth noting. Yeah. Here's the problem. They're facing a currently undefeated OXG team who themselves have had some questions just concerning new team coming in, or new, new players coming in. How is everyone going to gel together? So far, the answer has been perfectly nine points over three games. So it could be argued just on paper, this team is doing everything exactly right. I mean, they blew me out of the water. I originally thought with them losing Fox, they were going to take a pretty big hit because that is a pretty big hit, but they have found the way that they wanted to play and to work in Diaz and Gomez and how to figure out how they want to play around that. And they're coming out the gates hot. They're 3-0. and So there's not really anything that I can critique and be like, oh, well, these guys don't know what they're doing. They know exactly what they're doing and they're still finding success. Yeah, I think for me, it's been the conversions from them, right? When they get an advantage on the side of auction, they've been so, so clean at making sure they follow that out through the rest of the round. They're not going to let aggressive plays catch them off guard. They're not going to throw those advantages away. They're really consistent at taking that lead in a round and making sure it turns into a round win. I think that comes down down to while they are a newer team and while they do have maybe new IGLs going back and forth with it, they have all a lot of experience playing together. Whether that's on M80 or on Oxygen, they're very used to each other as players. And so I think that is showing through in their gameplay. They have two players who are still in the top five ratings wise. One of them is Diaz. The other is newer, but we haven't had to talk about him very much, even though he has a lot of clippable moments. But what specifically do we need to highlight on him? I mean, I think for Newers, it's been the way that he's been able to make these moves on defense. A lot of these clips you're noticing are on Azami. He has two real favorite operators that he'll play. One of them is Azami, the other is right there, Warden. He loves to move around, use these little bits of cover to his advantage. They're great guns, of course, as well that he's able to utilize. Uh, again, I just think it comes down to Oxygen on these defensive sides, making sure that once they get that opening pick, once they're feeling confident in a round, they don't do dumb plays to throw it away. And I want to show these operator stats specifically. Azami, about a third of the rounds played, 7-2 and two KD. Warden, seven and three, Katie. Again, about the third of the round. All other operators, though, only four and three. And it's important to note that despite Elzami getting nerfed, despite her being a little bit weaker than in previous patches, it is the permaban of Luminosity, which means he's unlikely to be able to play that operator today. So how satisfied are we with the OXG changes right now? We'll take a look at what moves they made coming into this stage. Yes, they lose Fish. Yes, they lose Fox, but your assessment so far? I mean, I still think they're performing extremely well. Again, they have a 3-0. Yep. They did lose Fox, sure. But again, you have two players right now, specifically of Newers and Diaz, that are in the top five, both being third and fifth place. And then on top of that, it's two different play styles. You have Diaz playing a more supportive role, mm -hmm. still topping those charts. And then you have Newers on an aggressive role, taking those initial entries. So on both fronts of attack and defense, you have two players that are performing at the highest level and being in the top five rated players. But let's add a caveat to this, because nothing is perfect for Oxygen. The three teams they've beaten to get this undefeated streak are all teams that coming into this play day were bottom three in the league. Luminosity are on a bit of a streak at the minute, and then they have all of the remaining tough teams in the league still ahead of them right now. Yeah, I mean, obviously the schedule has been uh, very favorable to Oxygen at the start here, right? They've gotten three teams of the league who have been struggling. And I think especially with these like newer teams to play them earlier before they get all their things figured out, before they get all their ducks in a row can be quite advantageous. But I don't want to take it away from Oxygen. Obviously they played fantastic to succeed secure those wins, even though we may not value those teams that they've beaten as highly as teams like Sonics or Space Station. I, it's still a very strong performance, and I think you can see that regardless of the opponents they're playing. Map is Clubhouse, which is intriguing oh. because LG are have, this is now the third time that they're playing at this stage. They're one and one on it. So two and one or one and two? Ah. <laughs> so like, this comes down to me with the inexperience versus experiences. There's only so much you can do to change a map or change up a strat that it's like, you're really risking here of really exposing yourself or leaving yourself exposed because I don't really know how much LG is going to change here unless they're just going for straight counterplay and not really focusing more on themselves. But I mean, we literally heard it today when we talked to Bursa, right? Lowe's did just that. They changed up their clubhouse. They came in with an entirely new strategy and they beat Space Station because of it. So, I mean, I think it's doable. Does the streak end here for Oxygen, gentlemen, or does it continue? Predictions, ah. lax, go, <laughs> go. Yeah, I'm gonna go with Oxygen. I, I gotta go with Oxygen. Acting like you're still on the payroll, Jesse. Listen, it's already happened once before. 
but I don't think lightning strikes twice. I think auction closes out. We don't see another upset on Club. Oh, damn. Seriously? So yeah. now when now when when LG wins, the players can clip you and be like, look at what they said. I can't, I can't look at what they said. 40%. The, so. whole, the, the, the curse <laughs> is in effect at this point for Oxygen. If they don't win, then we know the reason why. Jacob, I'm one game behind Foxy. That percentage might look like a large gap, but it's one game, okay? I'm not, <laughs> I, technically I could make it up here, I guess. Auction went, uh, uh, Fox went Oxygen. But. I mean, it's true. The the percentage for Foxy did not go down very much by M80 taking the game against Dark Zero from earlier. So now everyone goes with the exact same pick and we'll see if they're all right or all wrong yet again. I love how these things work out. It's Pengu and Intero. Gentlemen, it's Clubhouse again. Are you guys excited or what? Always a good time getting to go to Germany and see the beautiful sights of Clubhouse. I don't think the analysts quite sell how close of a match this could potentially be. I mean, all three said that OXG would win. Yeah. LG is a team that has not been doing that poorly. They're actually doing quite well. They were in fourth place to start the day. So it's not like it's a, you know, OXG beating up a bunch of chumps, Nick. It's <laughs> two relatively good teams. I will say, though, that OXG have three wins all in regulation. That is probably what is giving them the nod to say OXG is going to win. And frankly, I also picked OXG to win. Yeah. Did you? Or do you think LG has a shot? I, I picked OXG as well. I, I think it's kind of like the lowest game earlier where there's always a chance. It depends on, I guess, what type of LG shows up today, but also, of course, which OXG version shows up because while they've played great so far, there's always one game that can go sideways, things don't go your way, the players aren't feeling it, whatever the case might be. I do think the Clubhouse is a pretty fair play for both of these two teams and how they match up. I think it's a pretty 50-50, if you will. Operator bans are playing out right now. We're not seeing anything too out of the norm. A lot of Munty bans today. It's respectable. It just kind of simplifies a lot of the rounds and how you can approach it on the attack inside. And there it is. Jesse spoke about it. Asami is LG's permanent ban, so Newer is probably not going to play that Operator. He was correct. It'll be removed from action. But OXG, if they've done any prep work, which of course they have, they'll expect this. I really don't think either team right now is going to go, oh my god, they banned that Operator? It's Ying, Munzi, Fenrir, Asami. This is, again, a very classic Clubhouse matchup. LG banned the Ying, Azami combo against Space Station, so they were accustomed to not playing with or against these operators. And then if you look at LG's matchup against Beast Coast, they banned the Azami yet again. Ying was banned against them. In their matchup against M80, Ying was off of the board, but LG wanted to ban the shield operator of Monty, mm. who OXG got rid of. So, all told, LG are very used to these four operator bans. Whether they're the culprits, whether they're the ones banning the Monty, whether they're the ones banning the Ying, this is a lineup that they obviously do not want to deal with, and OXG is reading into that. OXG is also getting rid of an operator that LG doesn't like dealing with. That's good news for Luminosity. I have to agree. I think the first round often kind of gives an idea of like what might happen in the matchup, you know, how are the teams feeling? One is what defensive strat will the defenders up for? You know, okay, it's clubhouse. Most teams go basement first. Sure, that's obvious. But what kind of basement are they gonna play? Are they gonna play a proactive roam like we see right now? The castle, the mute, the solace, the frost, where there's a lot of different tools being put down across the entirety of the map? Will they do the quote unquote old school SSG roam? It's about the nine information, playing Mute and Mousy, making the attackers un unsure whether there is a roamer or not. Or will you turtle by playing all five defenders literally on the base and bumps at itself, and there's basically no roamers at all. So LG, they're, they're showing that they're happy to swing, they're happy to go for gunfights, and they're making OXG problem solve at a very high level very early on. So let's see if OXG are warmed up and ready. They did not drone the Catwalk Frost Trap. I'm pretty sure Newers might get caught if he walks up. I'm a little bit sad that he doesn't. He's gonna go downstairs instead. Could be a funny moment there. But OXD, they spent the first minute joining the intro of the building and Gomez finds silence. So good start here for the attackers. Well, silence Rome is soulless. Ends up as so many soulless before him and so many soulless likely afterwards where oh. yeah, you're gonna get picked off early. Newers, by the way, now Frostmat? bleeding out. Dude, He's this is the first Frost mat. That is, that's something else to put a frost mat at the top of the rafters. It was, uh, 
It was misdroned earlier by OXG. They kind of jumped over it. And then, yeah, New Mercy pays the price, unfortunately. Not Unlucky. just damage that's done, but also the debuff. Newers will now be slower and will make noise and will be bleeding out as time goes on. For an operator like Ash, who's supposed to be <laughs> super fast. That. Look at that, the trail of blood behind him. Yeah, so he literally cannot sprint for like 60 seconds. And Newers is literally your classic like all aim Ash main. Uh, he's pretty smart these days, but he like he runs around, he seeks gunfights. This is a massive nerf to Newers in this round and it could actually be pretty... Uh, pretty damaging because who's gonna now lead the charge i mean sure you got gomez in the box you got yaka in the grim you got other players that can step up but nearest is normally that spirit for the team that won't be in playing this round dream taking some damage now as diaz marches himself oh. down the stairs but whether there's a camera or just some information from the sounds Diaz sees the nitro cell shoots it out of the air now long range fire burning not removed from eddie the bees are there as well now eddie's gone from that spot oxg Lose Dream to oh. Kicks Rose, shotgun. It's all up to Hat as the last remaining player from LG and Newer's quick peeks him and down he goes. LG unable to hang on to that defense. And what on earth is that cam from Newer's? <laughs> okay, hold, hold on a second here. Can bring we that up. backtrack? Can we bring up, uh, hold on a second. Can we bring up Newer's cam for a second? Here we go. Hold on. Waiting for that's it. Not that's not Newer's. That's, that's not Newer's. That's, that's Yawk. Ah, there, there it go. is. He's hiding from us. He's a shy guy. Mm -hmm. Damn. I mean, despite the frost map, despite being 20 HP very early on, Nero's got a 3k. Who would have thought? He just walked in 20 feet, bang, 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 bang. Simple as that. And when you're up against a team like LG, I think most people go, okay, LG, they're going to shoot back, they're going to fight. Like, that's what they're really good at. And I wouldn't disagree. But when you look at how that round played out, it's not LG that can shoot back. Oh, it's Oxygen. But it really comes down to sometimes just a single player. When Nurez first joined the NAL on OXG side, he was like top ranked basically, doing really well. And then he had like a weak season and then like a, like a period of time where he wasn't that kind of like same star player, you know, finger LMG kind of guy anymore. And I think some people are wondering like, is Nurez gonna bounce back and be that, that you know, be that guy again? And I feel like he's had a great start so far in this stage. Where he really looks like he's back in like more or less peak performance. And of course, with the new changes to the, the ADS speed, the scope changes to a lot of the operators, a lot of players are still figuring out like, okay, what are we going to do here? What's the playstyle going to be? And the players that get into that playstyle quickly and get, com get comfortable early, they will have a slight advantage. That might just be the case with Nurus because he has been looking solid so far in this stage. We're about to see some bandit tricking now. Love that. Maybe not. Maybe not with the Maverick cutting right. through the steel. And puts Eddie in a very precarious position. And yeah, he'll get out of there about as quickly as he can. Evacuate premises. Back towards cash, he will go. And it's open now. I... Did you... Hmm. Did you hear Rotero drone out and then suddenly it just goes to Yaga who's just in there? Or was that just my ears mistaking me? <laughs> Oh I didn't my. hear it, no. Oh, no, that's the jammer. <laughs> Come on, that's unfortunate. I, I mean, I would be miffed if I was in that position. It's genius. Mute is, an Mute is an excellent counter to Flores, as you see firsthand. And now Yago will only have one remaining Rotero drone, which will now be piloted out unless he manages to get them unstuck from that Mute jammer, and even then it won't be very effective. All of them are now gone. Yeah, I mean, it's burning a lot of time here. A lot of resources as well. I mean, I like this, you know, two players punching those castle barricades. You're going to speed up the process. It, it can take a while, but uh, slowly but surely, they'll be taken care of. Eddie, though, still banning trick and jacuzzi wall. That's going to be a pain point for the attackers because if you cannot clear out that particular castle barricade, this wall and jacuzzi might just not get opened up. The thing is, there's a Maverick available, so surely, there we go. Torch it. Get the band battery. Come on. There it is. Wall shall be opened up. Good little problem solving there by picking up Maverick and just kind of simplifying that process. You were right though about this timer though, Nick. You're under a minute to go. There's another line of defense too as Eddie sits in bathroom behind the mirror window on top of a mute jammer. You got a clear line of sight. Doesn't have access to a nitro cell though. So no explosive potential Ooh. to be had there. Gomez crosses the window. Hat was prepared and ready for it and he gets down. Gomez might be retrievable. 
is now Hat turns his sights towards construction. Final 30 seconds for OXG. Hicks Row dies to Newers. OXG at the windows. They need to walk on in. Newers taking no prisoners. <laughs> Dream the kill with that one, though. It's OXG are slaughtering Luminosity. LG just reduced to two final players, Eddie and Silent, to hold against the hordes. Nitrocell goes out, Yaga dies, Eddie falls, Silent last one. He swings over in a big round from Newers as OXG was getting the diffuser down but didn't need it in the end. Oh no, Newers is frozen now. We lost him. We lost Newers. Whenever a player has a pop-off moment, we just lose them. Spoy popped off, he's cam froze. Newer's popped off two rounds in a row, he's now gone as well. But again, it really has been the newer show on the entry. And there are so many rounds in the current meta of Siege where the opening kills are just that important. Yeah, you get the map control, great, but it's about the numbers advantage because when it comes down to that bombs that execute, it's just that much easier. We saw when Dream had to walk into the bombsite to plant, there's no enemies in his path. There was one player on the bombsite bomb chassis, Master Bedroom, Dream got that kill. And the rest were just killed by Newers. Dream walks in, C4 goes out, he sprints away, goes back to plant, Newers gets the final kill. So by getting those first one or two picks, you just buy so much space for your team. And again, you can now risk losing a gunfight. You can risk certain things going wrong. The only thing that didn't really go on OXD's side is that they didn't have a lot of time. They were forced into a position where they had to rely on gun skill and win out on 50-50 gunfights because they had 20 seconds left and that was really it. And normally on gym, that's very difficult. You got, you know, for example, frost mats on the windows, maybe a mirror window. It can be hard to breach jacuzzi. Oh, 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 Yuck, are you okay? He's gone. He's in the grave. Yog has been removed from the server. He's not even here anymore. Well, you know, it could be worse. It could be Newers that died. He's 6-0. You want that guy alive to find those kills in this round as well. And this might be another round where OHC just needs to rely on gun skill. They lose the Grim. That's like your power operator. That's going to help you attack the bad basement bomb site or maybe clear out a couple of roamers. That's now gone. I think OXG need to consider their options because when they see the active roaming presence inside of stock, bar, master bedroom, they might just say, guys, hit the site, a lot of roamers. If we kill one or two guys in the site itself, we can take the entire, you know, control and go for a plank. And I like this play for Newers. Playing off pace, sneaking down blue. If he finds this pick, that opens things up, but he's gonna fade away instead. Not gonna go for side rush, but maybe this will force LG to make a movement and rotate back to site and give up the room instead. That could be the angle. A phenomenal start from Newers as well. Seven kills, not a single death to his name. He's not the only player on OXG yet to die. Gomez and Diaz have survived every round so far. There's only been two rounds, so not a huge sample size, but still really goes to show you how Luminosity has struggled to even get picks to try and stay competitive. Makes me look a little bit foolish when I'd said, you know, all LG is still a top four team. This one could be <laughs> potentially close. Not the first two rounds, that's for sure. Well, you're right, but also a, a lot can separate, you know, top four from top two. It, it's a small gap. It's it's a two, you know, placement difference, but the skill level is very, very large in both EU North America and Brazil. You know, we saw, for example, WCNM, the current Fury roster, back when they were winning majors invitationals, it's like, yeah, they're like top one or two. In Liquid, they're like top three or four. There's quite the gap, even in those small spots. OXG now looking mighty fine. They found those kills that we spoke about. LG fell back to side with the remaining players, and they still have a minute to go. If Gomez finds the vertical kill here as well onto Silent, that could really seal the deal. Then they open up the hatch, last Hypers Canister, Orx Cowers here from Diaz, and again, OXG are progressing through the round, always proactively doing something. They were just sitting and waiting. It's a very active round of C tier for them. Gomez fishing for a kill now on a Moto Door. As LG's three remaining players look to survive the final 30 seconds of this round, and Gomez will now drop. The fire will linger in front of him. Glove had overlooked just how long those flames will last from okay. the bio canisters. Down goes Kicks Row to Diaz, who has another not too far removed. Silent dies, and it's Eddie playing on the commonly known pulse spot. As he's compelled into action to look over towards Church. There's pings at some of these OXG members, but Eddie needs to find them first. He will sprint over, making a ton of noise in the process. Newers dies for the first time. How many more can Eddie get? None. Gomez says that's enough. Junior Diffuser went down, and it's three in a row as OXG are undefeated so far in this match. 
Oh man, this is like just a classic. Like, what do you do if you're LG? Strategically, great start to the round. They get the first pick. They got the roaming presence, but then they lose a side player, which forces rotations. And I, I yeah, let's um, listen. Let's go uh, cash here. Uh, bring the mirror, like we talked about with the impact tricking stuff. Um, when we go back, go back to gym after this as well. So let's go gym. We're gonna run the mute trap. We just have to fight them with our boys. We're just gonna have to fight them. Um, George, just again, just be worried about like your your red walk up. You just pretty much have to fight that to the death. Um, and put more pressure from below as well on that uh, bomb side as well, because they're gonna probably bring a buck, try to buck us out of cash. So make sure we put pressure from below as well. Um, now, when we go back to basement the third time around, look, let's run the two two one, but give up the CC walls, right? Let's just let's fall back through main stairs, because look, they're not putting pressure strip side at all, right? So they're gonna allow us to uh, fall back in the site, but let's uh, kind of do it more so of like a, a kind of like a bunker defensive setup, and bring a mute, like a mute for the gen. Uh, players so we don't get like grimmed out and stuff like that and reinforce this single blue wall as well let's do it more of like a fall off in the site but like still show a 2 2 one but let's fall off uh through main stairs and then we should be able to play back in the site safely immediate thoughts okay i mean i didn't hear most of that i gotta be honest i think i lagged out for a second so i want to hear your thoughts because i didn't hear most of it i mean it was it was very specific to this bomb site in particular right and one thing that we talk about when we when we speculate on timeouts is what is the main focus that coaches will take you through? Whether it be, you know, Mint in the previous matchup that we heard was mostly to settle down the nerves of Dark Zero, but additionally, it was to just give an overall strategy about what he saw. The Luminosity's focus was on how to tackle this very next defense. Okay. So, I mean, I, I appreciate it, but I mean, if if you're calling a timeout and it's only for a single round, and that's your your hyper focus is on one round and one round alone, yeah, there is a part of me that wonders if that's the most value that you can get from that timeout. Now, maybe it's that Luminosity doesn't really have a lot of other struggles, and they're just losing close gunfights, and they think that some strategic elements, and maybe the motivation of winning a round is all it takes. That's a question I can't answer, and I don't think you can either because we're not in their heads. Yeah. Either way, from what we've heard of the three timeouts that we have, uh, we've had, or the four timeouts, rather, that we've listened to so far today, is that there's a different approach from all of these teams, and it's quite enjoyable, and it's good for the listeners as well, as they can hear that sometimes you're not just focused on one thing. Sometimes coaches have a lot to address. Yeah, and it's one of those, like, you get one timeout, you have 45 seconds, and you gotta make a... Get the most value, the most bang for your buck. And yeah, sometimes it's an overall issue. Sometimes it's like stop tilting, you know, frustration. Sometimes it's like maybe for LG, just get this round. Just get this one victory. Get back into it mentally. Eddie gets that opening pick, shuts down Diaz. That's a great start. But it's where the worst operator could have been taken down. It's the Thermite. So Grim is up still. Kevitar is alive as well. OXG, they still got the tools they need to clear out this round. The big question mark for me is, are they going to go for this Garrus attack? They have no Master Patron presence. They're looking for the roamers. They got the injured drones. And look at that! Solus tries to run away. It's a freebie for Yogg. A great play there. Simple drone. Gives the info, he swings, now back to 4v4. Eyes on Garage. Now we gotta look at Yogg and Dream here. The grim Kavitar combination. What will Silent do on the Omai? Jump over, go for a kill, stay in the corner and bring him down to the fire. That's the big question. And oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. Silent 0 oh and 4 to start this match as Dream very easily reads into that. Not before Yogg has been picked off too, though, and that's your Capital. You mentioned that losing the Thermite was not a deal breaker, but slowly as you bleed this utility, OXG's shot at winning the round continues to decrease. But no Solus, no Wamai, now got Rafters control. Not all hope is lost for OXG. In fact, they might be in a pretty nice spot. Oh, what? <laughs> yep. Down goes Hat to Newers. I, how do you win when Newers is hitting shots like this? You don't. Wi-Fi on the jump out. Looking for something as the Diffuser goes down, but Wi-Fi will be marked this whole time. Newers eliminating Eddie, and there you go. The timeout does not work. There were some issues there for OXG, but they overcome them in triumphant fashion, and they are up 4 nothing. This is brutal. So, earlier today, I made the point that I think good attacking teams on Clubhouse can just get, like, you know, 4-2, 5-1 halves. I'm not sure I want to go the distance and say OXG are a phenomenal attacking, you know, Clubhouse team. I think it's a mixture of LG struggling a little bit here, 
And then again, as you keep saying, Nurus is just absolutely on the heater right now, winning every single gunfight. The one time he died was in a 4v1 post plant looking the wrong direction. This man doesn't lose gunfights. So I don't want to attribute this and say, oh, these attacks are flawless. They're not. But they certainly are doing what needs to be done. And their problem solving skills, when they keep losing that early man advantage, or at least, you know, they lose that early man that's crucial to them, it, they, they have it figured out. Like, they're so decisive. Last round, lose Thermite, as I mentioned. Not a big deal. Wall was open. They can live with that. What do they do? Hunt the Roamer, even the back, Solus off the board, 4v4, still got Power Operators. And again, they don't waste any seconds. Often we see teams, previous times with DC, for example, they sit still for a lot of the attacker rounds. It's Skyscraper. It's a different map. Not a fair comparison, but like, they're not always advancing throughout the map. OHG are always being proactive, always advancing forward with purpose and intent. It's another spawn peak from Luminosity. I... Far more than we tend to see at this level of play, at least in one particular match. And part of me has to wonder that when you go for early spawn peaks with any level of frequency, it's because either you're looking to break your opponent's spirits or because you rely partially on Getting that early pick to win yourselves the rounds. Now, at this point, Luminosity should be throwing everything plus the kitchen sink at the wall <laughs> as winning a round has eluded them up to this point. Again, OXG, several players with only a single death. The only player on OXG with more than one death through four rounds is Yaga. This has been terribly one-sided. Because of that, you've got both Silent and Wi-Fi still searching for their verse kills. And this first half is going to be over pretty quickly. You need to find them or you are just not providing anywhere near the benefit to your team as you could be. Absolutely right. OHG though, they haven't found the other kill, nor have they lost that member either. This is more like utility-oriented setup. I like this approach from LG. They're like, I don't want to say hiding. They're playing behind shields, playing behind reinforcements. Util, <laughs> Jaga sidesteps it, Diaz goes down instead, Wi-Fi gets a second. This is LG's potential to get their first round. And with those two picks, immediate fall back to back to bomb side. play the numbers, play that 5v3, and secure this dub. It cannot fall away now. That would be doomsday scenario. Uh, this is the best start that Luminosity, Luminosity has had. Luminosity. That could be quite a name. They're not nasty right now, but if they They're ever were... They're not Luminosity. That's absolutely correct at the moment. <laughs> this could be a Luminosity round. Oh, boy. Funny, they find these last players from OXG who've now discovered that construction is wide open for the taking, but Wi-Fi lurks in the shadows. There goes Hat. Luminosity's first loss so far. OXG desperate to keep this close. I think oh, they know. Come onto the shoulders of Wi-Fi. He doesn't have the shotgun followed up, but he wins the duel. Three kills to his name. That's all that they will get from Wi-Fi. Look at how far back Luminosity is, Nick. They want to engage here. Optiaga, who finds a goo mine inside of logistics. And surely LG knows where this last player is. Luminosity have allowed OXG to win these first four rounds. You snatch this one away. Yaga will just keep pre-firing, but it's very limited info. Excellent patience from Luminosity as Yaga looks for a pick, and they will collapse on him at the right time. Silent, getting onto the board, and Luminosity finally taking a round. Finally, yeah. Uh, it took a while, though, and again, it, it comes down to that like 3v1 crossfires. In the end, that looked very convincing, but there was a small point in time where I was thinking they might actually lose this, and that was when... Two OXG members were pushing towards office and they had the perfect read that the player was indeed tucked in the corner. If that gunfight goes in fair for OXG, it's a 3v3. It's totally winnable. But that early round, oh, Wi-Fi, that's disgusting. This right here. If Gomez gets the kill, I could see that going in favor of Oxygen because they have office control, they have connector control, and they have Dream on the bombs at windows, kind of locking those rotations on the side itself, cutting the map in half, essentially. But... LG, they prevail. They finally win some gunfights. Wi-Fi had a big moment. The C4 into the swing, getting that 2K, beating Newers, by the way, in a gunfight. It's the first time that's happened so far. He's 9-2. and two. The other death, as I mentioned earlier, was when it was a 4v1, po a 3v1 post plan with him looking the wrong way, so that doesn't really count in my book, at least. LG, I will say one thing. They keep kind of doing the same thing here on basement. Saxon Finna did an opening round. So the only thing I worry about them is that 
If they repeat the same kind of positions and utility pieces and OHT they've seen it before, they should have a pretty good idea how to counter it. Now, teams can of course run the same strat back to back if they want to, especially if they think that small things went the wrong way. If New York is just picking up three or four kills every single round, it's what you deem is the issue for you lost, of course you can play the same bomb side. But we also have to see LG play in better player positions where newers cannot just find three kills single-handedly. You gotta try and trade out your bodies if you're luminosity. So if newers kills one of your players, you kill newers back one for one trade. Very worth it for defense. So that's what we gotta see. LG play close together. It's not long ago that there were allegations of newers just being a fraud because he only played Finca. There was talk of him being a Finca crutch, but hmm. it's been nice to see uh, not a renaissance of Newers, but that he's been as dominant as he has been. I mean, hey, like you said, a beautiful sight. Ash ACOG, a lot of these players yep. that are used to these fast operators to do serious damage, to get in quickly, it is nice to see them back. And Newers is showing exactly what you can do. He's taking no prisoners. Nine kills through five rounds, almost two kills per round is something that is very rare at this level of play. Let's see if he can maintain it, though, because it's not going to be as easy for him to do that on defense, especially if Luminosity can track him down, hunt him with drones, and finish him quickly, assuming, of course, that Newers will be roaming. On this map, not always a certainty that you do want to roam. As you see right now from this defensive luminosity, they are all tucked into the bomb site quite nicely. There's some players a little bit removed, like in Dirt Tunnel. But there you go. By and large, all within striking distance of the bomb site, not any extensive roam from LG. No, you're correct. They did early on, but fell back relatively early. The pop two glorified canisters as well because they ripped down those barricades. So the question now is. Well, OG have enough time. They have about a minute and five seconds when Box started doing the verticality. They gotta overcome the Kai Claws. That's where Dream on Thatcher comes into play. They have Diaz as the only real hot breacher with Yogg and that secondary can openers in the Grim. So they can open everything up. But again, time, 30 seconds. They just now start joining dirt. That's where Solus is playing. 30 seconds. They actually catch the time and you see Solus running away. If Diaz, yeah, he will go for this. Just flying dirt, they know it's safe. Wait for these seconds of position, then go for execute. Oh, oh, OXG! Don't miss. Exploding this round and what? winning flawlessly, excuse me. It's a 4k from Gomez. You barely got to finish your sentence there before OXG determined that the round was over in the first half as well. All done. 5-1 the scoreline for Oxygen. And they do it on attack. I was thinking, okay, now you're going to go to Diaz into Dirt Tunnel, wait like five or so seconds, like get, let him actually get in the building, and then you go for Execute. But literally, as he enters Dirt, I see Gomez one kill, two kill, three kill. Like, okay. S Gomez, I guess, just dropped the kitchen hatch and went on a killing spree on the bomb side and just completely cleaned up. So I, I don't want to say it was like a mistimed Execute because it certainly worked. But again, the firepower on this OXG roster, it's just, it's so strong. And it's, the, if you go to Europe, you look at like the current BDS roster, it's the same story there. And they are ripping you apart because you have five players off, on both BDS and here on OXG that can just always show up. Even Dream, who's a support player here, or BDS support player in BDS, they too can just have pop-off rounds, they can hit clutches, but they're also a stable support player. The drone work from OXG, we see it every single round. Someone's driving a drone, and then you got what? Newers behind, just chasing for kills. And they're so quick to the punches. Now we see the side swap though. 5 one half for OXG, well done to you. Big clappies, but... The question is, can you also hold your ground on defense? Right now, actually, they're not sure much of a roaming presence, which is very surprising given how aggressive they were in attack and how confident they were in their gunfighting skills. They're actually saying to LG, hey, we're happy to fight you on the bomb site, like 5v5 style execution, and LG will do that. We gotta drone the entire building, gotta fake out of this aroma. Nurus and Solis had a roaming presence, killed the drone, fell back. Being chased here by Silent, 50-50 gunfight, but it's Nurus. It's never really a true 50-50. He always seems to have a slight advantage. And again, opening kill goes in favor of OXG, thanks to that. 
hell of a start for OXG. And uh, yep. I, again, I just got to ask the question, you know, what do you, when, when you've got a team playing like this and you've got these players playing at this level, what can you even possibly do, right? Hat, who has looked sensational before on, against tough opponents, one and six. Six row, two and five, silent. Just got his first kill a couple rounds ago. Wi-Fi, three kills, all three of them coming in the same round. Is it is it a strategic issue right now for Luminosity, or is it just gunplay? Because it seems like every <laughs> time there's a straight-up gunfight, OXG wins. I honestly think that LG, Silence in particular, shouldn't have chased the kill into Newers. It's like, is it worth if you if you kill the Solace versus you losing the Ash? No, it's not really worth it. Killing Solus is a slight advantage. You play five versus four, but losing Ash is like pretty much all your self-destruction and you now have one less player for the execute. So the risk versus reward is not really there for LG. They see a guy, they chase a guy, they die to that guy. Now they play four versus five, bombs that execute with only Grim, no Capital, for example. And we see that AK's position from the Kitchen Edge earlier being shot towards DS. He's in a power spot, shield towards blue door, can watch the hatch drop, and LG, because of that, they're rotating elsewhere. They're gonna try and breach church with the secondary can opener. It's not ideal, impact goes out, it gets denied. They have no real plan here, it looks like. They're scrambling to get this together. Nah, just holding a right angle from inside of Moto. As LG droned out blue. Gomez taking an awful lot of damage. Somebody managed to spot him. Kicks Rose at the bottom of the main stairs. Eddie now drops as well. Luminosity walking into church, but it's not a hope. It's not a prayer at the moment. But OXG does believe in miracles. They lose two. Gomez hurt as well. OXG will need that miracle to win this round. Eddie getting the diffuser down, and well, it's almost as if the gods themselves have helped OXG, but Eddie believes as well, albeit a bit misplaced. OXG have no problem getting the final kill and hopping on the kit to go up. 6-1. <laughs> it's been such a fast game. Like, every single round, it's like you blink and it's over. It's just that so many kills happening either very early or all happening at the same time later in the round. And it really doesn't come down to executes in the typical sense, where we see like smokes and flashbangs and like cutting off lines of sight. It is a 3-2-1, go in, guns blazing, who's gonna come out on top? And LG looked like they might have had a chance in that round, but again, they were playing with one man less because Silent died early in the Ash, and they didn't get all the walls opened up to apply enough pressure onto the defensive side of Oxygen. They had to watch what? Blue, the door into church, so motor door, and then kitchen hatch. That, that's it. That's like three angles. There's not a whole lot of pressure. When OXG attack basement, they're trying to apply pressure, you know, dirt tunnel, kitchen hatch, motor door, blue, blue hatch. And they, again, they had five players, or they had even numbers, or they had, you know, more than the opponent. LG goes to CCTV, they got on timeout, and they also cannot really win a round so far in defense. Granted, it was their first attempt, but still, or sorry, attack rather. But uh, it only gets tougher from here. When you, when you have, like, these rounds going the way that they are in terms of gunfights, you're not going to have the most confidence if you're LG. And if you're OXG, you're gonna, you're gonna, you feel on top of the world. You can go for any gunfight. You're always going to win. You have, like, all the options no, here. Like, no, 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 no. Not the no. door-prone spawn peak, dog. Okay, so worm. This is rever the revenge. You got spawn uh, peak back in the day. Oh. There's a worm boy here. Toes? I say shoot the toes one time and fade away. You know, it's so fun. Just tickle the toes. Oh. No? Waiting for the repel instead? I mean, Yaga is getting a Ooh, fair amount of information here. No, seemingly missing an opportunity on that kill, and we can't sit there forever as Yaga decides whether to shoot away at the ankles of Silent. P90 at that distance would do very limited damage He's still to there. Silent. So... <laughs> he hasn't moved. He's still looking for the kill. Oh, injure? Has he found it? That oh, wasn't him. Wi-Fi has been dropped. He's at the open breach at the bottom of Garage, which will put Silent into a position where now he has to go retrieve his teammate. Oh. Can't get there in time. A nice pick on to Gomez, though, but not before Gomez finished off Wi-Fi. I like that trade. You do not want a Capital to be on the board for this yeah. execute. LG will have to do it without the smokes and without the fire. 
Yeah, it, uh, I think it's worthy as well. The only thing I didn't like about it is that that was the catwalk player. So now catwalk is surrendered in a one for one trade. In a perfect world, you know, mirror stays on catwalk, someone else finishes the kill. That's the best case scenario. This is second best. Again, 4v4, favorite to be by defense. You have Evil Ass and the Maestro. You have 1c4, bunch of impacts, but Hap finally lands a shot, takes down Newers. He wins that gunfight, that's for sure. Oh. Oh, oh my. That's a struggle. Dreams of Maestro main, by the way. He knows all the tricks. Looking straight up, they cannot deal with this Evil Eye. Again, Intel there is for OXG. But plant it now and unlimited. C4 is now gone because Newest died. They have three impact grenades and a solace, but LG has man advantage. <laughs> this is That's brutal. I know you're you're gonna get clowned on social media for that. And Certainly. i that's obviously a frustrating one. Kicks row down below, giving Luminosity the advantage for now. Eddie getting the diffuser down, only two remain for OXG. They are pinned down, they are trapped. Into the post plant now, we will go. Diaz will need to clutch. Inside a cash. LG has taken their lumps. All four players very low. A single bullet will kill pretty much everybody. Maybe only the Ash would survive. He is worried about getting out of the doors. Not even going to get there. LG, their first successful attack. They are still very much in this. But it's a long road to walk before they can get back to the spot that they currently see OXG at. Yeah, this is a classic scenario of one thing goes wrong, one clutch happens for OXG, and it's all over. I mean, had landed a phenomenal shot, which took down the single C4 in defense. That's a big factor in that round. Solus lost the gunfight downstairs. That was a factor for Plant and I. And the Evil Eye was two saps away, by the way. Away, by the way? That's, that's so bad. It was two saps away from taking down Eddie, who was getting that diffuser down. So... Very, very, very small details not going the way of OXG is what makes o uh, LG able to plant with all players on a single point of health. So again, so many small things could be different and L LG will just lose out 7-1. But they will live it all around. They will fight it out. They'll gain that valuable experience. When you have someone like Hat pop off in these games, getting a bunch of kills, making runs easy previously for LG, and now you're up against a team that really shoots back, you're learning valuable lessons that Okay, we need to have other things to rely upon. We need to be better as a team. We need to have our fundamentals, our basics, our problem solving, our strategies in order, because you're not always gonna have the easy road of simply being the better players. You're gonna have to struggle sometimes. Every team has to go through it. When you play the best teams in the league, or the best team in the league of OHD basically right now, you're gonna learn a thing or two about the basics because they got that figured out, that's for sure. You got a lot of favorable bomb sites if you're OXG to go back to as well. So, yeah, you might lose cash CCTV, but in one round you can go back to that church bomb site down below and find yourself in a favorable position. Even now, as you see, this defense upstairs. It's possible that OXG is able to win it. Even if it's not the same bomb site as before. Not terrible for the attackers. Dream goes for the swing to try and stop that hard breach. It's read wet very well by Silent. He cannot secure the kill. I'm gonna be keeping my eyes on Eddie's Amaru as to where that operator is gonna fly in. It's a shotgun combined with the SMG 11, so Eddie is likely gonna go through a window and try for a pick or two early, depending on where OXG is. Or maybe Eddie with diffuser in hand is gonna swing in, go for the plant as quickly as possible and oh. there you go yeah that's what's gonna, okay. gonna be eddie goes right up and will begin the plant the fire the fire inside of the fire wait hold on wait no what oh my that was a hat's fire arrow to do all that damage yaga gets both the kills not just on eddie but hat as well grim will play the tight angle but yaga is still in this position still able to receive them LG trip up, but hold on a second here. They storm in. Now Yaga being watched. Silent inside a bathroom. Two quick picks. Dream dead, but will immediately go onto those Maestro cams. Goodbye to Gomez. Newer's retaking. He was down below. They've got tons of pings. Picks row dead. Newer's knows there's one not too far off. Do you play for the post plant? Newer's and Diaz. Last remaining one nitro cell between the two of them. 
Diaz not on site, neither with Newers. Newers was down below. Diaz inside of construction. Is that Maestro Cam still up? Is it feeding information to OXG? Oh, yeah. It's called into action. Silent with Diffuser down. Stops for a second. Now it's Diaz. Just wasting time. Newers picked apart from the window. Diaz will need to clutch out. He vaults on up very narrowly, missing out. Diaz getting the pick. Now Wi-Fi needs to run on in. Diaz escaping the flash. But LG wins it at the last second. They are starting to put together an impressive run, and the two rounds are closing the gap against OXG. Oh, boy. Oh boy, that entire round is just like a roller coaster of emotions. So I, I assume the idea there was to armor up the hash, smoke off both the rotations from Master Bedroom to Gym, and then fire off those rotates too. But the fire hit the default plan spot, forced Aro to run to a bad spot, that's an impact grenade. Yawk one taps a player onto the window. You're thinking to yourself, okay, OHT they win off a big misplay from Luminosity. But you'd be wrong to think that. Because somehow, someway, they bring it back. Silent walks to Jacuzzi Breach, into bathroom, picks up two massive kills. It's stream with a single point of HP on Maestro, but those active Maestro cams can only accept the players. That's, of course, vital. And he shuts down Yogg playing that key position in the middle of Master Bedroom. And then they gain that side control. OHG, they had one thing they could change in that round, but it's a stylistic choice. Either you send the Tuberu downstairs with the C4 to try and deny the plant, or you stack up together on the bomb side as they did. They played out the 2v2, nearest side from Wi Fi on that gym window. It came in 1v2. We saw the outcome of that round. Nail biter of round, however, coming all the way down to the wire. And again, if one small detail goes in the other direction, OHT coulda woulda shoot the round. Coulda woulda shoot a won the round, brother. Lures almost gets baited here, chasing a drone, shot through the main stairs window. But again, he escapes with his health somewhat intact. He's still looking for more drones to deny here on the Solace. It's kind of like the key aspect here. You want to find the drones, shut them down, deny intel, and just again, try and buy some time by slowing down the attackers. Last time LG attacked this bomb site, they were 4v5. They lost the Ash early. This time, they're going to try and make it to the bomb site with all five attackers upright. So, I missed this. Okay. Jesse J. Chick sent me this piece of information at the very beginning of the gym bedroom attack and said, despite playing Clubhouse twice already, LG have never successfully attacked gym bedroom. They are 0-3. Oh. Well, I should have probably read that before LG just won gym bedroom. Thank you still, though, to the desk for that. Now, as we said during that gym bedroom defense from OXG, they have other bomb sites they can go to that... It might be successful on. Yeah, you don't just need to rely on this bottom floor bomb site that OXG were formidable on the very first defense. But the good news is that OXG gets to go here at least once more. Even if they lose it, they can go here again. After this, every bomb site will be open if they lose it. Every bomb site is actually open at the moment. So LG <laughs> has a lot of work to do to determine where they're going to attack. But the good news is you've got attacker repick. So no matter where OXG goes, LG can be prepared for that. Damn. Some good value here. Those summers doing work in the church wall. They get again. Now they get side pressure. They have hatch pressure. They have vertical pressure. But they lose that fifth player again. Silent goes down. Kicks Sarah. One HP to his name on Thatcher as well. Now all of a sudden, LG went from a good looking round to a very poor one at that. They gotta execute. They got the green bees on Wi Fi. Hat finds the kill. There's still life for them in this round. Especially since Gomez has looked. Very good so far through this match. And Newers has cooled off too. And it's something that I said, this is an attacker-sided clubhouse at this point. Oh, oh OXG are dying. Had a triple kill to avenge himself after that misplaced fire error on the previous rounds. Now it's Dream to clutch out. And he's been able to do this before, but the timer will be his adversary. Smokes to go over towards Moto, but Eddie is ready for it. And LG fired up, ready to win. That's a timeout from OXG. Come next. It might be the like angle, actually. Calm things down, get a little bit reset, and just like close out right now, right here. But also, it gives LG the chance to also talk strategy. The risk that you got to be ready to one clean to take, round here. Take it. I think we're overcomplicating it and we're forgetting some of the util, right? So we just need to reset, force these guys to execute, identify who's stopping the plant, 
And if we don't have something, use your teammates to, to, to back each other up. We just need one clean round. Like they're not doing anything crazy. They're playing default siege. They're primarily going uh, church side because they can't get dirt control. So they can't do a dirt blue. So they have to go church. So our focus utility wise needs to be stopping the church plant. I'll ban I'll ban it to church. All right. Too. So so other than that, so everything else from, is clean. If you okay, I'll do I'll do secret. Just let me, okay, let yeah, me play two. Yeah, we're gonna waste time on the realm, then we can just do it. Listen, yeah, we're gonna guys, do this off realm. You guys are playing great. It's really just coming yeah. down to the trades, so we're good. I'm going. I'm Jordan. I'm dropping the smoke here, so they're gonna be able to get dirt. Can we drop two walls upstairs and get the get dirt so I can cage trick it? Is that possible, guys? Uh, we can get drop the tub balls, yeah. That's okay, let's drop some balls. And I, I gotta say, I really like that. That, that again, like high level problem solving in a very efficient technical timeout. I feel like that was longer than the average wow. like timeout. So much was said with a lot of value, both from the coaching standpoint and the player standpoint. Where it's about okay, guys, their focus is this. We need to counter. Classic counterplay. They open up the lineup. And I, I think it's a really good read because last round, the only denial they had for the church wall was impact grenades. But the one person, I forgot who it was, who had impact, impact spare in pocket, wasn't in a position to use those impacts on the church wall. So a big miss in that previous one. Now they have Kai Tuberau. They can really slow things down, stalled out. And we heard at the very end there, they went to roam early to you know, stall for time to then further enable the wall deny later on in the round because the lower you're on the clock, the higher value Tuber out gets, the higher value the Kai clocks gets because they're hard to deal with. Then Dream also asks for help. Hey, can we spare two walls somewhere? I want to reinforce certain Kai trick. Another adaptation because you lose the smoke. It's really good stuff here from OXG. And if that's the kind of insight they have as players, adapting on the fly, then you know, the feeling in the server, feeling out your opponent, that might be the reason why they're doing so well. Also just nice to hear Redeemer's voice again. I, you know, I have very fond memories of him as a player all the way back on his bittersweet days and was actually one of the first players I ever casted in a professional capacity, so. Mm. He's a staple of that SSG roster for so long. He's been with OXG longer now, if my math is correct, and well, I still think of him on SSG. What? What, what is Dream doing? He's better. That's another. If he'd gotten away with this, I would have lost my mind. Silent gets ever closer to clearing out the fringes of this bomb site. OXG had such a heavy roam presence. They are all now being recalled to the bomb site, Nick, because Diaz is dead. LG have read into this defense of oxygen perfectly. And suddenly, OXG are the ones fighting from behind. Gomez will need to clutch out in a 1v4 as Newers was dropped, finished off. Diaz dropped earlier, dying, and Gomez can't do anything. Luminosity pushing us to a near tie. They are one round away from sending us to overtime. This is ridiculous. These rounds are just, it, it's a coin flip. Complete coin flip. Like, we're praising OXG, you know, we see the vision, we hear the vision, it makes sense. And they kind of they, they kind of mess up a little bit, but LG with a perfect read. Now I want to know what LG spoke about in in their technical timeout. You know because when when OXG calls it, LG can also talk amongst themselves and their coaching staff. But we only hear one side. That's the team that calls for it. So they had a perfect counter to the adaptation. It worked out beautifully. The one thing that OHD missed the mark on is that you should never allow your opponents just walk into sites like that unknown to you. You should have vertical angles from master bedroom in towards that main staircase. Have the hatches opened, have those vertical angles with the shotguns because you have mute roaming upstairs. They don't have any of that presence. What's the roam going to do top floor if you don't have lines of sight to consist the first primary floor? Then they can just completely ignore you if they have the balls to do so. LG? They are fighting their way back into this, and they are not showing the signs of frustration or the signs of like risk taking where they go, ah, oh, we might lose if we go for a rush here, guys. Let's let's settle down and do a default roam clear. No, no. Let's go for the side rush. Let's play Nurk, sneak past the cameras, full send, go for it. And despite losing the first gunfire to Dreams out of Moto, they still fully committed. They understood what was in front of them and what the mission actually was, what the purpose was in that round. OXG now, they prepped so hard for that specific round, and they lose. Now they're playing Yella. 
it completely changed things up. This is Diaz probably gonna be like, okay, Fenrir is banned. We don't wanna play Melusi. We need to have an operator that can give us intel if they push certain areas. Those Grispot mines will do just that. The newer is after his strong start has fallen off of the edge of the earth. But again, this is yeah. just an attacker favored clubhouse. Only one round, one on defense by Luminosity. Lux G are suffering a very similar fate at the moment, and they have not let this match get away from them, but are one minute and 50 seconds away from letting the match get away from them. I mean, they're also winning gunfights. Didn't happen previously. DS, dangerous. Oh, okay. All right. Good night. That's it. <laughs> and and th that's going to actually slow down, maybe stall out this push significantly. They lose the ace, lose the man advantage, and they lose that crossfire, and another one goes the wrong way. But a nade kill onto Nurus. I see that every day. To come so close, yet to go so far. Hold on a second here. Okay. Gomez and Nurus are now dead. Still got control of top red. He is taking some serious damage trapped in the corner, but oh, the rotate. can't get past it. The rotate is a bigger enemy than anybody on the no. side of OXG. Hat will find an early grave as well, as it's a single point of HP for Eddie. LG gave so much hope to their fans to stay in this. They have come so close. And yet it sure seems <laughs> so far as Eddie desperate to try and find as the jiggle peak comes in from Diaz. Eddie cannot connect. That scorpion wants its next victim. The sting of the scorpion's tail, deadly at this point. Eddie trying to stop it, trying to keep Diaz at bay, but you can't be kept at bay. You gotta get into the bomb site. OXG laugh at that one, but. That was far too close for comfort, I am certain. Tiger side of Clubhouse, who'd have thought it? No XG, prevent overtime, and they pick up all three points against what looked like a resurgent luminosity. Or she could have had a very quick and relatively easy match, but then LG actually started showing up and again winning those gunfight and those engagements. I think it's a really sad way for you know that match to end, for that round to go where it was looking great, they were building the comeback, oh, they're almost there, oh, they're doing it again, and then it just falls so flat. <laughs> and those same issues... <laughs> the same issues appeared again. That's tough. What a reaction. And honestly, what a match. I feel a little bit vindicated because I thought with the way that these teams have been playing so far and where they are in the standings, this was not going to be a blowout for OXG. And after that first half, I looked like yet again, I would be eating a delicious meal of my own words. But LG picked things up. They looked far sharper on the way that they entered the map. And it wasn't just that they could get in and be quite proficient on entries. It was also that OXG made some serious blunders to not support some of their roamers. It was also that very disjointed roam upstairs when you just had yeah. LG realize, hey, there's only one or two people on the bomb site. What if we just hit the site right away and force OXG to retake LG, showing that it wasn't just gun skill, but also strategy that helped keep this match close. This is as close as you can get without provoking overtime. So it's sad for LG and it's sad for LG fans, but they do deserve the title of one of the top teams of NA right now. And they showed it in that matchup against OXG. I mean, I suppose that's true. The only issue is if you're only strong on one of the two sides, that being defense or attack, it's just not enough to be, you know, beyond top four. So if you're LG, gotta look at those defenses. OXG made some very obvious mistakes. So did LG. We're gonna have some time to fix those. Just as we have time, we go to a break. We'll be right back.
One undefeated streak came to an end, one undefeated streak lives on. While Space Station are certainly wishing they could have been the one that survived, Oxygen Esports will keep their streak alive through the first four games of their regular season. They knock off Luminosity 7-5 on club in a game that should have ended at 7-1 or 7-2 or 7-3. Even Redeemer in the timeout was like, they're just playing basic stuff. We just need to make sure we don't get trollitis at the very end. And they cure it of themselves at the last second and they win the map. So good job for Oxygen staying undefeated. It's a matter of getting overzealous there as you're going up on these rounds pretty convincingly. You're feeling happy, you're feeling strong, the chemistry's there, but then you start losing these rounds and then it starts being like, oh, hold on a second. All right, let's try to fix something. And sometimes you don't even need to fix it. You just need to play it as normal as possible. And LG saw when they tried to fix it, they saw an opening in uh, OXG Strat and then immediately went for a rush, ended up winning another round and it really put OXG on the back burner. It wasn't pretty, but three points is three points, three points all right? Doesn't points. matter how you get there, they will take the dub. And I believe that's 12 and 0 so far, uh, points I mean, I wanted page. to roast Parker because Parker was like, well, I think the analysts are underselling this game and I was like well it's about to be a 7-1 Parker but <laughs> he was right it was not and it came down to the wire well I mean the biggest thing here I mean realistically the the thing that I saw out Luminosity struggle with the most mm -hmm. was the fact their trade game it was awful mm -hmm. OXG was running away with double kills triple kills or just initially just going down down the list of how many kills that they can keep netting and then LG started to go on the back foot where they again they were meeting Oxygen with that aggression that I was talking about we talked about the attacking half who's going to run away with the attacking half Oxygen did but then now LG had a really good strong attack half it just didn't come down to their defense Newer's obviously having a really strong start to this map really racking up the I think he was 9-0 at one point. I'm glad Gomez did as well. Gomez is one of those players that we have talked about a lot in the past. I think he's gotten a lot better, especially over the last couple of months. So playing on, you know, God, that numerous half was nasty. teams. That was nasty. 
Um, but all in all, like I think he really started to show up and have that great kill, uh, kill death game that I've been waiting to see him have. I think he's been having a lot of impact in the early round. He's just been dying a lot. So his KD has been overshadowed at times by like guys like Newers or Diaz. Um, it was a great game for him. I think a lot of people would agree that this game probably ended way before it had any chance to really get close down to round 12. It probably could have been over as a 7-1 or a 7-2, somewhere around that time zone because of the way that LG were playing. And those attacks didn't really look that great. Round 9 in particular was a real doozy. Jacob, round 9 was one of the rounds of all time. And <laughs> you know what? There were some plays in that round. It was a, it was a gym bedroom uh, attack. And as I had told Parker, LG had never won this bomb site before. So at the very start, Eddie goes up and then we see Hat Capital Firebolt, his own teammate. You may think this is a mistake because it does eventually deal enough damage that he gets killed by the, by the impact, but this is tactical. We didn't see the rest of the round there, but it prompted Silent to then run in through a bathroom, grab a massive 2K, oh. massive round from him. Listen. Huge big brain, big brain play from Hat. Then we see him start to stick the plant, goes down to a 2v2. He decides, no, I don't need to stick this plant. I need to swing. He swings, dies. Wi-Fi then, perfectly enabled, this is all tactical, to come through and then jump out, knowing that the repeak would happen from construction. It was a genius play. It was a genius round from okay. LG. <laughs> Just absolute masterclass siege uh, at all turns, despite what it may have looked like. Absolutely, and that was beautiful. I love that you just broke that down entirely. The funny thing is why we're laughing here is because this was Hat, literally, <laughs> at, when he cappy towed and was watching Silent Burn. This was Hat outside that window, just watching it happen. That was tough. <laughs> oh, the more he, he, he comes up the hatch and then he's just watching his own teammate burn in flames like, ah, oh, crap. Dude, there's been, there's been situations where I've like accidentally thrown a nade or something and like, yeah. I know my teammate's about to die and I'm just like, <laughs> it is what it is. Well, it's not, just, we'll bring it back to base here. It's not just a matter of LG beating themselves. It's also Newers just continuously kicking the crap out of every opponent he's played so far. And today was no different. He finished with like 15, 16 kills on the day. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he heard you saying Ashton was the best player in the NAL, and he's right, coming for you now. He definitely took, he took it personal. But it, Newers has always been a phenomenal player. I mean, even yeah. back when I originally played with him, we picked him up. I mean, he's ex excelling. That was when he was at his best, that Charlotte Major I mean, form. He just doesn't really fall off. He just keeps getting better. And Fox said it best is, you know, sure, he, he's getting older. Things are, you know, maybe not being as much in some areas, but then there are other areas where he's improving a ton. And I think what are you you're shooting, seeing it dog? throughout. I'm what, not really. What are you shooting, dude? That's Wall e. hacks. That's knows e. he's there. That's a Zed. But no, I mean, Newers is a phenomenal player. I don't think he's been talked about a ton as much as maybe some other players have throughout this stage. But this, it kind of goes into the fact that Newers always plays very well. It's not something that's like mind numbing that, oh, Newers is doing really well. Newers on top yeah. of the leaderboard. It's kind of just normal at this point. Fair play. Let's talk to Dream on the interview real fast. Brother, you got the over of the undefeated streak going for four games in a row now, which has to feel great. But were you at all worried about Luminosity coming into this game, or did you think they had a lot of hype, but it wasn't really deserved? Um, I mean, we're we always take every opponent seriously. No game's a free game, especially not in the NAL. So uh I mean, they're not overhyped. They're they're a decent team. I think they're just a little inexperienced, and they just got a lot to learn. Now, Dream, what was going through your guys' head? You guys obviously went up six one. It was looking really good, and I mean, I've been there with you, so I can only imagine what you were feeling like. <laughs> but just run th everyone through, like, what what's going through your guys' heads once it's like, okay, we're gonna win. Oh wait, we lost a round. Okay, whatever. We lose another. Oh okay. All right, now it's getting bad. Like, focus <laughs> up. Like, what's going on in that? I mean, it, I mean that's kind of my job is to keep the team like mm -hmm. level-headed. Even even when we're going down like that, I'm like, guys, it's fine. Like, we got this next round. Like, don't don't worry about it. We're gonna be all right. And it's just keeping the team like on the same page, making sure we're, we're like running through the strats, like just playing the best of our ability and just close it out. Absolutely. I think we got a little o we got a little uh, overconfident to be honest when we went up six one. Started doing some uh, <laughs> get a little, get a little, little silly. Trolly. Yeah. <laughs> so we just dialed it in. I mean, we closed it out. It doesn't matter the score line. We got the three points. So I, I don't care. Three points is three points, Dream. But I, I do want to say, you know, you come into Clubhouse, you've seen LG play multiple Clubhouses throughout the stage already. And we already earlier today saw a bit of an upset with Los taking out uh, Space Station on the uh, on the Clubhouse. Does that worry you at all? When you see a map that you've seen your opponent play so many times, do you start thinking, oh shoot, they're going to be pulling out some new stuff here? Or are you thinking, great, you know, we've already seen them play this map twice? I mean, we, we already saw them play it twice. Uh, they haven't seen how we play club. So, I mean, it was just simple. If they want to play club, we're going club. We're, we're a good club team, and we can handle whatever whatever they throw out. Yep, that's why I picked them.
Just sure. for that wording right there. <laughs> Literally why I picked Mitch, Mitch, the master negotiator, I hear it. One more question for you, bro. Coming into this game, you had three wins against teams that were coming into the day overall, bottom three in the league. And now at this point, you're sending LG to the Shadow Realm, and maybe they'll be bottom three, bottom four, based on how other results go today. You have a much harder strength of schedule going into these last best of ones that you have to play. Is it? I, I'm just curious because they, they there's one style to play at the top level and another at the bottom level. So how well do you think what you've done through these first four games is going to translate when you face those tougher opponents? I mean, the first three games that we played of the season, uh, in my opinion, were like dominant victories, like 7-3, 7-4, like whatever. Um, so I think translating that into better opponents, I think the it'll be a little bit closer, maybe, you know, like a 7-5 maybe, but uh, we'll still take the dub. I mean, we have Newers, I have Diaz, I have Gomez, I have Yogg. Like, I don't even need to shoot my gun. They're going to kill everybody. Forget Redeemer. That'll be fine. Yeah, forget oh, Redeemer. Forget those guys. <laughs> we don't forget anymore. those guys. <laughs> <laughs> but hey, you said it yourself, three points to three points, no matter the score. Mitch, again, congratulations. We'll see you later, all right? Thank you. Three points is three. In their case, it is 12. They're the first team in the NAL to crack double digits in the amount of points that they've got the stage. And they seem like they're on a roll, but I just want to see how they fare when they face the space stations, the M80s, and the Sonics of the world. Well, I mean, I think he also said it best there, too, of going into that game specifically against LG is, you know, if they want to take Clubhouse, sure, they haven't seen ours, and we've seen it now twice, and that's what I was worried about, which is why I went, eh, when I saw that <laughs> map pool, because it was like, you only can play a map so many times back to back that, there's really nothing that you're going to do that's going to surprise anybody. Yeah, and although they've now gotten maybe the easier teams out of the way and their opponents coming up will likely be more difficult, I do still think that, like, they've gotten themselves a good enough bed of points and they can feel pretty confident going into these next couple of games that, you know, even if you lose a couple of these matches, you're still almost guaranteed to make playoffs. You still should be looking really, really good. So take these uh, next couple of matches, although they may be harder, to learn about your opponents a bit more, improve your game a little bit so that you're perfectly ready for playoffs. They're in a great spot right now. The thing is, for most rosters under OXG, They'll get off to a really good start, drop off a couple games right before playoffs, and then in some cases, miss a major entirely. So what they'll need to do is make sure that they keep their foot on the gas for the rest of this stage. Speaking of foot on the gas, Sonics have been on and off it a little bit so far this stage, and Beast Coast don't even know where the ignition is. So we'll figure out how their game is going to go in game four coming up next.
just two hours west of us sits Harrisburg, the capital of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, where the Sonics have made their home for the last several years. We're just over here in Philly, getting to see them fend off Beast Coast in what we are certain they think should be an easy matchup. Welcome back to NALHQ. I'm Jacob, he's Laxing, he is Jesse, and this is another game where another winless team needs to try to find a way to prove us wrong, but they're up against a historic Titan. It just might be a rehash of Los and SSG from earlier in the day, or it might go the complete other way. We're about to find out. I mean, yeah, we're definitely going to find out a lot of these games and even in throughout this NAL stage, a lot of things have been shaken up. A lot of teams that you weren't expecting to be having success are finding success or not finding success. And now there's a lot of different iterations of rosters. This Beast Coast roster hasn't found their footing yet. Sonics are still finding their footing. I think with more time, we're going to see a very high elevated Sonics. But again, only time will tell with these games. And I'm excited to see more of Beast Coast especially because obviously for every team, this is their third week playing. We've seen them play multiple times. For Beast Coast, due to the way the schedule worked out, they didn't play the first week of the NAL. So we're finally going to see them after taking some time away, learning from their losses, hopefully being able to work on their, uh, themselves quite a bit. Obviously, they have struggled so far through the NAL. Their first week was not strong. So I'm hoping we get to see them bounce back a little bit. It's a tough opponent, but I'm hoping to see that still. The thing is, depending on who you ask, Beast Coast is either the single weirdest team to watch or the one that's least weird because everyone kind of already understands they're trying to tap into stuff from teams that aren't Beast Coast and it may still not be working quite yet. You're right, they we did have to play three games over the course of two days and weren't able to dissect what mm -hmm. went wrong for all of those matchups. But the big question I have is whether that's really even going to matter that much. Yeah, I, I mean, I think um, just due to the way that they're going to have to move into the second game against the Sonics, you're probably still going to see them struggle a little, little bit. But I don't necessarily need to see Beast Coast win this game to be happy. If I see them improving on some of the mistakes that they've made, if I see them playing more together, if I see them getting some great rounds against Sonics, I'm going to be happy with this game. So all of them never played any matches together up until this point. Four of them came from teams that were all in tier one. One of them is a rookie from a T2 team, but all of them have apparently drastically different play styles and we can't find a way to connect them Absolutely. yet. Absolutely, and I think with this team not finding the success that we haven't seen from them yet is due to an identity crisis and especially going into these four players you have Givini coming from DZ which is that's a team that is down to the books they are following everything down to a T then you have Gunner coming from the old Sonics that's a, un, a lot of unpredictability there you don't know what's going on the team can pull something really quick then you have SSG the new SSG which is a fluid aggression obviously you're seeing in their play style now they have an understanding of how they want to play and then I say wild card is on the fly because that was a brand new team they were finding themselves finding a new foundation they found success but but lost that success and it, you have four of those people now trying to come together as a team and slot diffuser and while trying to find an identity when you have those four different identities all clashing with each other trying to figure out the right path and avenue to follow i want to draw your attention real quick to something our very own jesse j twick the twick chick <laughs> Wow, I totally botched that whole thing. Hey, look he there. tweeted this just a couple of days ago, and I quote, this should be the best roster Beast Coast have ever fielded. Very excited to see what they should do. Jesse, is this still something we stand by? I mean, yeah, this should be the best Beast Coast roster we've ever seen. <laughs> Are they the best? No, not currently. They've got a lot of problems to work through. Uh, but the thing is, like, the caliber of these players has been so strong. Throughout, the, All of them have found success, gone to majors, yep. played at the highest level. We've seen them play on very good teams. But so far, they've not been able to gel together. They've really struggled to lock down some of those advantages, especially on defense. So, I mean, I'm disappointed in Beast Coast thus far. I think everybody is. We all kind of expected this team to, like, maybe be major contenders or at least taking games off big teams. And so far, they aren't even taking games off smaller teams. So, yeah, I, I mean... I think it's going to come down to how they improve on their weaknesses. It's going to come down to how they improve throughout the weeks. But, uh, yeah, it's been massively disappointment, uh, disappointing from them so far. Hey, it's still huge respect to somebody for sticking to their guns and what their opinion was, even if things absolutely have not slid their way through these first couple of weeks so far. Their opponents are the Sonics, who had a very up and down last Friday. They played two games. They lost the first one to Space Station. They won the second one against Los. Both of them were 7-5s. And even if it was an even play day for them and they still got a win, I 
I bet they wish that win had been over Space Station because that game was really close. Yeah, of course. But I mean, this is Sonics. They know what they need to do. They're still figuring out this roster with bringing in Adam and Merc, and they're still finding success. Sure, it's not the same success that we've been seeing from the old roster, but still, nonetheless, I mean, they're still performing at a very high level. They're still beating expectations, especially even when I first saw them play against DZ. People wrote them off that DZ was just going to win that, and they ended up winning that outright. So there's still a lot of gas in this tank for the team. It's just a matter of how they're going to be able to release that entirely and get everyone up to speed. And one of the things we've been talking about in the back is because it is a new team, it might not be anything more serious than just small mistakes that they seem to be making at certain critical points. Especially in that Space Station game, it was 5-5, and then suddenly Space Station run away with the whole thing. Yeah, I wanted to show you the last two rounds from Space Station versus Sonics. Just replay them, because I think win. both of these rounds should have gone the way of SQ. The first round, they're trying to go against uh, Forrest, who should be planting on this Monty. The first C4 flies out, you saw it there. It deals about half HP to the Montane. The second one, it's also going through the small hole in the wall, and it should be dealing the final blow. Geo just isn't able to throw it far enough. The explosion radius, I guess, doesn't get around the pillar. Forrest gets the plant off and wins the round because of it, and it ends up going Space Station's uh, way. 6-5, and then they make this rotate. I, we got to really focus in on the rotate here because there's that little bit on the left that isn't quite shot out with the shotgun in the very early stage of this round, way back in the prep phase, and it ends up coming to bite Sonics in the butt. We end up seeing Rexon in the 1v2. Rexon plays this perfectly. The only problem is he can't rotate back out of the room. He gets stuck on the wall. He dies because of it. These tiny mistakes are costing Sonics rounds. But, like, if you're the Sonics, these are the problems you want to be having. Oh, absolutely. These are really small, fixable mistakes for SQ. And to be able to take a team like Space Station, who is arguably one of the best teams in the entire league right now to have such a close game and to have, in theory, should be winning, uh, should have won that, I think is a big uh, statement for Sonics. And I do think that despite losing a couple games, they're still looking very, very good. They still came into today, number three overall, two wins under their belt. They've got seven points. They're just looking to add more to their tally. And if they get three over Beast Coast, they also join OXG in double digits in the league. But we're heading to Nighthaven Labs. Interesting call for a Beast Coast team that's still trying to find their footing on realistically any map, but do we like the pick or are we shaky on it? Hell no. I'm seeing that face. Know. What does that face mean? No, I don't. You're, you're having an identity crisis. Unless you're, like, scrimming Nighthaven just aggressively and, like, this is now your best map, sure, but... Even from what I've seen from a lot of teams in Night Haven, like, I wouldn't say it's their best map. So to be taking Sonics to this map that they're comfortable with, that they're familiar with, and you want yourself as Beast Coast are having this identity crisis, to me, you're kind of just reaching for something and trying to find success somewhere. Whereas you're going against the Sonics that are going to be prepared. They know what to do on this map. They played against really good teams on this map, so they know how to work the map. And you're an entirely brand new team as Beast Coast where you haven't had that experience against other teams. You just maybe have had it with your old rosters. Yeah, and especially going against Sonic. Sonics loved this map back in Stage 2 last year. They won it a lot. They played it a lot. They didn't get the chance to play it at SI. A lot of bans against uh, them for this map, so that's not super common. But an odd choice for Beast Coast to go to. I will say... Last year's Beast Coast roster, which had five completely different players, this was the only <laughs> map they had a positive win record on throughout the year. All right, all they right. A, a single win and zero losses. Of all of the useless analysis we could pull out, <laughs> it just had to be that factoid. All right, so it sounds like everyone here with the map in play, everyone's betting heavy on the favorite. Any reason to pick Beast Coast here or no? I'm going with Beast Coast. Wait, what? <laughs> you really nah, had me for a SQ, second. SQ, 100%. There we go. Uh, Fox has obviously gone for SQ, keeping his lead strong. Jesse sticking with, uh, with uh, the Whirlpool, too? Yeah, I'd be shocked if Sonic's hey, lost. pound it. Time. That's it. Well, I mean, hey, there was a time earlier in the day where the whole desk picked one team, uh, and it didn't work out so well. So I'm, curi I'm curious how game four works. Yeah, I mean, it's a selective memory, but we don't, we don't have to remember the times that we lose. Game four is up on deck. Beast Coast finally get their first dub, or are Sonic's about to make a really strong push for top two? Uh, I'm sure Penguin and Parker will tell us. It's the battle of the teal, as we always call it. Both of these teams rocking almost the same colors. I heard that the loser actually needs to change their name. But a very different story for these rosters. Obviously, Beast Coast come in with some serious work to be done on their side of things. And I imagine that they will improve upon previous performances against a team like Sonics. But it is quite the task to come out ahead here, Nick. It is. Uh... I've seen the Beast Coast games, and I like the whole well, term that we got going, identity crisis, because it, it, I don't know what to make of this team right now. You know, it takes time to gel, to figure things out. There was that funny stat line that like, nobody on the Beast Coast roster had teamed up before. 
not even just two individual players or something like that. So yeah, it's, it's, it's gonna take, yeah, it's gonna take maybe a lot of time to figure things out. And I, I think Lax was spot on, like going to Night Haven Lab is a pretty big uh, risk as well. It's not an easy map to play unless you've been scrimming this excessively. And you know, you went into this week saying, we're gonna play Sonics, it's probably gonna be Night Haven. Let's play it all day, every day, because I would say while it's not the most difficult map to learn, it's also not the most, you know, the easiest. So I, I'll pray for them in this matchup. It certainly isn't, and I'm I'm curious as why you go here, whether there's a winner yeah. interview or not, what their thought process will be behind it. Beast Coast comes in with the at the start of the day the worst round differential, tied with Dark Zero now after their matchup earlier, but Beast Coast only a single point. They are in the basement, the basement of basement. this league at the moment, and the bombs light. <laughs> This, you look? Man, that was a great, that was a great pivot. Woo! Yo, come retrieve this dap, dog. Yo, yo, dap me up, homeboy. Yo, dap me up, homeboy. Oh, da, 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 da. There you go. Thank you. King, the most banned operator in pretty much every single region. Right now, sitting well above second place, who is also banned, which is the Doka B. Monty is right after, in case anybody's curious. As for, curious, for those defenders, Fenrir and Azami leading the way just a couple points above both Kaid and Valkyrie. Hmm. And would you know it? It's left. Azami and Fenrir banned out. So no real target bans here, just very standard Five, stuff when it comes to operator bans. And because of that, I don't really suspect there's going to be any major changes. Like if you were to ban, say, any of those funky bans. If you look at some of the attackers, for example, there's one Deimos ban, there's... Yeah. One Ace ban, there's one Brava ban, there's one Maverick ban. These can be decided on the map and on your opponents. So, with that said, let's get underway with round number one between these teams. Sonic's not living up to, I think, what people thought their billing would be. At least a little bit ahead of Beast Coast. It's a tricky situation here. We saw a player even stuck in a corner. It's hot and cold. I mean, the issue is once you stick that, it's hard to get away, but he just... He, he gets up, he just walks the cross. Sonics, they don't want to risk swinging that with their face. They're going to drone it first. It looks like they might go for a straight bombs at execute. They want stock control to deny the verticality, smoke, fire on the bomb side, and go for a plant. It looks like a very like simple take here. We need everything to be perfect. The knowledge, the information has to be, you know, excellent. They have to know exactly what they're up against. And it looks like they might have an angle here once they can figure out the room. Ambi hasn't exactly had the success that I think most of us were expecting after... Oh, they're gonna go. ...having a really good SI. He's being very patient right now as... Things are exploding all around him. There go the smokes. Geo has the call with half of the round down to go for it. There's a team kill by Gavin. That's floppiness. East Coast just so eager get into the action that they're killing themselves. And in fact, Diffuser, the only one to die so far from Beast Coast, wasn't even at the hands of SQ. Does SQ suffer yet another, losing Adam? Rexon is outside of the breach. It's the two hard breachers left, as Thermite and Maverick, with very limited tools at their disposal, will just have to go for picks at this point. Mark can easily cut through some of those hatches, but only two flashbangs in terms of secondary gadgets. So, yeah. Factor in that there are two impacts and a nitro cell still remaining from Beast Coast. Oh, nice shot by Merc, followed up immediately by Rexon, but Beast Coast just locked them out, and it seemed like that was the way we were heading, given the numbers favoring Beast Coast. They start off with a round victory. I actually like what Sonics were doing there on the attack inside, and it made sense, and I actually think it could've, would've, should've worked, but there was one small, tiny detail that I'm not too happy with. When you go for these kind of simple takes or bombs at rushes, I think the worst thing you can do, especially when you're smoking off a position, is to plant default, like the spot that you're usually planting in, because it's such a pre-fireable position. And that's what happened. Spirits killed two players, both of those players were the planter. Or he killed three in total, but two of the players that he killed early on were the planters. And yeah, the capital of smoke was there. They planted, you know, jumped on the box in the smoke. But again, you know where that is. Every player has shot that position so many times before. When you go for those kind of strategies, I think the best thing you can do when you're using the smokes to your advantage is to plant in a spot that is hard to figure out. 
Because then you're guessing, okay, left of the smoke, right of the smoke, in the middle of the smoke. And if you have two smoke clouds, which smoke are they planting in, right? Only small thing that didn't really work out. If that bomb goes down, great post plant. They had upstairs control. They had a good read on what they needed, what they didn't need. And Beast Ghost even went for a team kill, and yet they still win that round. Normally when we see these first rounds play out, it's about kind of setting the pace and taking control off that initial beginning. I Again, Sonics, they had a good counter read. It didn't work out. Beast Coast are not going to feel too bad about that because they get the round victory, even though they might feel like Sonics had a smart play up their sleeve. So a good start from this identity crisis Beast Coast. Crossfires, the discipline in that like final moment as well, 3v2, was also excellent. So good stuff so far. the first Night Haven Labs that we are seeing, so we don't have any data here in North America to go off of, is the most banned map because we have yet to see it through all the 17 matches that had occurred previously. It was banned out 17 of those times. Typically, at least if we just go back to the Six Invitational, which again is not a perfect point of comparison for a variety of reasons, but it's the most recent data that we have involving North American teams. This was what was called a coin flip map. That means when the attack and defenders have only won a couple percentage differences, it's not like 62% to 38%. No, no, no. Night Haven Labs was actually statistically the most balanced map for quite a long period of the Six Invitational, sitting mm. at almost 50%. Damn. Really does come down to where you decide to defend. On cold, speaking of the defenders, they were good in that very first round, getting that leadoff pick. Gunner suffers for it, but Beast Coast, through the first half of the round, have gotten one pick. Rex in next one up. Playing around the wall, he has some safety there. Adam dropped by Sonics, Merc dropped now as well. Rex in on a flashing point of HP. Sonics falling by the wayside. It just, there's too much for Sonics to do with the defenders the way they are. One minute to go. They found a pick on the Gavin, so Sonic's eager to keep those numbers close. But yet again, it's going to be a duo to try to get this done. It was Rexon and Merc the round before. Now it's Ambi and Rexon. With, like I said, one minute to go. Note that they were trying to attack horizontally and vertically at the same time instead of going that aqua flank. So trying to, you know, clear the roam top floor is very difficult just from one singular point. You see, yeah, the fish door is castle barricaded, so it's a very linear push from Sonics. They lost their gun duels, you know, that's why they're down in numbers. And now we see Beast Coast, they fall back. Again, play discipline. They have one Toxic Babe left, and that's really all they have utility-wise. But they got a proof of camera, they got some default kind of information, and there's only 20 seconds left for Sonics. Rexon, one point of HP, has picked up the Fuser, will jump into sight and try and get it down and plant it. And there he goes on a sliver of HP with it. Diffuser in hand, but he's gassed immediately by Hot and Cold. Diffuser was team killed in the previous round. You can see what influence he has when he stays alive. East Coast. Springboard. 2-0 so far through Nighthaven Labs. I guess one of the upsides of going to Nighthaven, which was a big question mark for the desk and us, is that you do get side selection for the side of East Coast. And... Obviously, when you do map bans, there are certain maps where you're happy to go to Nighthaven Lab if you get defense start, for example, or you're happy to go to Skyscraper if you get defense start. Beast Coast might have just said that same thing here, where they go, okay, if we can get the, the, the starting set that we want, that we desire, we're happy to go here. They might feel like they need a little bit of um, confidence, right? A little bit of that momentum, feel like they actually have a chance at this because if you start on the attack, you go down CO2, you get down CO3, you're in your roster, you know, you've had some rough color games already, then the vibes are dead immediately, right? It's just, it's over. It feels so bad. So this could be one of the win conditions for them, simply the starting side. Look good so far. Now, they got one of those kind of pocket pick cheese style operators. And it's funny because Geo on the side of Sonics would know a thing or two about the clash. But it's hot and cold on Beast Coast bringing out this particular operator for this round. Clash is like the Muncie of defense, but it's almost more annoying because she's gonna sap the opponents all the time. Slow them down, do a little bit of damage, 
And in the current meta lineup of Siege, so like the operators that you see typically on average on the attacking side, not very many of those operators can deal with the Clash. We don't see like Sophia being brought every round. We don't see Nomad being brought every round. The only really outlier is like Kamatau is very present and it was even played in round number one by Sonics. In this round, it's just the Nomad. So you have one operator who can like somewhat deal with the Clash. One of those air jabs that can deal with her already being spent, of course, on a jump out or a flank somewhere. So only two left remaining. So hot and cold with this lineup that he's facing can just kind of walk around the map, not worry all too much. I've seen some bemoaning of the amount of shields at this current point in time in competitive Rainbow Six Siege. And I got to say, I don't hate the deployment that these teams are using these operators in. I know from my own experiences playing this game that Clash is not particularly fun, but the way that teams can problem solve is something that we ought to be highlighting and praising, yeah. frankly. And you do need to do problem solving as an attacking team every single time you commit to an execute, but if there's a Clash on the board, that job gets even more difficult. Ooh. Merc is going to get a taste of it right away. You can't cook the nade. Nice oh. play by Merc. The punish spirits as he swings the door. All Hotten did was prove to be an ineffective distraction as there goes a nade, but he can't get out of the way in time. This is really big value by Merc so far. SQ, though, need to be very wary of this time remaining. One minute left. You cannot get bogged down here. Merc making his way into IT. Hotten will continue to give information as... Well, it could get swung upon. It is a problem. The Clash kind of locks him out. That constant information, like Merc knows they're gonna swing, and there it is. Garden this time is successful on that opening kill. Very quick follow up as Ambi enter the day as the highest rated player on Sonics. He will be no more. The hands of Gavin. Most of the Sonics <laughs> advance has been stuck outside of this IT breach for the last two minutes, Nick. It's a clash, man. Like, again, like, what can it do? Ambi spent all his uh, air jabs on the flank. Diffuser takes out Geo. Remaining two players from Sonics. You got trickle in. Rexon's found two kills to match his two deaths. Yeah. Running up against Hot and Cold. Down goes Gavin to Adam. This is very winnable for Sonics. Wait a moment. Hold on. Rex in your last one. Left Hotten. We'll pull out the super shorty sidearm and Beast Coast are up 3-0. The Clash. Again, so much value in the round. No one can deal with the operator. You're just kind of walking around thinking, okay, what do we do? Go here, no Clash. And the thing is, the Clash will rotate wherever the attack comes from. Bit, so down zero like three, days, Sonic's call for a tactical timeout. If, if you guys can do this, you guys can just plant. That is exactly what these guys want you to do. They want you to feel safe. They want you to, to like walk in and they want you to plant. They have Vert, they have Intel. So just for the next like for the next three rounds, focus on doing a full clear. Don't cut corners. Don't try to just focus on executing. Talk about how we're going to clear the map so we can actually control around the bomb site so that we can actually safely plant. Cutting corners and just walking in and trying to like get a, a quick little plant down is exactly what they want us to do. Yep. So just full clear. And they're gonna base him again. Just a little full clear. Remember, if we get man advantage, they're gonna swing to get it back too. Be ready for that shit. Yep. Okay, <clears throat> okay let's get it. Run attack. Go loco. Even the uh even the dog made an appearance in the background there as well, getting uh, <laughs> the technical timeout in there with the knowledge. I actually really like that timeout from, from Goddess, and it's, it's a very clear cut that this is what we're going to do. And it was not like a, guys, we should probably... No, no, you need to full clear. It's very simple because you're playing into their strengths, and I don't disagree. Like, Beast Ghost have been very ready for these kind of single linear takes. First round is that they had the plant denial ready, right? They had the roam as well. Second round, it played out the way that it did. I would say it's more like a gunfight thing for Sonics, but again, like they're trying to do simple takes from one position. And then third round, they play Clash, and you're forced to walk into a Clash. We want to see Sonics play a more like new style of Siege, if you will, spread more thin across the map, attack from different directions, and make the defenders weak to being flanked. Because Beast Coast right now, they feel so comfortable. They never have to worry about what's you know, below them, what's behind them. They just they see an open wall, like the main breach, that's where Sonics are standing. So there should, of course, based on that tactical timeout, be a very clear change up here in the following three rounds. Otherwise, the players have they have failed to listen and failed to adapt. 
Nice to hear Goddess yet again talk to the team. Very fortunate to have some good listening so far. That one obviously among them. Gavin now roaming as Solus. Oh, I mean, if you're Merc, you have to be worried about them swinging, and if you swing them, they'll swing back. Gavin swings Merc first. Merc, two and four on entry duties on that Ash. Those are bad numbers for his roll. Next one up is Ambi. Having one of his worst starts to a match so far through the NAL. As I said, Ambi entered the day as the highest rated player on Sonics. Not too far ahead of Merc, but far enough that is worthy of distinction. Honestly, this Sonics team, despite being two and two, does not have a lot of bad performers. The lowest rated player on the team was Rexon, who sits at a 0.92 rating. But he's been doing it on these support roles, so it stands to reason that he would be towards the bottom. And as oh you can see from, from the previous rounds, he's almost always been the last alive, and that once again just goes to the role that he plays on. Now, not quite so fortunate in this round as Spirits eliminates him, and Sonic suffer two deaths the halfway mark of the round. Oh, that that's... I mean, I said spread out thin and attack from different locations, but Rex and jumping in the kitchen window, being completely sandwiched and boxing by three different defenders is not what I was talking about. And there was no one nearby to support because Adam and Ambi are on the other portion of the primary floor, and now they lose the Jackal. Now they're playing three versus five, and this is not what you want to see after a tactical timeout. The attacks are falling apart, and Beast Coast looking very comfortable on the defense. They got Castle Barricades, they got Valkyams, they got the Solas. Like, they have so much intel to make the right decisions, and they're making those decisions every single time. Now you're just hunting ghosts at this point. Limited information. They're standing right next to you. Gunner was just there, and Ambi had no wherewithal whatsoever. All up to Geo, and man, what an oddly paced round, but Beast Coast just... They beat them every step of the way, 4 nothing. Well, this is not what anybody expected, that's for sure. It's kind of like the Lowe's game earlier today, Slide Sparlers. It's also a bit of an upset, but of course, we can also make the argument that what if this is like Skyscraper? where there is just one side that is heavily favored by both teams, of course, that being defense. Sonics, they need some rounds. Ideally, they go too far on the half on the attack. They can build with some stuff, you know? They, they, they have a little bit of... They can mess up and lose a round, then they start match point yet because then it's like 2-5. But when you're down 0-4 to four and you've already called your timeout, you need anything right now. There's a small technical pause here. So... We're gonna sit for a second. Teams can uh, not talk to each other. But they can, of course, sit there in their own head and think what they think should be changing uh, and what should they try and pull out instead. And maybe Sonics go away from the default attacks. So you're trying to whip out some fun operators, as we call it, whether it's gonna be some blitz action or some like fast drone clears or whatever. But right now, it just looks like Beast Coast have them read completely and they're almost like fully set up, ready for the counters every single round. That's esports. Awards Color Commentator of the Year nominee Pengu looking at Beast Coast up over Sonics for nothing and giving such hard hitting analysis as yeah, Sonics need to win some rounds. Yep, yep, there it is. It, it's that simple, right? Before otherwise they lose. First to seven, it's over. Just, just this is the hard hitting analysis that we come for. You know, I am not an analyst like JCJ Chick. I don't gotta bring the numbers. I don't gotta bring the stats. I just, I look at things, I say things, and half the time, they might be wrong. Who knows, right? Unless you call me out for it, Parker. I think what, oh, it's all good fun. <laughs> I mean, there hasn't really been a terrible amount to talk about in this matchup. No. It's it's Sonic's trying to drone, getting destroyed by Mute and Solus, being denied intel, needing to take direct gunfights, and... Honestly, a team like Sonics have the firepower to win these duels. Honestly, if, if I had to if I had to guess as to which of these teams would win just in straight up gunfights, it would be on Sonics. And yet, time and time again, Sonics are engaging in direct attacks and losing. Now, obviously, Beast Coast being on defense, they have tools at their disposal. The Clash was a great example of that in that round, even though the Clash didn't prevent Beast Coast from surrendering one of their players. New Sonics, and yet still, 
Onyx are struggling. They're losing their duels. They're losing on Intel. They're losing on utility work. There really isn't a bright spot here for SQ at this current moment. And I want to say maybe it's just that it's a defender side of Nighthaven Labs, and it's possible mm. that it is. These are the four most banned operators. You've got Ying and Doak removed. They're removed in more matches than they're not. You've got Azami and Fenrir. They're also removed in more matches than they're not. And this was one of the most balanced maps in all of the six Invitational. So maybe these teams, just the way that they play, maybe it empowers the defenders. But there isn't a lot at this present moment that I can point to on the side of SQ and say, they're doing this well. And that is a troubling sign because usually when a team is down 4-0, at this level, there's one or two things that we can talk about in a positive manner. And for me, there just really is not. That's a troubling sign for SQ. I have to agree. The question now is what can be done? What will change? Because right now, it just hasn't been a lot, really. I like the forest picker, clear some utility, you know, make some noise as well. No, don't make the people on the side feel safe. But last time I saw this attack, this it was a simple three guys above, two guys side, and it didn't really get anywhere in that particular uh, round last time around. Hot we'll have a yet, hot and cold is yet to die, by the way. No, it is. We're actually gonna listen to what Beast Coast thinks is happening right now. So a quick listen here for the defensive side. I have sight, okay, boys. I have no, no, that sight. Just worry about my no, garage window. Garage window. I can't help fork yet. I'm still. I'm, I'm stuck under me. One in the basement fucking under me. I need help fork right now. Aaron. Yeah, he's in sight. In sight. Yeah, in storage. Still sight window. I'm talking at bottom blue. Not any window, Sam. Jackal, Jackal storage Make door last storage. Storage. I can't, I can't. He's deep on there. Yeah, 90 window. They're gonna hop in sight blue. window here and plant. So can we power through garage? Yeah, we can. Mm. I can't. I'm not close. They know I'm here. Yeah, blue. just play top down. Is, are they top? Is he still top down? Make like downstairs? Yeah. Okay, okay. We're in sight. Sure. And what's in the basement? He's by the pillar. So, one, one on like four ping, Gav, around there. It's like by the B bomb, okay? Her. There's a cam on me somewhere. Make right above uh, storage. Do we have blue walk up? Yeah, yeah, go, go to Gav. Go to Gav and make okay. Vert. Yeah, just play Raptors. There's a drone on there somewhere. Have you taken basement? All right, so there it is. A lot of intel there on the side of Beast Coast saying there's a guy over here, Rose over there, and that's the active there from Hot and Cold on the camps who was dead in that round, of course. That's the benefit of losing a vocal player early on. They can make all the decisions with the top-down overview. Sonic's looking better right now, stabilized, and they got the picks. They're near the bomb side, but again, they have to deal with the intel, and they don't have an IQ. There was a bit of franticness, as you could hear in their comms, but... I mean, in this matchup, there's no real reason to be frantic, especially with how you're handling SQ. Maybe in this round, because of the fact that you're down two. And two very crucial operators. No anti-plant now with both of those nitro cells expended. Gavin and Spears won't be able to blow up SQ if they get into the bomb site. With Rexon attempting the defuse now, that means SQ has three players to go against the free from Beast Coast. Adam swinging, winning. Gavin trying his oh. best, but he's far removed. Both teams just coming to blows. Now Adam has been dropped. It's all up to Merc to clutch out. Diffuser will continue to run away as Merc circles nearby. Not too far off. East Coast will need to play this one well. If they decide to take separate engagements, then Merc Ooh. will be able to win it. That's just how it is. And Merc gets slaughtered by Spirits, and the closest round for SQ is close, but not close enough. Five rounds in a row. Sonics stunned so far by the team that entered today in last place. There are going to be some predictions right now where people are going to sit there and go, oh boy, how did I not see this coming? But that's the thing. You, you don't see this coming. There is no world in which anybody realistically goes, oh, Beast Coast is going to win this dominantly. There's just not a way. And, you know, being up 5-0 right now, Looking very much like they very well could go up 6-0. Sonics, they gotta change everything. I mean, they get a plant down, but they don't have the numbers. Adam gets injured pretty early on, just leaving Merc as last alive. And again, the bomb is not planted for Merc. He has to push to the rotate. While there's a guy covering him, Spirit, so of course he gets the kill, just to see the guy defusing. 
things are really falling apart. I mean, this cannot just be Nighthaven defense. This has to be a, a bigger aspect of things. Not working for the side of Sonics. And actually, Beast Coast looking like a team. I was very curious to listen to their communication because we don't really know what to expect and how they operate. Are they going to be very cluttered in their communication? Which, to be fair, they were a bit, but there's something happening in the round as well. And what is their, like, win conditions in those rounds? Well, very visibly, it was vertical. They had vertical control over Bombside. They had Intel. They mentioned Hot and Cold, given that information, and it worked out. But it's also a Beast Coast that are happy to take gunfights and also winning them very often. So, they're not making silly mistakes. They have a clear view of what the goal is with every single round, and their communication is flowing. That's how they find themselves up in this position. And then Sonics, of course, failing to problem solve, quote unquote, correctly, or so it would seem at least, that puts them in that 0 5 position. It's really quite heartbreaking when a team uses their timeout and still has some very serious struggles. The Nitro Cell now used, but just manages to avoid Merc. We actually saw a Nitro Cell hitting those Maverick Scars, if you want to call them that. Had a pick earlier. Not in this matchup, but earlier in the day, that is. Definitely doable. And now these little poke holes, which will allow Merc some vantage points towards the bomb sites. A little bit of intel on the drones. And again, talks about how Mute and Solus were having so much influence on denying Sonic's information. Look at the Beast Coast lineup. There's neither of them. There's really no reason why you shouldn't be able to get maximum value from your drones based on Beast Coast's five operators. And with that said, we're at the halfway point of the round, and there are eight drones still on the board mm -hmm. for Sonics. So clearly, Intel is not going to be a big issue in this round. No, nope, but they still got a problem to solve. They still got to deal with a bandit, the possible trooper round, diffuser, two of those uh, nades in the pocket, so to speak, that can freeze up the wall. So time might still be a problem. Oh, the air jab, though, just sends him flying, but the trade is there. Beautifully done by Beast Coast. Down goes Ambi. A flank potentially you had in those air jabs will just be there for the remainder of the round. Not much else as Merc finds himself inside of IT looking for information. There's a Valkyrie on the board, so you have to be very mindful of this intel. He will die in there. It ultimately ends up being his tome. Now it's Rex and an Adam. Very it's much uh... looks like a 6 nothing half. Rexon has access to the diffuser. Adam taking damage. He now gets ever closer. Spirits is looking the wrong oh. way, but now there's information for Beast Coast to play off of. They actually have the advantage in numbers once Rexon goes for that diffuser, even though they've surrendered it. Now, down goes Adam. Rexon is all by himself. Off and left, last alive and in a very hard spot. Rexon is a tremendously gifted player, but that boat's taking on water and he really oh. can't do too much about it. Hold on. Could he bail himself out? There's Gavin going down. Gunner will look to run back in. Rexon sticks it off at the last oh. second. This is dangerous! And Beast Coast survived the danger! Gunner against his team, his former team, will get the last laugh on that round. Beast Coast, a perfect first half. Things are getting closer and closer for Sonics. It started off being relatively one-sided, and now it comes down to a 1v1, you know, zero seconds left. Garner is outside the building, trying to stall for time, playing that bait and switch in the plant or not. It's, it's one of those, like, surely Sonics wins the next one, right? Because it's so close. But even if they do, it's going to be their first round victory. They're behind zero to six. Yeah, they start attack. It's the harder side, whatever. But as you pointed towards in the beginning of this map, Parker, during SI that happened just in February, Nighthaven Lab was a very even map in terms of the attack and the defensive win rate. So if we look at those numbers, and assume that they're going to apply for this season as well, which you know, why wouldn't they somewhat represent the same ideal situation? Being down 0-6 is not like a statistical expectation of being down 2-4. We're looking at three, three halves. Worst case, two, four halves, regardless of what side you're on. Mentally speaking as well, if you're Sonics, you're probably not feeling too good. You're not winning your gunfights. You're not finding those clutch moments. You've lost two rounds now, back to back, that came down to like, okay, we either get the plant down or we almost get the plant down. And then it slips away again. In the 2-2 that we just witnessed, you could argue that they can try and go for a plant. 
But instead, one guy pushes forward, dies, other guys tries to plant. It's a very split kind of mindset here. Maybe they come some Sonics and not quite there today. I'm not sure. But uh East Coast starts to attacks in a similar way of Sonics. They're gonna go downstairs, they're gonna be open those walls, the EMP in the cell mass. And just apply that side pressure, then rotate upstairs and probably try and deal with some of the room to activate the ram to destroy that vertical floor, leading to the bomb side itself. We'll see honestly how Beast Coast is able to do on this immediate round. Is it close? Are we just looking at a freakishly pro defender? Night Haven Labs? Beast Coast suffers the first casualty, down goes Diffuser. Oh. Castle of Ambi's been dropped, but Sonic's just slaughtering them. They wanted a rush strat. They wanted to get in the building quickly, and they get it. I mean, they get in, but not in the direction that they want. As very quickly, Sonics find themselves with a serious advantage. That's for sure. Here we see those spirits on. Oh, wait, there's a Bush G. Oh, so sorry, Shotgun. I, for a second there, I saw the icon for it was a Bush G. Shotgun in, sorry, gets the kill and be injured. And all of a sudden, despite finding all those enemies upstairs on the roam clear, they've equalized. As the screen comes to black there, that con like confirms a 2v2 situation, but there are two C4s in pocket from Sonic's defense. They can get vertical kills very easily. Good news for Beast Coast, Ram is still up. So is the Deimos. If Deimos could ever be strong, it's in the 2v2s and the 2v1s. You can track one defender, know exactly where they are, and only leaves you to question where that final person is. That's good intel to have. I also have five drones, of course. Most of those are probably from dead players, so they're flank camps at this point, but at least they have the Deimos gadget. Yeah, you've got one drone in pocket for spirits, it looks like. I can't tell if he'll use it or not. Deimos is about to use that tracker. Mark one of those two remaining Sonics players. Rexon has been is. playing the most of Sonics so far, like we said. Always alive till the bitter end. This round, no different. 30 seconds to go. It's him and Geo. Geo yet to find a kill in the six rounds that have been played so far. Seven rounds, if you count the action we're in. They oh, baited Gavin night. in. They knew he was coming. Now it's Spirits with that shotgun in a very tough spot. 15 seconds remaining. He'll track Geo. Pistol out. They know exactly where he's coming from. And Geo wins the fight. Not just winning the fight but also getting his first kill. East Coast have so much runway to land this thing. They are inarguably the favored team at this current point, but the defenders now perfect, not just Beast Coast. Maybe that's the win condition. You know, Sonics, Geo gets first kill. Sonics gets the first round. It cannot be a coincidence. It really cannot at this point. If you're Beast Coast, I think you hold on to that timeout for as long as possible. You do not want to give Sonics any downtime right now. They're feeling the pressure. They're staring that match point every single round, either till they lose in regulation or go all the way to overtime. And if you're Beast Coast, because you built such a big, significant lead, you can throw a couple rounds by trying some weird stuff. Whether it's a fast rush or a, a, a Kali Monty here, of course, that can change with the attack or repick. You can afford to get funky with it. You can afford to take risks and just not care about the outcome. And eventually, something will work. Just a matter of time. Winning a couple of gunfights, hit a lucky wall bang, anything like that. Sonics are bringing that same kind of utility as we saw from Beast Coast when they were defending. The Bandit, the Tuber out, the Castle, the Smokes. It's all about trying to kind of shape the bomb site and the map the way that you want and try and stall out for time. Time really is a key factor in Night Haven Lab. There's a lot to clear if you're going for that full take, for example, like God spoke about doing Sonic's tactical timeout. And likewise, if you're going for a direct attack, the Bandit and Tuberow st stops that immediately. Gia was going for a spawn peak with the C4, so he's late. But there it is. Tuberow canister will freeze the wall and buy you the time that he needs to then trick it. And this is why you play these operators together. It's very strong and very efficient. It's annoying to deal with if you're an attacker. Oh, yeah. Because it's... It's agency that's taken away from you, but big thing, obviously, that you just gotta wait. There really isn't much for you to do. You just wait it out. Best counter would be Maverick, but he's not always gonna be able to get the job done. As we've seen, Maverick finds himself in precarious positions so far today. Extremely vulnerable to a Nitro Cell. Even do some chip damage there with the impacts. The attacker's bomb 
By the way, Beast Coast will have some struggles early just to be able to get in the building. We have plenty of time. And I like that you pointed out the timeout component because it, again, needs to be mentioned that timeout doesn't just work for the team that calls it, it works against their adversaries as well. So if Beast Coast calls the timeout early, it will allow Sonics to stay in the game by discussing strategies with their coach. You don't want to give Sonics anything at this point. Keep smothering them the way the Beast Coast did on defense. Maybe just show a bit more success on offense as the only round so far. It's close, but Sonics came out ahead. I like this Beast Coast, a very slow approach, very methodical. They want to have five players live, get the Monty in. They have Chaos out of their finger. They have so many tools, Merrick for the walls as well. And now they do the thing the Sonics didn't. They attack from multiple locations. They're getting main breach. They're getting catwalk control. Now they're pressuring that fish aqua location. So we see the silhouettes. They're very spread apart in different angles, but working together. Matter of time now. Last canister from two brow went out. Toxic babes as well from the smoke. That's the final one. After this, in 15 seconds time, spirits can start a certain dominance on towards the fish aqua position and try and tear away these positions with diffuser flanking as well. Fuser finds Geo droned out effectively. There's an adrenal surge as well. The smoke being pressured by spirits. The smoke gets to go away. Spirits will continue to walk forward, flashed by his own teammates. You got to ensure that Adam doesn't get anything for it, and that's Gunner to ensure that's the case. Gavin drops, and so does Spirits. Hold on a second. Merc what? willing his team still into this one. Merc still upright. Hot and cold has been dropped. Now Diffuser's down too. What? It's Gunner is the last one standing, and Rexit is to the rescue as Sonics win two in a row and prove they are still capable of battling against this Beast Coast squad. <laughs> the entire round played out on the Maverick holes from Catwalk Rafters into the site. So Monty walks in, Yellow Pin goes out, they go into garage, they Maverick the wall, they get a couple of kills and whatnot. The, the, the chaos begins. It was again a great take. It was a three catwalk, two aquafish side, good take. But then Merc. You know, he starts swinging the wall and just fighting back, finding those couple of kills. Rexon joins as well on the two per out DMR, and they just take off so many players inside a catwalk. Monty's then left alone. He can't find anything either. I thought it was a done deal, honestly. I thought there was a sound attack from Beast Coast that made sense. They support each other. They had good operators to do the job. And I would not be surprised to see if they will try the Monty again because it worked so well. Yeah, it was a slow beginning, but it was slow because they were waiting to get into the right positions. And again, you don't want to risk losing those players early to silly things. Not checking a corner, not joining correctly, or rushing into a gunfight. Just relax. You're up 6-2 especially, you're not in a hurry. You can take your time to learn. You can take your time to figure out what is going wrong. Sonic's gonna keep it funky though. You see a Vigil, another operator that doesn't see all that much play in the professional leagues these days. Sometimes, of course, it can work. It can disrupt the droning presence. You don't exactly know where he is. He cannot be tracked by Deimos either, which Beast Coast did play in their, in their first attacking round. So a couple of benefits here. But no benefits towards Monty, who happens to be the main factor for the attack of Beast Coast in this round as well. This IT wall, as we have come to expect, is an incredibly big focal point for both teams. It was defended aggressively by Beast Coast, and now it's Sonic's turn to do that with... Adam just looking for one of those kill holes to provide him a window against his opponents. Merc losing the mirror window now. Not too far removed from Catwalk, not too far removed from where the Mavving was done. Sonics look like they've fallen off of IT. Hmm. Bit of a standstill right now. But again, it's just Beast Coast ensuring that they, again, they don't get picked off by any surprises. They're waiting for Spirits to kind of advance the Catwalk Rafters, checking the window, okay, he's gonna rotate. And that's half the round gone, but the thing is, once the action starts, a lot will happen very quickly. And this time, there's no smoke on defense. So there's no like real counter to Monty here. Seafall gets tossed out. Snoop like it might actually take out Spirits, but no. Bug walks in, Gunner dies as well. Tiukas finds one and a half kill in this round and shutting down that initial push. 
This really just is a defender oh. side of Nighthaven Labs. At this point, down goes Spirits. The shield dropped. What could have been the best thing going for Beast Coast is no more. The experience of hot and cold will carry them forward. Beast Coast still having multiple threats as Geo dies. Geo has been the lowest performing player on Sonics. Not all hope is lost. Rexon on a very different role this time around, playing more aggressively. Takes out Gavin. Diffuser eliminating Ambi. Now Diffuser looking for more than just the eight kills he has. Hoping to break double digits before this matchup is done with the way the last two rounds have went. I would imagine we are in for a much longer haul. That 6-0 from Beast Coast feels like it could have been an hour ago at this point. Merc now sitting inside a garage warehouse, if you want to call it that, as the Chubarau of Adam swings and Sonics have won three in a row. This looks like it'll be a tactical timeout for Beast Coast, I have to imagine. Oh, that's got to be the angle at this point, because now it's like, okay, now we got to tighten up. It's almost like watching OHD earlier, but okay, guys, we're winning. Wait, wait, we're kind of losing. Oh, now we're really losing. So, yep, there it is. It took a time out for Beast Coast. The, we're going to do the exo ISO, okay? Kitchen, the kitchen, we're going to clear kitchen down into the exo plant. Heard? Um, right. Yeah, listen, right. I want, I want D to look for like the site hit every single round. For for the next round on CCTV, I want us to do the garage, same exact garage push, but then D comes over from splits, or from couch aside, okay? Heard? And then storage, right. same basement. thing. Run the garage ISO one more time. They're all gonna stack up upon us. And then I want D going through basement up exo stairs from game side over, okay? I want, because the thing is, they're all gonna get pulled to our main push, and then we're gonna have the lurk hit the back. Honestly, give D the fucking diffuser, and then we fake this ISO, and then D can plant on the other side if we really want, okay? I don't think we do that. You you want him to plant like... Yeah. That, that is a crazy call at the end there. It's like, give D's diffuser, give diffuser... Oh, that, yeah, that's why they call him D, I guess. Give D the diffuser, yeah, because diffuser is diffuser. Give D the diffuser and make him plant on the other side. Like... That's not really a thing that we do in Siege, where... Did I not hear you do like a, we don't want to do that? Yeah, and then, exactly, the player then said, I don't think we want to do that. And that's because, like, that's kind of an outrageous thing to say. Like, if you're going to make comparison to other games, that's something you might see in Counter-Strike, for example, right? You fake A, you plant B, whatever. It's fine. You don't do that in Siege. The bomb sites are very close together. When you commit to something, it's hard to rotate, and you don't set yourself up for a strong postman position. So... The fact that the player responded back saying, we all don't think we want to do that. I like it. There's a little backbone there on the player lineup saying, yeah, good idea. Thank you. Let's take the first part that you said and just not do the diffuser part. That's fine. Because I do think that the first part was excellent. Again, go for that Garrett's catwalk take, but a small adaptation. Go for a flank somewhere else to apply pressure. Catch them off guard. Just, you know, diffuser has to go to the main execute. Please, God, otherwise it's going to be bad. Big risk. Obviously don't know the sound of everybody's voice, but that did sound like Fett, the coach for Beast Coast. Yes, yes. It's true. Sometimes what the coach wants you to do is not what the team wants to do, and sometimes it's not the most optimal thing. It also depends on how the players are feeling. I suppose this is your insight that I could, you know, I suppose this is your moment where I could gain some insight. How often would you take a timeout where Shas would suggest something and the team would ultimately decide to do something else? I think early on, Shas would often come with ideas and he would kind of either get shut down or mid halfway. And as time progressed, there'd be a rarity that Shas would come in. Also because you want your players to be able to problem solve yourself, not rely on your coaching staff for that single tactical timeout because the coach is not in the server. They don't know exactly what it's like to be a player unless they were from a player themselves. Beast goes, they talk about their approach, they talk about the strat, and an important operator dies early. It's Deimos, that, you know, roam hunter for intel, no longer in play. But yeah, from my experience, it's not all that common that coaches come in with that input. It should be up to the players who figure this out and decide. The IGLs, the leaders, the more experienced, you know, veteran players in the roster, which Beast goes, they do have, you know? You do have somebody like Hot and Cold who's got a lot of experience, who can be like, guys, this is what we're going to do. And he's always in the server because he's a player. It's just really where it comes down to leadership, right? Oh, oh. Sonics, though, slaughtering Beast Coast. We are on a collision course with two dueling 6-6 six, six halves. Bomb located by attackers. 
No mm. sight seemingly working for Beast Coast. No strategy seemingly working for them at this point. Defenders having their way with wait a this second. map. But wait a moment, wait a moment, wait a moment. Gavin holding down is hot and cold. Gets the plant down successfully. Three players from Beast Coast in the post plant, what? and they can easily sit outside. I might have spoken too soon. Again, eating my words, it seems to be the meal of the day, doesn't it? Hotton post up in this spot, swung around, down goes Ambi, only good enough for one kill. Merc finds his second. Again, the troubling prospect for SQ. Defenders of Beast Coast, or the defenders will now have to engage with Beast Coast outside. Merc sitting on that diffuser. Beast Coast don't seem to know this. Merc peels off at the last second. Diffuser above it, it's Gavin to save the day and stop the scare that was ongoing through that second half. East Coast <laughs> desperately needed some points and they find it as Gunner gets revenge on his old squad. Damn, again, when you're up in so, in so many round counts on the side of Beast Coast, you can just somewhere steal that final round that you need, and it did just that. It was okay. That, that attack didn't work either. They lose players early. They can't get a plan down, surely. All of a sudden, Hot and Cold's in the bomb site, putting down that diffuser, postman above, outside the main breach, Hot and Cold gets a second kill, and just like that, Beast Coast, they actually win and surprise everybody, especially going up 6-0. I didn't expect Beast Coast's first win to look like that, frankly. Oh. I figured this would be a very scrappy matchup against another team that was closer towards the bottom of the standings. But that's not what we got today. We got a very dominant first half where Sonics looked like it took them seven rounds to spawn into this matchup. But when they spawned in, they played far better than I anticipated. This is one of the most unpredictable games that we've seen here in the North America League in a long time. And it's Beast Coast who ultimately walk away with three big points. Defense, baby. It came down to defense. And I gotta say, Beast Coast today look great on the defensive side, but they still got a lot of work to do on the attack. And of course, the new rosters, that's the expected outcome as well. Attacking is just more difficult. It takes more time to learn. A single attacking round victory is all it took. That's it. Just one round on attack. It seems easy, but nothing good in life comes easy, right? Three points on the day, that's pretty good. That's it for that matchup. We still got more to go. Break's ready for you. We'll be back in a couple minutes.
Well, coming into today, the big question mark was, was Beast Coast able to find the keys to put into the car? And they did. Not only did the engine rev up, but it went really, really fast at the very start, and they won the race almost before it had a chance to get going. Both of the winless streaks are now gone in the North American League, and unfortunately for the Sonics, the one that Beast Coast had at the start of the day is over at their hands. That's a 7-3 on Night Haven. I mean, we were worried about the map pick originally. They had that thing down to a science on defense. Yeah, I definitely was, and I discredited him. I said that this was a map that I don't think they should go to. Now, I don't have a lot of time on the desk to talk about certain things, but I was going to say, on that back end, this is a map where they are brand new. SQ isn't going to know what they're doing, so they could try to throw SQ for a loop, and I think that's exactly what got displayed here. SQ looked very discombobulated on how to approach those defenses, and East Coast played it beautifully. And it almost looked at the end like we were about to have a tale of two halves where both teams wouldn't be able to win a single attack. But really what it came down to is when uh, Sonics were going in their attack, they took their attack time out after three, couldn't figure out the adaptations, couldn't get around it, couldn't find some way to attack. Then we see Beast Coast, they lose three in a row, they take the attack time out, they're able to turn it around, they're able to make that happen. So, you know, I, maybe I think the pressure was a little bit different between these two teams. Obviously, Beast Coast, Beast Coast knew the whole time we only got to win one, which maybe helped them focus a little bit uh, tighter on what they had to do. Um, but honestly, like, I, I really do think that Beast Coast being able to win all six of those defenses was super, super impressive, and I'm glad we're seeing that improvement from them week to week. Definitely. I mean, the improvement is a huge step up in the right direction now. It's just a matter of keeping that consistency going forward and taking possibly from this game. Sure, it is Night Haven specifically, yep. but what were they doing correctly? What were they implementing into their strats, into their play style, into their teamwork that was helping them find that success outside of it just coming off of Night Haven alone? That's a great question, Laxing. You're the analyst. Why don't you tell us? <laughs> well, what worked out so well? It's overall, I mean, just their positioning. They were forcing gunfights. They were forcing SQ to play unwinnable positions, not allowing them to get those trades. And there were positions that we even saw. It was like, had they swung a little sooner, they would have even been up more in a man advantage. Mm -hmm. But they were, they were just playing it perfectly, the best way that you can explain that overall. And I think that came down to SQ not being able to quickly identify that and learn, okay, maybe this is what we need to be droning. Maybe this is what we need to be taking. Yeah. We're more like spearheading and instead of trying to figure out really how to work the map, how to work into the site and use that against LG. LG? I mean, <laughs> all these all these different <laughs> names, Beast Coast, BC. Sorry, Everybody Beast has their Coast. own acronym. Sometimes it's a bit confusing too. It also made me wonder, it's, an, it's Night Haven and we were worried about the pick just because Beast Coast didn't have that much history on really any map, so why pick a map that isn't really like a comfort one? But they also had defense first and we know Night Haven can be a pain to attack sometimes, yeah. so because they knew they had that site, maybe that led them into thinking it was a good one? Like, yeah, I mean, in either case, like clearly it was the right map choice for them and we don't know what they're screaming, we don't know what their setups are like behind the scenes, so ultimately, like, uh, this was a great map for them. Sonics went into it a little bit blind and I think that ends up punishing them. I want to talk to Gunner real quick because we haven't had the chance to talk to the guys on Beast Coast at all leading into today. So, dude, if you can hear me, it's really good to finally see you, brother. I'm sorry it took so long, but it's good that we finally got you on the horn now. Walk me through what these last few weeks have been like for Beast Coast and why this week was so different from last week for you guys. Um, I mean, the last few weeks have been crazy. Um, it was a lot of just, like, trying to figure out. I mean, we've never played with each other. We've never teamed with each other. We're all just, like... We all had like different ideas coming in, you know, we've been on every single person that's been on a team except for Diffuser that's been to a major and, you know, we think this works, we think that works. But it was really about this week just coming together and just like, okay, this is what we want to do. Because like the scores were pretty bad uh, last week, like it, like it looks like we got dogs, but like, um, I mean, we're better than that. And uh, it was, honestly, it wasn't a matter of like how skillful we are or how this, it really just came down to trusting in uh, Matt my glorious king <laughs> and um and honestly just you know playing together calming well you know not taking the unnecessary fights not taking the ego channels just making teams feel uncomfortable and uh making us feel comfortable and i i think today on defense like we were really comfortable a little bit shaky on the attacks but that's how my haven goes so hey well congratulations know. on that win nonetheless i mean i was talking in the post game of that well the pre-game of this is you guys were having an identity crisis and you just literally said it there is you guys all have your own version of how you want to play siege your own vision and then you guys said that you came here today and implemented that was that specifically your thought process of night haven alone for that map specific or is this kind of just now the ongoing forward for whatever map this is going to be for the rest of the stage um, no, so the way we decided was just like, um, you know, Hankold, that's our, that's team leader. That's so king. <laughs> yeah. Whatever you, 
Whatever you, we were not, I'm not even a part of the map fans anymore. I, I don't even care. I was on my bed watching TikTok and then I started playing this map. I said, okay, I trust you. <laughs> and, um, you know, we just, like, honestly, we just came to play. Whatever map, whatever map he's feeling that day, whatever he thinks we're playing, like, that's what we're going to do. And, um, that way there's no, like, oh, we should have done this. Oh, oh but magic, we picked this map. No, it's just like, we came, you know, we, we felt like this was the map and, I mean, it, it was the map. Yeah. So, um, Honestly, it's really just straight up about just like finding our identity, which yep. I think we're getting closer and closer to every day, and just playing comfortable, playing loose, having fun. Gunner, there's a jersey on the wall behind you right now, and it's not the jersey of the team you're currently on. Oh! <laughs> oh! Okay. Oh, no, no. Whoa, whoa, what happened? Okay. It almost looked like you Wait, ripped it. Did it, it just rip? <laughs> did it tear? No, no, no. What happened, it's dude? On, it dude, was on like wrong. a magnet. I see. Okay. Well, I have a two part question for you about that jersey. Number one, how good does it feel to be able to take down Sonics? after they, you know, removed you from the roster? And number two, did your insight from playing on the team contribute much to the preparation in this game? Or as you said, is it all just listen to, the, listen to the team leaders, they know best? No, honestly, that's a whole new team. I mean, I could say like what we struggled with, but like there's only two guys and Richie's on <laughs> yeah. like support now and stuff. So like I told him, they're like, yo, like what, you know, what are they doing? Like, I do not say, I listen, don't listen to me. I don't know. I, I literally don't know. <laughs> that's not the same team. Yeah, fair enough, so, though. Oh, yeah. Feels good, though, MS, beating your old team? Oh, yeah. <laughs> nice. <laughs> he doesn't need to say anything else. One more question for you, dude. Just out of curiosity, how is it like having Fed as a coach? Fed's a crazy guy. I love Fed. He's a... Uh... <laughs> Like, I, mean, I don't even know. He had to build like a whole new roster up from scratch. So what's the process been w working with somebody who I think has, has middling results in NAL sta standing so far? Just w what's it like working with the guy? I love working with him. I mean, he's a hard, he's a hard worker, like straight up. He's a hard worker. And he, you know, at first, you know, it's like, like I said, it was a bunch of ideas, but he just like, he basically said, hey, let's listen to him. He thought this would be the best. And like, you know, he's a smart guy and he's, he really deserves a lot of credit. Well, everything on Beast Coast just seems like it's a game of trust for you guys at this point. Congratulations on the win. I'm sure it had to feel really good going up against Sonics, and we'll see you in the next one. All right, dude? Thank you. Hopefully we get him back in the interview chair at some point relatively soon. It's got to feel good for those guys. But if you're Sonics right now, it's been up and down the whole way. Has it been, I may be wrong on this, loss, win, loss, win, loss? So it's literally like every other game has been the other result at this point? Pretty, pretty much, yeah. I think that's what it's been. Let, it me, feels, let me check. It, it feels like that. I mean, regardless, it's been such a roller coaster yeah, for the team. It's been win, loss, win, loss. So, so I mean. Win, loss, win, loss. Yeah, no, you're right, you're right. And I think a lot of the losses in the past have looked like, okay, you know what? Sonics, they may have lost to this team, but at the end of the day, they still look really good. You know, there, there were some rounds that were very, very close. They absolutely could have won that game. We're looking at this match, we're not saying that. Like, Sonics lost this game start to finish. You go down 0 06, uh, even though your defense has started to look pretty good, I'm sorry, you're just not coming back from that. No, it, and it didn't look like even into the mid to late round adaptation. Yeah. They just weren't there. It was just like, okay, well, we're just being met by this Beast Coast roster. I mean, let's just fight it and just losing it in all those fronts. It didn't didn't look like any adapting was happening at the time. Yeah, and I mean, I think it came down to like, what did they expect to see for Beast Coast versus what did they actually see from Beast Coast? Because we heard it even in the tag timeout, Goddess or, or somebody on the team said something along the lines of, you know, these guys, they're going to swing you when they go down. They're going to get aggressive. Be sure to watch for that. And then we hear Gunnar talking in the interview. He's like, wow, we just need to not take these unnecessary swings. We need to fix some things on ourselves. We really improved. And so I think that kind of speaks to maybe the expectations Sonics had for the team they were going to be going up against versus the team they actually played today. And what I also like that he noticed is uh, that we talked about that identity crisis that he said mm -hmm. they were all coming together. They were all having ideas, but then it just came down to Matt. If that if Matt's the final call now and that's the one that's going to be listened to, that is important because as much as everyone has amazing ideas or amazing strats, everyone has to be on the same page. And that's what makes a team a team is when everyone is on the same page, not everyone being in a completely different area trying to play their own game of Siege. Well, for Beast Coast, they still have enough time to be able to lick their wounds and figure out some of those problems from earlier. And they did a good job of that. They're now up in sixth place as a result of that victory. So for them, three points makes a huge difference. But now they're also competing with Los around 50 fifth to sixth place because of where those points lie. For Sonics, they're still in fourth, not the end of the world, but they've now played more than half of their regular season stage so far, so they will need to pick things up, keep their foot on the gas, and ensure that they can get a good seed. Otherwise, they might run into some problems when they get to playoffs, if they do. But for the rest of the day, only one game left to go, and it's between two teams who've already played and already lost today, Luminosity and Dark Zero, after the break.
The good news about both teams in this game having lost earlier today is someone has to end their day with a win. The bad news is the other team will end their play day having run, run the treadmill and gone basically nowhere. Our last game of the day, a reschedule from play day one, will see DZ and LG go off and one of them will go 0 for 2 on the day. That's kind of the only state you really need to worry about. Points be damned, where you fit in the standings be damned. If you lose two games on the day, in one day, that is probably the worst feeling you can have, especially in a best of one scenario. Yeah, it's definitely not a tough, I mean, it's not a great situation to be in by any means, especially you're coming up on almost playing half of your games. You need these wins nonetheless. But what's what, another important thing to take from this though, coming from an LG standpoint, being able to play back-to-back -back games like this, does set you up for success in some regard because when you get to LAN, you might have to be playing games back to back. You're gonna have to be doing these games one right after the other. So it's yeah. a matter, it gives you that little bit of testament and gives you a little bit of that experience because they don't have that LAN experience. So it could be a good start for LG. 
And for me, I mean, this is just a Dark Zero proving ground game. Like, if you are losing this game, your second match of the day, up against Luminosity, I I'm starting to ring the alarm bells. We, start, we said at the very start of the day that for DZ, whilst their start wasn't what they wanted, it's not the end of the world because we're early into the groups. We still got playoffs to deal with. Now we're not so early into the groups anymore. DZ played two today. They lose both of them. They're all of a sudden in a horrible spot for the standings. Both of them at this point, to your exact mention, have played half of their stage already at this point. This is their fifth game. Again, LG might have had a good streak going for a little bit, but Dark Zero have never had a streak. They got that one win. It was an overtime dub, so even they have struggled for all the points they've got and currently DZ for their own part sit in eighth place in the standings as of right now they could jump up as high as maybe fifth or sixth but it's going to take a long hard slog against LG today to get there yeah, I mean, looking at the roster entirely, I really, really want to be seeing NJR really step up into where we see him in that spotlight because we haven't really been seeing him in that spotlight all through this stage. And we need to be seeing that from him because he is such a pivotal piece for DZ and not having that, I think, is truly affecting them. Yeah, and I mean, for NJR, like, historically, he's been so consistent. This is the first time that we've ever seen him really go negative through a stage of the NAL. He had one stage, like, three years ago on Disrupt Gaming where he went minus two overall. This stage, he's been, I don't know, minus 11 at the start of the day, I want to say. So he's been really, really struggling so far for Dark Zero. For me, it just feels like he's he's getting caught out of position a lot. It feels like, whereas usually he's able to kind of predict where people are going to be, and he's always ready for what the push is going to be, especially on defense. There have been so many times throughout this stage so far where NGR just looks kind of lost. Like, he doesn't have the full picture. I don't know if that's him getting a little bit lost, or if that's maybe his teammates not calming to him properly. I don't know what it is, but this is not the NGR I'm used to seeing, and I don't like it. Which is a problem because you want the guy who was the top rated player from the Invitational to sort of keep that streak going. Citizen maybe has done that as num number three going to a matey, and there's some success brewing with that, that M80 squad, but it's not been the same for guys like NJ. And it's we don't want to unfairly put the guy under a microscope, but when you're that good for such a long stretch and then have a stage like this, it's a notable thing we should talk about for sure. Yeah, and so, I mean, there's, there's other people to, to, to step it up to for Dark Zero. It's definitely a team issue. You don't get this far down as Dark Zero have from one person. But yeah, I mean, something to work on. No, everyone on the team really does have to excel. I only emphasize NJR because he has been a huge performer for DZ and his yeah. name that you constantly heard about. But yeah, it does come down to everyone else, whether that's Troy making different calls, making different adaptations. I mean, we've seen, like I said, what I want to see from DZ is just being a little more jumping around, not being so structured. I think we'd, they'd see a little more success to some degree. Their loss was in game two against M80 on Skyscraper. Luminosity's loss was to OXG, and just about an hour later, 5-7 on Clubhouse. And there were more redeemable qualities about that DZ game than the LG one, because I think, again, it can be argued, a lot of the rounds they got at the end, that was a comeback that really didn't have many legs under it. I mean, yeah, I'll, I mean, I'll, I'll say that. I mean, I thought it was going to be a 7-1. It was going to be swift. That was going to be it. I mean, it looked still, like you wouldn't be blamed for thinking that. Absolutely. And But that's also to credit LG. They didn't they didn't give up. They kept fighting, even if they were at the back foot. And that is important for a brand new team that you can be down that hard and yeah. make that comeback. Like, that shows a lot of tenacity, just a lot of resilience in that case. But still, to, to, to learn from that game, a lot of those mistakes, I won't even say they were, they were mistakes. OXG was just playing extremely well and playing a really good game of Siege. We had a graphic that we wanted prepped because we thought maybe Hat would have a really good performance in, in the game that he just played to compare it against his performance against M80 on Skyscraper. But regrettably, that's not going to look nearly as good now because for as much as we want to highlight the reasons why he won in that M80 game, it, it was just a really slow slide for him in that OXG matchup. Yeah, I mean, Hat is the guy who got them their big upset, right? The story for LG last week was they beat M80, one of the top teams in North America right now, and he had a fantastic performance to do that 16 and 7 181 EPS he was absent in their first game of the day 50% cost half of the rounds he's having zero impact and then the other half I mean yeah he's getting kills here and there but he just wasn't an impactful player one of these rounds he's lighting his teammates on fire when they're trying to go for the plants and yeah they won that round but I'm still looking at this guy as a player who uh, has so much potential who mechanically is an insanely talented guy but also just isn't hitting that consistently enough. So for me, if they're gonna beat Dark Zero, if they're gonna finally come back, get a win on the day, he's gotta be another one to step up because he's the one who did it against M80. And for his team, they are attacking first. The map for game five is Chalet. Thoughts? Well, this is 
DZ is one of their favorite maps. They they love this map. It's a map that really does heavily play into their style of siege specifically. It's very constrictive in certain sites on the defense and that you can pressure from the attack side. But it goes into that if DZ can actually find their footing on attacks because they weren't finding their footing on attacks versus M80, which is why they fell short. Yeah, Chalet, probably one of Dark Zero's best maps at the Six Invitational. A 7-5 loss to G2 and then a 7-5 win over Virtus Pro. Two top four teams to go 12 rounds against both of them is very impressive. The problem is because of how DZ's been struggling so much, is Fox A going with DZ the second time on the day? Because he went with DZ even though M80 beat them on Skyscraper earlier in the day. Is that prediction a sure thing? Is picking the team that's historically been better with the bigger names on it the wise pick here? Guys, now's your chance to go with the underdog if you you, you know what? It's the last game of the day. LG have shown a lot of tenacity and resilience. I'm just going to say LG. Even if this is DZ's wow. best map, I'm going to say LG. That's uh, that's talk of a guy who's out of the running for that belt over <laughs> He's, <laughs> only, he's only 6% zero. behind you, though. He's not that I'm far gonna, behind. I'm going to say LG. Just, just, you know. OK. To, to, to be clear, he's saying LG even though the graphic says Dark Zero in this case. Yeah. Just to clarify. There, there we, go. we go. Hey, good stuff. And you're sticking with DZ? Yeah, I think Dark Zero is a strong map for them. Uh, it's not out of the question for this to be an upset. This is definitely a possibly winnable game for LG. They could do it, but I think Dark Zero are the better squad. I think they'll win this one. All right, well, this is the opportunity that Laxing has been waiting for to jump up the standings a little bit or to catch to up with his compatriots, even or just it. keep sinking even lower. We'll find out as game five rolls on, and I have no idea how this one's about to go. Parker and Pengu with the call. I would have put really good money on DZ winning this matchup, but then I saw DZ play today, and now I don't think that's really the case anymore. Then I saw LG play today, and oh, I don't no. know if that's really the case anymore either. So I'm kind of with Jacob on this one. I have no idea what's going to happen, but my speculation is that this is going to be a close match, Nick. You say that like, you know, it's for all the wrong reasons. And I'm kind of with you there where if both teams have a weak performance, yeah, we can go overtime for all we want. But do we really want to see an overtime game that is like a sloppy one? I don't know. I want to see a clean siege. We, we really have not seen a lot of, of overtime period in Rainbow Six so far this stage. And here in the North America League, we haven't seen a lot of it either. There's been the odd game here or there, but yeah. it's been relatively clean cut victories for these teams. We'll go to Chalet for the very first time today to cap off our play day. And well, community seems to think the Dark Zero has it in the bag. There is a, uh, I think the community might have this one right in terms of who has the most potential to win. I think DZ yeah. has the greater upside but again, both of the matches today were quite ugly. DZ had some very poor rounds against M80. LG had some exceptionally poor rounds against OXG. So it's, I believe the official term is a crapshoot. This is a crapshoot, Nick. It's a crapshoot, okay. Well, both teams had a small break, of course, before heading into this. So I would really hope that this is like a big reset point, you know, approaches with a new set of eyes, all the game that happened earlier today. And they also played the map, like we're going to Chalet. So I think already that is a positive side for both teams because when you have played a map earlier and your opponent kind of sat there and prepped for it, watched the back, you know, in the, in the meantime, you don't want to go straight back to it. You've already struggled. There are some bad voodoo. There are some bad emotions attached to it. Go somewhere else. Now, Chalet is a map where I think, again, I think both teams can do well here. Yeah, okay, DC is expected to win. But I, I think Jesse's right in the sense that there could be a potential upset. I do think, however, it comes down to whether or not a player like Hat is going to show up. Where he finds those kills. Where he actually has like a pop-off game. Because what DC is good at is playing a disciplined, more like laid-back, slow, methodical playstyle. And if attackers are not aggressive into that, you're not going to advance anywhere in the map. So when you see LG come out swinging... And I mean, they're attacker repicking right now. They might change it. There's still 20 seconds left, but this is definitely, if they stick this lineup, coming out swinging. The glass, the sense, the capital on a dining execute. It's one of those things that can be over in like 60 seconds from when they spawn into the server. It's a Canadian on Capcan. Of course, you go too quick and those EDs are at the door. You can't get injured or outright killed immediately. But that's just one small thing you gotta do to check before, of course, running through that door. There's a couple things here that I wanted to touch upon. 
Uh, when you look okay. at Luminosity, maybe Luminosity will take some umbrage with the statement I'm about to make, but, I mean, Hat Ooh. is, to me, their largest offensive threat. If he's not showing up, then Luminosity will have some difficulties in the killing department. The other thing I want to touch upon is the Soulless ban. I don't necessarily think Canadian was very effective on Soulless in the first match that DZ played today. Yet, you take the Soulless out of the equation. Obviously, on a map like Chalet, where a lot of these floors can be shot through, Solus is going to have immense value, and we'll see these objectives coming, and we'll see the plant coming. Dark Zero will now need to make some small changes because they won't have that intel at their disposal. All as I was saying this, by the way, LG getting a very good look at the bomb site as they are effectively in it in the first 45 <laughs> seconds of the round. DZ have but a uh... single player to hold against the tides, and that's NJR. Just not far removed from the bomb chassis, prone on the ground with an ACOG in hand. That's awkward. Like, they rushed Trophy. They didn't rush the bomb site. They rushed the room next to it. Now they're stalling out. DC, again, they understand the mission. They're playing four people vertically, one person on the side, and that single person has killed the glass. That's the win con. That's what the entire strat was built around, the smokes to enable the glass, to get some kills, to get a plan. Now they gotta pivot. They gotta go elsewhere and figure it out, but they don't. NGR finds a second kill in this round. He is locking down the side, being an anchor player. Actually quite impressive that Dark Zero is pulling this off without a warden on the board, and I mean, I think yep. that... Kind of goes into the fact that Luminosity took advantage of that. See that there's nobody to really counter you. If there's no bulletproof cams. If there's no evil eye cams that you need to worry about, then sure, run your smokes. But there are two bulletproof cams on the side of Dark Zero, and maybe those are partially responsible for the drubbing that DZ is giving Luminosity, at least to start this round. The round will be over within the minute, but Luminosity's got some kills to find if they want to come out on the right side of it. Silent and Wi Fi are the only remaining players from LG. NJR pays for his crimes inside of dining. Gets killed. Luminosity still basically have full control of this bomb site. We've been so focused on what's going on in the bomb site that we haven't even seen the other four players from DZ who are spread out all over the matchup. Silent with yet another kill. Numbers will close to equal, but still favor DZ. Wi-Fi will walk that diffuser, and there's been plenty of time to get the case down. I don't know if they're just worried about intel or what. Oh. There's a long angle from Nafe to eliminate Wi-Fi diffuser picked up by Silent, but there's almost no chance that a flashing red HP Ash is going to be able to get that diffuser down without somebody from DZ seeing it. Nafe spots the last two players from LG, and he gives DZ a much-needed win. I'm curious what exactly happened from LG, if it was they didn't fully understand the site setup, maybe they expected Dark Zero to defend it differently. Because again, like they rushed in super decisively into trophy and then they stood still. And then nothing happened. I'm sure Glass dying early on, of course, that made them, you know, be forced into like going on to a different attacking approach. But still, before when Glass was alive, they didn't really progress anywhere. Either way. They try and set the pace, they try and take control of the round, it does not work against DC in that particular case. Now, if that quote-unquote rush had worked, that would be a massively, like, highly successful round for the attacking side because it forces DC to kind of change their game approach. If you get rushed against in a very early, like, couple of rounds, first, second, third, you're not going to be afraid of extending too much. For example, right now, DC are playing bar. They're gonna play library, they're gonna play master bedroom office, they're gonna try and spread themselves as thin as possible and control as much of the map as possible in the beginning of the round. Look at the lineups. Nave and Bolo towards kitchen, Pepper swap inside of office master bedroom. It makes sense. Had LG rushed last round and won, like let's say flawlessly for example, they probably wouldn't dare to extend like that in fear of another bombsite rush. So small things like that can play a factor into the mentality of like how teams they will play defense because they have certain fears. I like the cap gun again, sitting up for those passive rushes. Canadian playing a basement. And he said, oh. <laughs> um, the solo, as you said, wasn't the most successful. I would have to agree. But LG want those prep phase drones to be guaranteed going into the building or at the very least stay alive for longer. And the solo span ensures that. Canadian plays the kite instead. He dies early on for the Maverick hole and Dark Seer will play a 4v5 this round. Not good when your team leader is the one that's dying early, especially on the Kaid playing downstairs, but maybe he wasn't expecting Wi-Fi to poke some holes and 
have LG take advantage of that sight line and potentially out of position Kaid of Canadian down there. We will now spectate the operator he played the previous round, which was Capkin. <laughs> and JR post up close to the window in games as there goes that back bar wall. It's a very common spot to Maverick, by the way. You get in, you cut out the bottom of it so that anybody who plays in lobby or even plays down below can easily see your feet. Maybe not lobby, but at least the stairs. Thank you very much, easy. It basically You're means right. you can't play back bar with relative safety that you expect to. I mean, if they clear NGR, they can plant by default. Just jump in the big windows. That's the big thing. And the, the anchor play from NGR saved DC last time. It has to save them now as well. The other player positions are not very strong to help him. So it really comes down to what can LG do here? Flash is going in. Tackle NJR. Vault in. Why not? Eddie looking for that pick, but... This is stuck. NJR still there. There's no follow-up from LG onto the feet. Kick throw, jumps into the fray. Down goes NJR, and Eddie will have a safe plant as Bolo walks in, kills Eddie. Diffuser does actually not go down. It was so, so oh. close. But Luminosity's guns will find their marks as DZ looks for a retake. Nave three kills, zero deaths. Make that three kills, one death. Hat finishing that round, tying things up one to one. Sometimes simple is good, and that was a pretty straightforward simple attack around 4LG. And I do think that them getting the early counter Canadian does play a big factor in that. DC had less map control, less map presence, and of course, often when teams lose a player early, they're gonna play a little bit further back and not try and risk losing another member. Because playing 3v5 is like this doomsday, basically. But yeah, it's a very simple strat where you go basement, you marry the bottom line, then you get stock control, then you go side window and library balcony, and you can just jump into side. It's that simple. The only obstacle was NGR. He was forced back by the flashbang to plant out of stock, and then we saw those Maverick holes come into play. He got shot from the basement staircase. They jump in, they plant, they trade with Bolo, whatever. But the plant goes down eventually. The round is successful. And I will say, LG, despite not working the first time, they try it again. Not as full commitment to like the sense and the glass and those kinds of operators, but still that like, okay, let's just hit the side directly and not have to worry about the roam clear. Because it is hard to roam clear a Dark Zero team who's literally playing every floor and pretty much every single room across the map. Earlier, last round, Kidian died, and you just mentioned how like it's not giving you a captain and leader dies, etc. You can actually make the argument that it's it's the best case outcome that your captain dies, right? Because at least it's a useful person in the sense of leadership. And it's, I, I believe that's why Troy plays those kind of front and forward roles. A lot of IGLs and, and you know leaders they will play. No, the anchor position defense playing on the bomb side. They'll play a hard on attack, droning the entire round. Canadian likes to play in the battle. You know, roaming with poles, Valkyrie, Solas, whatever. And if he dies early, he can still have a lot of impact in the round by having full overview, watching all the cameras, all the other four player perspectives, and making the calls happen there. So when people they look at this host and go, why is Naif not playing this operator? Why is NGR not playing this operator? Why is Troy playing these fun operators? That's often why, at least last time I spoke to Troy, that was the case. And I, I'm not sure if this is if this is public knowledge, but eh, I don't really care. I talked to <laughs> Troy shortly before SI, and one of the reasons why Naif was picked up was so that they could both call different parts of the match. Mm. Naif was, as far as I can remember, was the defense IGL, and Canadian would be calling most of the time on attack. Maybe that's okay. swapped. Maybe it's changed, I'm not entirely sure, but I mean, a big part of why you brought a player like Naif over is because he can give you that vantage point that Troy doesn't have on his own. Wi-Fi dies and Kicks Row is gonna sprint into action. He sees the Maestro, flashed out, NJR dies, and now Kicks Row over towards Connector as LG have found two very fast kills. Dark Zero just continues to reduce those numbers. Just distill them down until Kicks Row's last in the bomb site. Fuser within arm's reach, but that's not the focus for Kicks Row at this point. The focus, determine where these last players are before you go about the objective or getting kills because the problem is what a shot oh. by Kicks Row that you don't think you can plant until you have that information. LG struggled in the first round. Now DZ will scramble as they are desperate to get a line of sight onto the ace. Diffuser down, Kicks Row with three kills to his name. 
don't know if that cam can see him or not. He's got the sidearm out. Why the sidearm? Why not just reload? There's a go out from above. Nafe dies. Kickstrap might be able to pull this off, right? Nadian walking over, but the old oh. man can still shoot. You can see the look <laughs> on Troy's face that it does not come easy. LG close, but just a little bit too far. DZ win the round. Was that a Troy 1v1 clutch into an immediate face palm? That's what it looked like. And I mean, this also goes to like how much of a veteran Troy is. Like, that's a round win, that's a round clutch, but it shouldn't have been that close. That should have been like a stable save, like 3v1, crossfire, a trade, whatever. It comes down to a 1v1 post plan that is very messy from Dark Zero. And it's those kinds of things that we don't expect from them. We would expect LG to have those kind of like small issues like communication or teamwork or synergy. DC went to Invitationals, picking up Bolo and Nave. They looked phenomenal. They play NAL a couple of weeks after SI, and they have not looked like that same kind of team. They've kind of fallen short of expectations. Now, playing a LAN, different vibe. You know, some players, some teams, they just really show up on LAN. It's a whole different experience. But, Dark Seer, with that being said, I feel like we can expect more from them, realistically, because they are a good team, they do have a good roster, and they've already proved it. So these rounds being as close as they are, and the way that they're winning, and the way they're losing these rounds, it's not really a uh, confidence-inspiring look for DC at the moment, but I will say for LG, they're doing a great job at fighting it back every single round. Last round, basement, they go for a quick snappy execute. They know what they gotta do and get done. Flashbang, sprint deep, get the kills. It gets messy, but they show they know what it takes to problem solve the round that otherwise look very difficult. If memory serves me correctly, by the way, we saw some big value from the Brava in the previous round. They grabbed the evil eye cam that was inside the site that was instrumental in allowing them mm. to find Nafe. That was the, yeah. the Goyo, if I remember correctly, playing on the table by Hatch inside of dining. Yeah. You look up the lineup from Dark Zero, there's plenty that you can grab with that Kludge Drone. You just got to make sure the, club dr the Kludge Drone actually survives. Xro still has one remaining and will go on to it to try to gain some more intel, but just managed to get away at the feet of NJR, who's now taking some serious damage. Multiple players from DZ looking at Wi-Fi outside, oh. and it'll be Pambazoo to go for the jump out. As Troy Canadian had grabbed his attention over by Library, Smokes and Fire will go as Silent seeks an opening against Dark Zero. He manages to avoid the flames for the time being, but LG only have two drones remaining. Even with the Solus ban, that mute of Bolo providing so much value to DZ, denying LG tons of information. A nice wow. read by Silent, but Nafe just outduels him in that regard. x -Row and Eddie is the last two for LG. Everybody from DZ still alive. Yeah. They tried to hit the sides last time, they got shot down. Now they're trying to go for the room clear up above, they got shot down again. And then Discipline, DC, locked and loaded. Nave is baiting for Bolo, who's close left of this wall. The second, the, yep, there it is, oh, Bolo just swings. Triple man crossfire. Full discipline, full control for Dark Zero. Amazon needs to be retrieved, he's bleeding out. Very few flawless rounds so far in today's set of matches, but DZ are poised for one and they'll get Ouch. it. Ambazoo, whether he was picked up or whether he just simply survived based on the timer, DZ. Out to an early lead. That is such a strong bump set for DZ, though, they play it, honestly. And uh, LG a bit behind. They're gonna call their technical timeout? Question mark? Yep. Let's so leave so. They can't go down anymore, right? Just forget about that. They're gonna go uh, probably bar here now. They're probably gonna go back to the default where they just do the ward on top fire. Um, Let's just do our, you know, our clear where we take off the side. Let's make sure we're hydrating George over there. And then so we can, you know, set up for execute phase. Um, I think that's what we should do if they uh, go to their uh, bar defense, which they probably will. Um, for basement, if they do like that, you know, elbow extension, we were talking about, you know, doing a solo over take. So if we take the solo over take, you know, let's actually make sure we're setting up flanks above there. And let's make sure that, you know, we are in position to cut this guy off on the uh, hatch before he leaves, right? Um, and if they don't do that, it's fine. We can still do our, our back push because uh, we'll have ha uh, hatch control, which will set up. We'll, we'll be in a position to do our, you know, default plan, stuff like that. Okay. So that was obviously very strat specific, 
but in a way that I, I would say it presented options more so than like a hard deadline. It wasn't guys go for this, guys go for that. It's like guys, remember we can do this. I want to see a guy go into this position and then we also can have this option as well. And I like that because you're giving your players freedom to make their own decisions. And it's more of like a reminder of either what you've prepared, what you've practiced, or what you're not doing that you should be doing. But it doesn't feel like you're being forced into it. It allows that creative freedom and player control, which I think sometimes can be either over or underlooked by some supportive staff. And despite LG, you know, being down only two rounds, one to three, I don't think it's in the world for them. And the players obviously having some nice decisions in all these rounds with small things going the wrong way. So I'm pretty happy with what I heard. Five seconds to go. It's been really fascinating getting these listen-ins, and I know that Brazil does listen-ins as well. I, As much as the timeouts are intriguing to me, I actually like the listen-ins we've done when the executes have been happening. The cut and thrust to me is what I find more fascinating because I can imagine what strategizing sounds like when there's a timeout, but getting to hear how players articulate the next steps for their strategy is something that you just, you can't really replicate outside of hearing it yourself, right? People that, that yeah. watch this eSport that don't compete or haven't competed at this top level just frankly don't know what it sounds like. And it's a really good window into how teams go about tackling the problems. Or maybe not even a problem, maybe they're doing quite well in the round and it's just about next steps. And every team handles it differently. Some comms are quite crowded, some are frantic, some are quite relaxed, some are stressful. It's a nice, as you can say, a nice cross-section. And I'm sure we will get a mid-round listen-in between these two teams before the matchup ends. Certainly. That'll be the goal. This round has been relatively slow, but in a good way. It's the kind of slow round where you're progressing as an attacker, defenders are responding, you know, killing drones, falling back, killing drones, falling back, and everyone, like both teams, are kind of getting what they want out of this. DC are playing utility, right? They got the kite claw, the runicus, etc. They're trying to stall for time. But LG all saying, we are okay with that. We have Capital, Twitch, Flores, and Bravo. They have a lot of drone intensive operators. They're happy to play a slow round. They have a minute and 20 seconds. They're in library, got a good yellow ping read there, does a bit of damage onto NGR, but they need to deal with the Kite Claws. This is where Bravo and Twitch comes into play. But as far as I can tell, they don't have either of those drones available. So Eddie on the Flores might need to be the hero now. If they don't get the Kite Claws, the Hedges library will not get opened up. LG gets a kill instead. That's also good, but kick server is just inside the bomb site. It's been something that LG's had no problem with so far, Nick, is getting into the site, but what they yep. do with it is the greater problem, and Kixrow has been spotted out. He's losing the rest of his team. There's a team kill, in fact. Oh. That's the last one standing. Near sighted and running desperately towards the Aruni, but it's NJR to finish it, and I don't know if that was frustration from Silent or not, but even after the timeout. DZ, right now, in the driver's seat of our final match of the day. It's all about the anchor play. Like, the, the anchors of Dark Zero, which has been MGR most rounds and sometimes Nave, they've just been so stable. And just in the desk spoke about it, saying, we want to see more consistency from NGR. And even though NGR is having a great time right now against LG, it's about consistency. It's not about if he does well this game or poorly this game. It's about how often he can do well. But for this particular matchup, NGR has been the player in my eyes to secure the majority of the rounds. The fact that he doesn't die early on the side and something happens around him usually is a really good sign that things are going well for Dark Zero. And funny enough, the one round loss for DC was the round where NGR died very easily. That was that bar defense earlier on where he was playing Capcan. He died from the Mavericles, leading from the basement into bar. So... Very, very big, like, kind of uh, things to consider there. If NGR dies, Bombsat likely falls. If he stays alive or gets traded, Bombsat stays alive. Well, Dark Zero taking a commanding lead so far, up 4-1. to one. Reloading. There's nothing even really noticeably wrong about Luminosity. I mean, what is this, three of the five rounds so far, Nick? Luminosity have been in the site very quickly. But question is, is what do they do with it? Because it seems like it's always one or two individuals from LG who managed to get in there. 
and not the rest of the team. And, and honestly, that's that's to be expected. It's unusual for a full team to be in the bomb site, and it's often actually quite bad for that to be the case. Hold on a sec. Is this... Did that manage to ice the wall? Oh, yeah. It, uh, it goes through the walls, baby, through the floor. So they can basically kite claw the bottom, they can they can like canister the top, and they can actively trick the wall of freezing it, if that's what they're gonna turn over for. The kite claws and the top, so, so is the canisters, it doesn't work in this case. It's a trade upstairs, injure for a kill harbor. Well, as we see Kicks Row being picked back up, we do indeed get a listening into the action. Blue tag, blue tag. I'm only, I'm only There's blue a big B on me. Fine, fine, fine. I got you. Okay. One dead. Blue dead, blue dead. 50. I'm only blue flank. 75. I'm blue flank. Calm down. He's in dining. 20 HP, 20 HP dining. He dropped, he dropped, he dropped. That's where? Yeah, I'm playing post outside. I'm playing post outside. Play post, play post. 20 HP. Let me kill him, let me kill him. Nice. Nice. Good job, guys. Good job. I didn't want to throw that, Eddie. I was a fucking one. <laughs> this is this is all your fault, by the way. This is Nick, all my Nick, fault. Nick and Nick and the production team have been going back and forth over when to call these listenings. And Nick has been predicting at the start of the round when he thinks executes will be coming in. And he said that he thought around maybe 145 ish would be the time. And he was unfortunately off by about 10 seconds. Nick, anything to say to your haters? You know. Sometimes it'd be like that. I am not the GOAT, I never was, I never will be, but I was close, okay? And that matters because I'm trying to guess when they're gonna do stuff before the round even starts. And I was only off by 10 seconds. I think that's a small victory, actually. But unfortunately, we didn't hear the setup for that round. That's what I wanna hear. That's why I try and aim for those kinds of timings. We wanna see shortly before they execute how they're talking, communicating, and how they're setting it up. Then we get to see the execute itself, and then we see the payoff. In that particular instance, I was off by 10 seconds, or we were off by 10 seconds. They were basically in the killing and in the planting when it occurred. But it's one of those small things. We're testing, we're trying to figure it out. We cannot predict the flow of the game. But what I did take away from that was that LG are having a lot of fun, despite being down in, in, in round score. They were saying, hey, give me the kill. Hey, you know, you got this, go swing this guy, whatever. So their spirits are still high. I don't know that's because they think they're going to do better on defense, perhaps, or whatever it is. But it sounded good from LG, and again, it's important to have fun. Just an interesting listen as well as how different those comms were. I, obviously, I don't want to throw shade Luminosity's way, but from all the oh. listens we've had so far, they did seem like probably the least structured calls of the teams. And I mean, even the positioning uh, where Bola was when he dropped, the calls were he's one HP, oh, he dropped sight. <laughs> Still, I mean, it directly resulted in Bolo getting at least one pick, and then there was the ego call of, I'd like to get him. <laughs> to put into perspective, maybe we can try to catch LG in another round, though they will be on defense for the remainder of this matchup. First half, Dark Zero winning in most of the categories and looking like the better team so far. The scoreline does not tell you a different story. The thing is, if you know Dark Seer, you know their, their defenses are pretty good usually. The big question mark is how they're gonna do an attack. When they put early today on Skyscraper, it was not necessarily a pretty look when they're on the attack inside of things. And Chalet is very different than most of the maps. And it's one of those, okay, it has actually been a tanker favorite for a very long time, only going back, you know, six to eight months, for example. This is a map where if you're good at attacking, you can win a lot of rounds. But DC, they've been very slow. In this opening attack around, they're also relatively slow. They rappel in, they don't drone hats somehow, they have no idea that he's on the staircase. That's the first point of contact. <laughs> JR wins the duel, though it is just based off of his own abilities. He's got the read on one in closet as well. He's okay, okay. slaughtering. Five rounds, they are storming their way towards a victory over what might be a tired LG team from their matchup earlier today. <gasps> a smile. Emotion from Dark Zero. That's it. They're going to win both upcoming rounds and take it 7-1. It's confirmed. Or 7-2. The man of the hour right there for LG. At Highest expectations of any of the players on Luminosity before today's matchup began and before most 
matchup start. I mean, the desk likes to talk about Hat's potential contributions. Four and six is significantly better than the what one and six he was at one point earlier today. But Luminosity have not solely relied on him. Six row topping the charts at eight and five. He's only one kill behind Bolo for most kills so far in this matchup, but I mean, eight and five doesn't really matter if you're losing, and Luminosity are indeed losing. <laughs> I mean, uh, how long have you been doing this for, Parker? Is, is it internet? Is it eight years you've been casting for? Seven? Seven? Seven years? Coming up on my so, seven year casting anniversary. Damn, so seven years, and you, you can now tell that LG are indeed losing rounds. Mm. That's good. Experience really is important in this industry. I understand that you need to get back at me for the comment I made earlier today when you said that <laughs> when when East Coast was up 4 nothing and you're like, Sonic's really needs they a round. They gotta win rounds. That's, that's an expert, that's expert analysis right there, you know? That's like, it's like when people say like, well, how did you win today? And it's like, well, we got more rounds than them. It's like, okay. Well, we played better, simply. I see we are, I see we are answering the question at a very surface level. And then bothering to go deep at all. No, it's uh, it's the fifth game. It's getting late. You know, we, we gotta simplify it so our brains can keep up. That's how right, I well, see let it. Me, allow me to expand on my point then, since it seems like we have some time at the moment. Okay. That most players are going to be happy that they did well, but at the end of the day, mm. the goal is for your team to win. So Kicks Row going eight and five, sure, that'll be a point of pride for him, but if it results in luminosity getting beaten quite handily, then yeah. do you really have much to be proud of? In this particular round, Hicksrow eliminates Canadian. I'm not sure what the Grim was doing. It just looks like it was a regular interaction over by Trench Door as the Fenrir oh. of Kicksrow is buried down in blue. NJR's not expecting another. Good news, he's got backup, and Eddie is isolated by Nafe as both players from DZ work together to give DZ that numbers advantage. Ad is also guarding near the bottom floor, but Sitting in barbed wire by main lobby. You need mm -hmm. a big round from Hat now. As both Eddie and Kicks Row are gone, Eddie has been relatively ineffective so far in both utility and in killing. So maybe not all hope is lost so far for Luminosity. A rough game for Eddie, but we've seen Eddie play before at this level. We know that he is capable of more than just a single kill. Final moment of action. Dark Zero holding the advantage, though they have taken their lumps. NJR and Naif hurt. Naif in particular, badly hurt. Full utility for the Capitao. Most damning I prospect here, though, is that it's Naif holding on to that case. It might be a moot point if DZ just kills everybody as Wi-Fi dies, and it's Silent and Hat as the last two players from LG. It's dangerous. The heal of that library are probably gonna pivot and go somewhere else instead of suppose window jump in. Risky is that... Vault prompt, it's not pretty. Fire goes out, that might play in a factor, but no, Hat stays alive. He finds that perfect pixel spot. He's, or so he thought. Or so he thought. He dodged the fire, but you can't dodge the bullets. NJR and Pambazoo, sensational when working together. Look at that. The energy level of Pambazoo. The enthusiasm, <laughs> the eagerness. I know that you have to cycle through all these players, but can we just... Just for old time's sakes, can we go back to Pamazoo, please? Look <laughs> at that energy level. He is bringing the vibes to his team. Oh, these player camps today. It's once a match. And again, it's usually the pop-off, but in that round, it was NGR. He has found his moments in so many rounds now, both on the defense and the attack now. 11 kills to his name, and it's almost awkward with NGR because he's like your quote-unquote support player. There's a lot of thermite, there's a lot of smoke and stuff, mute. But NGR is such a phenomenal player at finding kills and just being very staple in gunfights, at least like historically the last many years. And sometimes I always wonder, what if you put that man on like, like a more entry oriented role? Where like, or like second entry, right? Get this man in a building with a good gun. I, I'm telling you, NGR would get good kills. Last round DC, they did a great mini execute in the basement where they got two kills off blue. They swung in from the primary garage of Snowmobile, got a kill. Nave was then on the fire from the frost that was put on blue staircase. Nave didn't swing, but the two other players from Dark Zero swung the other angle inside of blue instead and got a two for one freebie, essentially. 
Wi-Fi and LG, try and go for a cheeky spawn peek. Why not, when you're down facing match point, try and get that early kill, build that early lead. It doesn't pay off. It's a shoulder shot onto Bolo, who's going to suffer a little bit of damage, but ultimately, it's not going to matter at all. That one bullet will not make a big difference, most likely, in this round. Do or die for Luminosity for the remainder of this second half and the remainder of regulation. Luminosity will need to win four rounds in a row for overtime to be their successful way out of this match. Three points will be in hand for Dark Zero if they prevail anytime between now and that 13th round. And it's the one thing that Dark Zero has not been able to do so far this stage, which is win a game in regulation. In fact, Dark Zero has only been able to win a single game period so far through the four matches they've played. This is match number five. DZ won it in overtime. They lost in overtime as well, so DZ has some points, but the success they had at SI and with the history behind not just this roster, but also this organization, you have to imagine that they are well below their own expectations, and I'm not really certain what Luminosity was thinking there. But Wi-Fi and Eddie are dead, Kicks Row is gone, there's a Nitro Cell from Hat tossed well. It's now silent, antagonized on these trophy stairs. Hat will join him for backup, and another Nitro Cell will be pulled out of the pockets of Luminosity. Will it have the same level of success as the first? No. Dave holds that angle. A swing in from DZ would be enough to topple that defender playing by trophy. If you're a fan of LG, you are hoping that Silent wins that duel. You hope that he woke up this morning and he said his prayers, took his vitamins and ate his Wheaties, but for the moment, the waiting game. Final moment now as the fire rages not far removed from Silent. Hat, the only one sitting inside of the bomb site, to defend against DZ. It's smart. DZ have two players locking down one, another guy isolated half and step on the side, but he finds the no, not an injury. It's a drop shot, actually. He goes down. Just leaving Silent at 1v4. Silent might as well be playing another map at this point because he's lost control of the bomb site and lost control of his life. That was a quick one. Dark Zero giving us one of our fastest days in the NAL so far this stage. And they pick up three desperately needed points. If you want to hang with the big dogs, you got to beat the big dogs. And while LG might not be that, DZ in eighth place to start this match will vault all the way up to fifth, leapfrogging Luminosity in the process. This is going to be an absolute dogfight for the Manchester Major, whether it comes down to points or even the last chance qualifiers. But DZ get the job done today. And it didn't look like they broke much of a sweat doing it, Nick. Not this time around. And I mean, that's I think that's the more important story for Dark Zero is that they had a really sloppy game earlier on where it looked like they could not really attack and the defenses were, they were okay, but you know, not like anything to write home about. And then they go to Chalet and they can actually defend really well and they can also attack. So a much better look, they can turn things around between those two games. You know, I might've done something that was a bit ill-advised, but after our matchups finished, I went over to Reddit and I was reading some of the Reddit comments on the game threads. And one of the main things that people kept saying about Dark Zero was, please for the love of God, stop going to Skyscraper. And while they listened to you, Reddit, and you did it. Wow. The reason why Dark Zero won today was because Redditors told them not to go to Skyscraper. So that's, that's just incredible. a little bit of applause for you there. That's it for all of our matchups today, but we've still got the post show and we'll hear from Dark Zero in their winner's interview. Not before we go to a break. We'll be right back.
Dark Zero managed to avoid disaster. Luminosity are the pure, pure face of that disaster. We are done with day five of the NAL as it stands. And for LG, it's a day they would much rather forget about as soon as they possibly can. But that's just what happens when you play double headers in the NAL. It's not something that anybody expected to walk into when this season started, but because we had reschedules, that's just the way the cookie crumbles. So for DZ, good job. For LG, come back tomorrow, boys. I mean, that's all you can do. You got to wipe it off. It wasn't it wasn't your day, but that's what the next day is for. You can get back up on that saddle, have the performance you need, learn from. I mean, unfortunately for LG, you do lose, but you have to take from these losses. And that's the most important thing, especially bringing in a brand new team, is that you truly take from these losses and learn from them. So that way you can improve because it's really the only way you're going to improve as a team. Certainly. And I mean, whilst they're not in a great spot in the standings, they are, you know, not out of it yet. Mm. There are more weeks to play. They'll be back tomorrow for sure. And so, yeah, I, I want to see those improvements coming through from LG. Um, they've still got time. Actually, they won't be back tomorrow. I just did a double check. They're currently not listed on the roster for the games that we have to play um, tomorrow. Know, one in nine. And that's odds that's, that's yeah. Yeah, that's not true. even bad either. That gives them more time to really dig true. deep, find out what the problems were, fix it going in. When they have the to come back time. to the Super Week, they, yes, have they had do have more to come back for the Super through. Week, but it yeah. does allow them a little more time to get their bearings and figure out what they need to figure out. Well, for DZ, good job. You got to win on the day. It came at the very end, but at least it happened. You walk away with three points for your efforts, and it now shoves them way back up in the standings. Mm. Unlike I picked Laxing. DZ. Wait, yeah, why does it say Jesse picked LG? Hey, Jesse I hey pick pound LG. that. I respect that. I, I respect that. Pound that. Pound that with me. Don't fist bump him. You didn't pick it, Jesse. Don't fist bump him. Honestly, gaslit. I was being a little silly, quirky guy. There we go. Yeah, I was being a little silly, quirky guy. You know, it's DZ's favorite map, but I figured, you know, it's LG. There are things that can happen in this league. We've seen it more than enough, and well, you know. Parker agreed with us. He's like, we have. Well, I have no idea the way that this match is going to swing, and uh, I, I don't think it was that dumb to pick LG, yeah. given the way we saw DZ play. They just woke up in the second half of this game. Was it just Chalet all along? Laxing, I just think, is chief uh, Bolo hater is, is my theory on this. Facts. Facts. Lost to him so much back in the day, you're like, never again. Oh, well, hold on. Actually... So I think Dark Zero in this game really did play well. This Glad we saw NJR starting to come back a little bit. Um, this clutch from, uh, from Kicks. Questionable. Oh, we didn't, they didn't even show it. it. No, the, <laughs> Good job. It was so questionable, production was like, nah. He went for a swing with the pistol there on Troy Canadian. It did not go so well for him. But all in all, I mean, I think 
overall, this is a bad map choice to start off with for, for LG. I mean, again, we don't really know what LG's map pool looks like, but we know this is a really strong map for Dark Zero. Despite it's, despite the fact they haven't played it since SI, still the fundamentals are going to be there. It's the same five-man roster, so I think that that's going to be relatively clear. I think a lot of times, especially in that first half, we saw LG maybe not getting the proper control around the bomb site before going for the execute, or if they did get that control, they weren't able to utilize it properly. Maybe the hatches stayed closed. Maybe they had some other utility issues. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of problems, I think, through that game from, uh, from Luminosity. They should be able to go back and fix some of those. A problem that didn't exist for Dark Zero is a guy that we talked about in the pregame that we were wondering when he was going to finally wake up. NJR, for his own part, actually had a pretty decent game here. No, NJR was playing exactly how you'd want NJR to be playing. I, this was a clip where I kept saying, what, what, what? <laughs> because there were so many different instances that LG shouldn't have lost, but DZ kept capitalizing on it, specifically off NJR's backing. But no, NJR is performing well and where we want him to be performing because Fox what he does is he talks about highlighted players and they end up performing horribly I talk about these highlighted per performers and they actually start to performing so NGR you're welcome I'm glad I could do you guys a service DZ specifically but no it's important again and then, and then maybe that's why we saw the 7-2 I don't want to entirely put that on NJR's back but it is still good to see him performing once again and where we want to be seeing him on that leaderboard well let's get Naif on the horn to talk about how this game went down brother it's uh, we haven't had the chance to talk in an interview at any point, really. So, first of all, hi, I'm Jacob. I hope you I'm, I, you had a dub. Congratulations for you, man. Just out of curiosity, what did you do from the game earlier in the day to now to try to figure <laughs> out what that loss was like and then wipe the whole thing away and come into this LG game fresh? What did you do in the break? Um, well, obviously, we knew coming into the day we were going to be playing two games. So, no matter what the first result was, we were going to we were going to reset. Uh, the first game, I mean. Obviously, different map, Skyscraper, heavily defender-sided. Um, I think our issues kind of, it's, it wouldn't have translated into Shallow. Like, I think we, we struggled with like, the info, the on attack, especially early round. Uh, like, Shallow, you can play like loads of different tempos, like slow, quick. It's easy to get into on that map. So I think like, yeah, like we, we played a more comfortable map for us, I would say. Uh, I don't know, they let us play Shallow, so yeah, we, we played Shallow. Well, it was a swift win. It was a 7-2. A question for you. So the success from SI that you guys had off the start right away, it doesn't look like that's transitioning as fast going into this stage. What's the biggest issue, in your opinion, or the biggest hurdle you guys are facing right now? Uh, that that's a good a, question. That, 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 good that question. is a question we're trying to figure out, too. Um, I mean, yeah, uh, obviously, we're not performing to the level we performed at SI. But that's obviously a no-brainer. Um, Obviously, we're still putting the work in day in, day out. The scrims have been going well. I mean, I don't know. I think we just need to figure out. Uh, maybe it's a confidence issue. Maybe mm. it's like just like a prep issue. I mean, we're putting in the work, so I, I don't really know. Because like some days, like I don't know, Sky felt great for us, and it didn't yeah. translate to the official. But I mean, it might be one of the days. You know, we lost two one VXs on the attack with, with the bomb down. So we win them. It might be a different game. Who knows? I don't for know. Sure. For sure. Yeah. Uh, Naif, I want to talk to you a little bit about kind of Dark Zero as a whole. You know, I know a lot of the Europeans that I talk to sometimes criticize Dark Zero's overarching playstyle for being kind of slow, kind of traditional. Um, for yourself, being a European who has now joined the DZ system, what are your thoughts on the overall philosophy that Dark Zero tends to play with? Do you think it's something that you have a mission to somewhat change or modify to the new age? Or are you trying to really adapt and roll into what DZ like to be working with? Uh, yeah, for sure. I think uh, one of the first things I mentioned when I first joined was like the overall like view of them was like they play slow, they play snail, mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff. Um, but a lot of the things they do, I agree with. You know, there's a lot of structure to it. A lot of like, um, if this happens, we do like we have a lot of like solutions for a lot of stuff, which I, I agree with. But I'm not here to change the play style. I'm not here to like change. I'm I'm just here to add. And I mean, mm -hmm. I like when it comes down to play style, I think I can add some quick stuff. Mm -hmm. I can help with the strategy side of things. I think, yeah, so I'm, I'm not trying to change anything. I think, like, there's definitely some things we obviously we can improve on, which you which you clearly see. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I think, like, I think a good mixture of both uh, is what we're aiming for. Yeah, fair enough. Well, congratulations on getting the dub in this one, man. Even though it took until the very end of the day, it's always good to escape with a couple more points. Congrats on the win. Go back in the lab. We'll see you for your game against Beast Coast tomorrow, right, dude? Yep, see you then.
Beast Ghost are certainly going to have an interesting game on their hands for that one, just because we've seen the way that DZ play. They actually get their first dub. That the Beast Ghost go on the lab and figure out exactly what they have to do. Somehow that game actually doesn't. That, that looks pretty good on paper for tomorrow if that ends up playing out the way I think it will. Yeah, I'm excited for that one because I feel like week one we saw a Beast Coast who wasn't really ready. And then today we saw a team that wasn't really ready to play Beast Coast because they didn't expect Beast Coast to make all those changes and to be uh, the better team that they were. So now tomorrow we're finally going to have Beast Coast are playing a better style of Siege. Uh, their opponents are going to be able to see kind of, okay, what type of Beast Coast are we playing? They've now got at least a, a new map to take back and, and to watch from them. So it should be an overall higher level game. Um, coming into that one just because of more information. Yeah. I mean, it's just better to see all these teams in the whether in the lower bracket, middle of the pack, whatever, is that every team looks like they're improving as these games are going on, which that's something that you would want to be seeing anyways. You don't want to see someone just declining with every single day by any means. No, but, you know, not. Lowe's, Beast Coast, all these teams, Luminox, like everyone is still performing. They're still learning what they need to learn to improve. And it just makes watching Siege a lot more enjoyable to see these teams really putting in the effort and putting in the work to make these games as, as close in comparison to one another as they possibly can be. Well, that's all that we've got for day five of the NAL. The, the stage is set now for the post show at this point. That's where we, we I mean, we don't dim the lights, even though that, that would kind of be cool. But we, we kick back, we let Twitch subscriber only mode on for a little while so that you guys can ask us questions. And we'll do a little bit of a full day roundup in that setting as well. So make sure that if you have a subscription active, get a couple of questions in chat so that we have the chance to answer them on screen. And we'll be back in a couple minutes after we get a little bit more comfortable on stage. So we'll see you in a sec.
games are done, the servers are closed, the observers have turned their PCs off and gone to bed, but we're still here because this is the NAL post show. Day five is done and dusted. We have a few thoughts left on exactly how the day went, and we just decided why not do it with a little lounge music in the background because this is what the higher-ups have suggested that we do for a post show, which is fun, which I honestly don't really have a problem with. I'm Jacob. He's Laxing. He's Jesse. Hi. How's it going? This, uh, is, this is brand new to me. You haven't done this before? No. Because you weren't here for... You were here for the first week. Mm. But for the second week, that's where we actually started doing the thing. So just turn turn presenter mode off and just, just be real, dude. Oh, all right. Well, I'm going home. Okay, bye. <laughs> See you, bro. Uh, so what? We just... We're chilling? We're, we're just chilling, chilling now? Yeah. Just hanging out? Sick. No more stats? No more no more breakdowns? I should have gotten a drink before this started. I uh, For the past couple days, I like had a mug and, was, and just... Like, I at least had, like, a prop in my hand that wasn't an iPad. Wow. So that would have been nice. So I guess I'll just stick for having a pen in my hand, because why not? Fair well, play. I mean, I've kind of accepted already. Like, I'm just not getting this belt. Like, Oh, no. You've you already given up. Growing. Yeah, I'm giving up. Yeah. Oh, you were man. only one behind me before you well, picked then I LG. Went, well, yeah. I mean, I, you know, I figured I'd do something a little you fun, silly, like quirky. A it's, such, it's such a cool belt, too. You're, you're already giving up on it, man. Come nah, on. I won't give up on it yet. But give after, up on her? She after, wants after, after, after that play on Chalet, that last game. Yeah. <laughs> what, was it NJR swinging in, or was it Bolo? Uh, NJR swung in through Solar, beat the guy on stairs, and then got the 2K off. Yeah, that was... I, I'm <laughs> telling you guys, chat, like, if you could have been in the back room, I watched this entire thing, and I was just, what? You're just what? groaning the <laughs> whole time. <laughs> yeah. And NJR literally really killed everyone and like realistically you should never be able to swing into uh solar stairs in any situation when someone's playing the stairs and dz didn't even know no. i think silent was playing there to yeah. begin with and the fact that dz swung and lost the initial engagement and njr is just like all right i'm gonna go too I'm just <laughs> and then kills three people off it is uh, insane to me so well let's take a look at what the whole day looked like from top to bottom just to get a picture for those of you who may have joined the stream late los opened us up and got a dub they are no longer winless later in the day beast coast got a dub over sonics they are no longer winless space station are no longer undefeated but OS. XGR. It was a tough game, or a tough day to predict. Like, you not only had to predict that the 0-3 lows would beat the 3-0 Space Station, mm -hmm. you also had to predict that Beast Coast would get a massive upset over the Sonics. Yeah, over the Sonics. Beast Coast also previously uh, zero wins to their name. And then, like, Luminosity almost came back against uh, against Oxygen and got that upset win. Uh, it's it 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 a tough day. Tough I mean, day. the Luminosity DZ one was the biggest, you know, Toss up for me. It was a question of who's sure, really yeah. going to win, and then it would have been that or N eighty yeah, DZ to, to some level. I feel like N eighty DZ was much more. Well, no, for more I, people, it was no, more I, clear cut. No. I think the LG DZ was a pretty hard one to pick, <laughs> per personally. Well, a lot of thought process went into that for me to make that decision. I'm sure it did. I'm sure there's a lot of thoughts that were going into that. What, was that forty six percent? Something like that. Close, somewhere around there. We'll have to do a double check on prediction percentage in a second. OXG, only team with double digit points on the day. Wildcard did not play today, so the fact that they're down in ninth place looks considerably worse than it is. Um, but as the schedule will show later, they will be back to play a double header tomorrow. So maybe don't consider them down and out just yet. Beast Coast got three points, but they're still only in seventh because of the Dark Zero win that put them back up the stand. DZ were as low as eighth with that loss yep. from earlier and everyone else vaulting over them, and then they get back up to fifth with that dub. So. I mean, even looking at this, though, it's still relatively close. It's One so win, close. three points can set someone all the way into third place at that point, or even in second. So it's not to look at this and be like, wow, these teams are really bad or they don't stand a chance. This is all within one game, and some teams that have doubles could easily bounce all the way to the top. Yeah, okay, gut check real quick. Three teams that are in the bottom three at the end of this. End of the, end of the stage, who's not making playoffs? You calling it now? Yeah, make your call. This is Ooh. insane. I'll do it. Hey, do it. this won't be a prediction that counts toward the belt. Yeah, of course. So just, just, just speak your mind. What do you think? Uh, well, if I, I if I could have saw wild card play Close. today, <laughs> if I could have saw wild card play today, it might make me change my opinion. But because they are where they are, they're down there for sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, if Los can't continue the same performance that we saw from today, they're staying there. Beast Coast again, like their identity. They looked far better today, so I I don't want to just picking the bottom three. Well, I, but I, well, the two of them are definitely, but I can't say Beast Coast right now. Is, so. the, is the more accurate question the current bottom three? Do they stay the bottom three? I think it's a hard no. Hard no. I, I For think, all three of them? Well, no. Okay. I well, think, right. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. I think I think two of those three are staying. I think Los gets out though. 
You think Lowe's gets I, out? I have so much faith in Lowe's, actually. After watching them play the last couple of play days, I, I really like the way Lowe's Well, you also had tons of faith in Beast Coast going into this entire thing. You said this was the best version Beast Coast uh, has ever I saw had. That. And you know what? They look better today. So they yeah, did. I'll back that I, up. I, I I'll mean, back that I, up. I agree with I that. I still got faith in Beast But Coast. this is what I was saying. I think Beast Coast makes it out before the other two. How about this? Uh, you know what? I think Wildcard stays in the bottom three. I think oh. LG falls to the bottom three. And then I think it comes down last second, like, Beast Coast versus... Actually, Dark whatever Zero. org doesn't send me merch, <laughs> you're at the bottom. <laughs> Plain and simple. Like That's it's, the final it's, crux. It's, yeah. You can literally buy Laxing's opinion Absolutely. by just sending merch to him. I could dress. throw on one of these jerseys, and I said it in a tweet, I could look better than your players in it. I could model for <laughs> you. I could be in the gym for you. I could I could get some likes on it. I could get people, wow, not only do I want to get in the gym, but I want to support one of these teams. We certainly all would love either merch or skin codes or anything. Guys, if you're watching the NEL and you want to send us some stuff, please do that. We will thank you for it publicly, and Laxing will even fully shill for you on, on, the, on the desk. A- absolutely. He is selling his advertising absolutely. services as we speak. My predictions will fully go in your favor. Let's do a check on the games that we've got going for tomorrow. This is Wild Cards doubleheader. One of those games is for Low. So if Lowe's are really about to make that climb back up, that's not a terrible opponent for them to start against if Wildcard aren't able to find much momentum or change up their play style too much. Space Station are the other team with a doubleheader, but they have a lot of time between playing M80 as game one, which is already going to be great, and then waiting four hours to play Wildcard at the end of the day. Yeah, I think... Game one, M80 Space Station, that looks like a banger game. I'm very excited for that one. That's that's going to go 15 rounds. That's my call. Sure. I mean, I'm even excited for the second game with Los Wildcard. We didn't get to see Wildcard play today. They obviously yeah. had a little more time to find what they needed to find a groove. Los obviously getting their win today against the 3-0 SSG, now making them 3-1. Mm-hmm. So I see that game, and like you were saying, you know, you're know, you you're excited for them. You think they're making it now, and that will make that statement push even further if they can get that win. I will look like a clown if they lose to Wildcard, and it's not <laughs> Close, though. I, that'll, that'll look bad. Yeah, that, these, that these will games, suck, so just don't do some that. Some of these games, like even last week with the predictions and everything. Yeah. I, I, I don't think there's been a day tougher than today on everyone's overall predictions, though. I don't know. Last like, week I, like, was pretty I think rough. Fox was at 1.1 1. 1 for 4 and then climbed back out because he picked DZ at the very end. Yeah. So even for him, the guy at the top of the leaderboard right now, like with the highest percentage to win this thing, it was still a tough day for him. So I think today was just the roughest overall. Nice. I'm coming for Fox. I'm one game behind him still. And now, Watch out. Am Only I two one games game. behind you now? Because I decided to go with a Ooh. silly silly LG. Yeah, you're kind of out of it. Uh-huh. Let's do some questions from the subscriber chat. What are you excited for as the major approaches? What are you excited for? Lan. Lan, absolutely. Crowds. The, the big thing for me is there's been a tier one Lan in... England before now, like like year two or year three year or something. One, I think there was one a really long time ago. So the fact that the the UK is actually getting a big land again is a big. Is, is, it was what, I? It, no, it was it was one of the Pro League finals like way back when. In the I don't UK, know. I swear there was one. No, I, there was one. Oh look, it was year one PC Pro League or something. Are you sure it, would it, it wasn't like the UK's version of their like? No, no, it, it, it wasn't like the Premiership or anything, but it was a legitimate like tier. So it's been years since we've been back. Is more the point. I'll, I'll look it up real quick. And this was during year one. I think so. Year one. Year one or year two? What are, you, what are you guys most excited for? Yeah, I was gonna say I'll answer. I'm excited to see BDS uh, play against the Brazilian teams. Like uh, NA, I think is kind of gonna. I mean, we'll see. We'll see. But I don't expect be a good representative for the brand, Jesse. Of uh, don't betray of us. The major personally, like the way BDS is playing inside of Europe right now, looks scary. So I really want to see them go against like the Titans of Brazil, which are of course the Titans of the world because Brazil's the best region. Right? right, right. I mean, like I said it in the beginning of this, just being in that atmosphere, being at the land, seeing the fans and the crowds and all that stuff. That's what's more hype than anything is just being part of that. Whether whether you're an analyst there, whether you're a host there, whether you're just attending there, whether you're a player there, just being in that atmosphere is what makes those events so special. I um, found that one event, Okay, go. by the way. Year one, season two, finals for both Xbox and PC in Leicester in the UK. This is back in August of 2016. Told you. It's been eight years since a tier one event has been back in the UK. So Manchester finally gets one. I'm excited for the food in the UK. Are you really? <laughs> no. <laughs> are, are you really? <laughs> uh, Do you think Los thinks NA is easier than Brazil? Well, okay, so Bursa 
went out of his way on the interview to say that he doesn't think that it's easier, but it's different, like, because stylistically, it's just oh, such it's, such a weird... Like, it's a culture shock to come to America in the first place. It's a culture shock to play American teams when you're out here, too. Well, it's always, it's always been that way since Siege has ever started their competitive career. It's... NA's had their own play style. EU has played their own play style. E, I mean, uh, Brazil has had their own play style. APEC has had their own play style. As we've seen throughout the years, a lot of teams have kind of like cultivated some of the other regions' play style and adap adopted it into their play style. But overall, yeah. still, every region has their f very significant way of how they mm. play Siege. I think undoubtedly, like the top of Brazil is better than the top of North America. But for a team like Los, regardless of what region you're playing in, you're not really looking to compete against the top of the regions. You're looking to like make it into that top six, maybe top four and like squeak in a major appearance, right? And I think for Los, you're looking at the mid tiers of NA, the mid tiers of Brazil. That's where I think it's a lot more comparable. Yeah. And so for Los, it's not necessarily easier playing inside of North America, but it is different. Specifically to Jesse. So neither myself or Laxon can answer this question. How was your break? My break? Like th the last two weeks not I mean, I can answer. That break, I guess, yeah. Yeah, Um, it was chill. We've been streaming Twitch tv slash jesse j chick we do a lot of co-streams we're watching brazil and europe this weekend hey tune in um but no we've been we've been streaming we've been making content playing some geo guesser you know no it's been good i mean i wanted to be here frankly i i'm sad i missed the first two weeks but I'm uh sad. yeah i'm sad i didn't get to see get to see you guys justin trudeau in person physically would not let him cross the border into america wow. well we actually found out why you didn't come you had to get that solo cup yeah i had to i had to use some <laughs> <espionage>. <laughs> I really hope that, that 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 whole joke carries on like for longer than just today. Well, like, we'll see. We'll see when we get that through customs. Yeah, how did you back. how did you literally get contaminated evidence from a lab through customs, bro? I don't got to answer that. <laughs> There's still water in it. There's actually nothing in there. He's actually drinking air right now, thinking he's He's just he's, he's sipping trying to look cool. I'm actually so thirsty. Oh my goodness. Damn, we really should have put some And that's not water. We established it was Bolo Fan Tears. True. What does it take to qualify as a desk analyst? Uh, not much. Not very much. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I mean, God. I mean, if, if you want a joke answer, just make sure that you're at least bronze two in siege. But what does it take to qualify? Um, usually, you have to fight the previous analysts in hand to hand combat. So the reason why you don't see Emzo on desks anymore is because he lost a fight to me way back in 2020, which is why I got the job and then I was on desks forever. So Emzo, if you've ever recovered from that beating, let me know on Twitter. I'll be happy to, uh, to send you a bouquet or something. I don't know. How did I get here? Who did? Yeah, who, who did you beat up? To How get did the you get here? Uh, I don't know. Well, kind, you kind of just landed here. Yeah. I retired and then they said, hey, you're getting old. You want to be on the desk? And I said, <laughs> damn, sure. Why not? What a self report. Yeah. So this is like a nursing home for me, retirement home. I was, I, a, I was a caster in Challenger League and then they switched to NAL and they decided we're going to have analysts for the first time. And they had an open slot and there were no analysts because that wasn't really a position before they moved to like the new faces system. It was a weird time back it when was weird. T1 didn't prioritize hosts for anything other than events. Same with analysts. Yeah. Like every time you I saw- I didn't even like, know the difference between all of you when I was playing. Yeah, I mean, back in, back in the no, day, there was fair. no difference because it was just casters. No, no. And they're, and they're just like, wait, we have, we have like another another caster duo and then somebody who doesn't cast? Like back then it was, it was, uh, it was dark times because it was COVID too and we were switching over to a different format. Um, yeah, that was, that was way different. Uh, if you want to know what it's like, or like like how to get into being talent, like we all had very different paths to doing it. Like being an ex pro for most people is not an instant get up, but that's like a really easy way to find your way in because having previous desk knowledge is really good for that stuff. You had been grinding in esports before Siege and then made the challenge really jump. That was just kind of how it went. I was doing content for, for YouTube for a long time, then got to Challenger League, and then that was eventually my way in. So for everybody who is talented, it's a different journey all around. Like, it, it's not, this, there's, it's, n there's not like a path to pro to be an animal. What I find interesting about being in this job specifically is there's tons of different personality. I mean, you could say that about player to player, but like talent to talent, like now being in this, it, the personalities, I wouldn't say anyone's like necessarily the same. Like everyone has their own very unique Everyone's personality. Totally different, yeah. But yep. we do the same jobs or like we all do it relatively the same to some degree with our own unique twist on it. Favorite three teams potentially at the major? Well, BDS, that's a given. Um, I think it's easy. FaZe, Fury, BDS. I don't, that's literally what I was going to say. I don't think there's another answer, frankly. 
Is it like a lot of people are saying like foregone conclusion? Oh, BDS like major I mean, grand final. Talon, are we there? <laughs> Talon, Talon will be fun. Talon. T Talon will be fun to at least watch, even if they maybe don't progress as far as some people think. Yeah, I mean that'll be good. that'll be interesting. But I they, I mean, see, they've lost. I just want to see Fabian back there. Just yeah, him. I mean that'd be cool. Yeah, that'd be dope. But I think for top three, I, I think top four is a more interesting question. Like, I, who's the fourth on that list? Ooh, I don't know. But I think top three Oxygen. is like Oxygen. <laughs> Oxygen. Does anybody um yeah does anybody from NA like slip in there at all? Like, does SSG power through and maybe get a better result from SI? Not on my list. You can make the argument though. That'd be fun if they did. But mm. yeah. Does Bliss get above top eight? Well, they do get the buy into the second phase because of the new format. If well, if they sure. again, you're if, right, if they you're qualify, right. obviously they if have they to do qualify. that first. Yeah, yeah, that's a tough one. What's everyone's favorite team to watch? Mm. Okay, favorite team in this case may not necessarily mean like best team, you know. Like we, we were having a lot of fun watching um, Oxygen uh, earlier today. Even though yes, currently top of the table, but would they be well, like one of the top teams in the world? That's debatable. Um, I, I've always liked watching Bleed, personally. That's, mm. Bleed's a fun team to watch. That, that one's are. a highlight for I mean, me. This, this might be a basic one for me and a lot of people's choice as well, but W7M, well, now Furia. Yeah. yeah. That was definitely one. Like, watching KZ and Herd specifically play, and I've been in Siege for a long time. I've watched a lot of top players play, played against a lot of top players, but watching Herds and KZ play was like, holy, like, yeah, <laughs> these guys are nuts. Yeah. I, I'm not that confident on some of those pixel peaks that they ended up getting kills from. It was it's truly impressive from those two and yeah. the rest of the guys on the team. No, I, I got to agree. Like, I think watching W7M play is, like, just ridiculous because of how fundamentally good they are at everything, how every player, like, has their own role, their own, like, mm -hmm. play style on the team, but they're all so perfect at it. If I have to give, like, an, a North American answer, uh, I'd probably say Space Station. Say Space Station. Yeah, just cause the that, that's pretty good bring, disputed. like, obviously on LAN, being able to, like, I've been in the same room as Ashen as he played many, many times during Atlanta I mean, and during SI, and it's like, oh my God. I also just love the fun. team chemistry that they have, yeah. the little regiment that they have going on. There's yeah. never been a team dynamic that's even come remotely close to SSG. I'd say the closest thing to that, and it hasn't been as hectic, is the old rec roster. That roster, like, to this I, day. Dude, I miss that team I don't, so much, man. I don't man. care what anyone says, that old rec roster was by far, I think, a lot of people's favorites. Not maybe for placing or anything like that. Not to say that we even placed bad by any means, but just in terms of like overall team chemistry and how we all operate around each other, yep. we could have had a reality TV stuff with a lot <laughs> of the things that happened. There is that. not enough footage from the rec house that made it online because there would oh, be like, like, like the occasional content piece or video that comes out. And I'm like, man, that, that looked like the blast that it seemed behind the scenes. Nah, that, that roster was so much fun. So much fun. Best roster I've ever been a part of. There's, there's, uh, there's one more question, but it's not one that's listed uh, from, from Twitch chat. It was a debate that we had last week. So stupid. No, no, no. It's, it's not the one that we had in the green room. It's one okay. from last week. It's pretty simple. Pancakes or waffles go. Pancakes. No, waffles. Waffles Dude, have pancakes. texture to them. Pancakes are I don't just like need a, a texture. A, a mouthful of mush. Pancakes just make me feel vibey comfortable like if i'm having a nice breakfast you get eggs you get some sausage or bacon you slap some hot cakes on there it's solid you get a waffle there like it just ain't the same and then if you want to even eat it like a taco and dip it you just you just grab it you just yeah, and then you got sticky fingers, bro. Why do you keep saying it's sticky fingers? If you were dipping it in syrup, you do not have sticky fingers. If you're dipping like, a are you pancake like this? Like, in are you syrup. Like, are you, like, doing this? Like, when you, like, if dip you're dipping your whole your hand in, in syrup, there? And then you bite into it. Okay. It's dripping well, all over the place. We know Jesse eats like knife. a child. We know you, Jesse eats no, like a child. I use utensils. He has cookies and milk. He dips I his use whole utensils. hand. Is that, is that done? Uh, no, there's a little bit still in there. Do you care? Go for if it. If I demonstrate, because that's just filled. What do you do? It's what just, are you doing it's right just now? plain and simple. If Jesse had a cookie with his thought process of his hands getting sticky, if he had yeah. like a cookie and milk, he'd <laughs> <laughs> and then like shove the cookie in his mouth. Like you're just no, that's, that's, that's literally water. No, why are you yes, touching man. your food with your hands to begin with? This is gross, bro. A lot of the you world eat eats with their hands. Yeah, but not pancakes. Yeah. No. Anyways. Pancakes are just better. They just make you feel more comfortable. They make you no, feel more don't. at home. They make you feel good. A waffle's, waffles just crunchy. kind of They're boring. Good. No. Why do you eat crunchy? Go I'm eat really chips happy if you want that. That Ubisoft gave me a position of power on broadcast so I can just cause havoc like this. But outside of You're wrong. pancakes, <laughs> You're wrong. Outside, of, outside of pancakes and waffles, French toast beats all of them.
French toast is. We can all agree French on toast that. French toast is, is, is pretty, is Listen, pretty limitless. We can butt yeah. heads on the pancakes and the waffles, but French toast will demolish any of those any day of the week. Put her there. No, dat me up, dat me up. And with that, we are done with day five. Sorry to, to production for the camera angle change. We're done with day five. Thank you very much for joining us on the broadcast. Always a pleasure, by the way, to finally have Jesse J. Chick no, back where he belongs on the desk. Waxing shut you off. Saying this isn't even a day. Ago. This it's is the couch. end of the day. We're getting out of here. Thank you guys very much for tuning in. We'll be back same time, same place, 5 p.m. Eastern tomorrow for day number six. Hope to see you there. In the meantime, have a good night.